Hello there and welcome to the Motorate Signal Processing collection of notebooks and tutorials. This is a course offered by Professor Schule at the Humanal University of Technology. I am Renato and this is our first notebook, the introduction. So in this notebook we are going to discuss what it is, what is Motorate Signal Processing, where is Motorate Signal Processing used, there will be a few Python examples, very basic, to get started with working with audio. So if you're not familiar with Python, I highly recommend that you go online, find some tutorials, start learning it. We will use Python in uh, all our notebooks, sometimes also a bit of JavaScript. Uh, we will also talk in this notebook about the basic building blocks of multi-rate signal processing. So there will be upsampling, downsampling. We'll talk about critical sampling, filter banks, uh, analysis filter bank, synthesis filter bank. So it's very important that you have the basic concepts of signal processing like uh, sampling theorem, Nyquist theorem, convolution, filters, uh, windows, because we're going to use all these concepts and techniques in multi-rate uh, signal processing. So what is multi-rate signal processing? We can see it as signal processing using different sampling rates. Let's take a look at this example. We have an audio file that was recorded at 44.1 kHz. This is a typical sampling rate of a CD. But then we need to convert it to a system that is running at 48 kHz. Or the other way around. We have a file that was recorded at 92 kHz but we want to play it in a CD player and we need to convert it down to 44.1 kilohertz. So in typical applications, we have in filter banks, for example, where we reduce the sampling rate after filtering a signal. This will reduce the bandwidth. Then for reconstruction, we upsample the signal, we filter the signal for interpolation, and this way we obtain the original sampling rate. And where is multi-rate signal processing used? We find applications of multi-rate signal processing in many coding and compression algorithms. We find it in MDCT, uh, so it's the Modified Discrete Cosine Transform Filter Bank in audio coding. We find it in DCT for image and video coding, that is Discrete Cosine Transform. We find it in channel coding using the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And we even find it in machine learning and deep neural networks. So here is a very basic Python example just to plot a discrete time signal. It's good for you to check if you understand how to plot in Python, how to use NumPy. So what we're doing here, we're importing this uh, the NumPy package and the matplotlib pyplot. We are configuring the matplotlib to display as a notebook. So we are creating some random numbers and plotting them using a stem plot. So we have samples, each sample has its value, and this is a very basic discrete time signal. Uh, plot using Python. So, as I said before, this is just to remind you that a typical sampling rate of uh, audio from a CD is a 44.1 kilohertz. And if you're not familiar with Python, I highly recommend that you check out some online tutorials. I have my own Python Basics tutorial at the Guitars AI repository. Here's your um, GitHub, so it's very basic. It starts from uh, how to comment in Python, how to use strings, lists, for loops, dictionaries, how to define functions, classes, how to get help uh, in Python. And in the end, there is a step by step solution of uh, an exercise from the book Fundamentals of Music Processing of Professor Maynard Muller. And uh, there is the full solution. So, it's a very, very basic Python tutorial, 
and then you can also try different tutorials using NumPy, using Matplotlib, using SciPy, that's it. So here's a more advanced uh, Python example. We're using PyAudio to have a live plot of a microphone signal. So we're importing our libraries. So we're using PyAudio, we're using NumPy and Matplotlib animation to have a live plot. We define some parameters like the block size. It's mono, so it's a one channel, the sampling rate. Here we are configuring our PyAudio object and configuring a stream. At this point, we're config we're creating a plot figure. We're defining a serialization function and an animation function that will read data from an audio stream and then update the, the, the data in the plot. There's a handle for the close event. So when we close our figure, it will stop the stream, close the stream, terminate our by audio. And here is the uh, animation itself. So uh, we call the figure we created, the animate function we created, the initialization function. And here we have a live plot of the microphones. We have our microphone signal displayed here. And when we close, we are calling this close event and we are terminating. If you're running this notebook from a remote server using Binder or using Google Colab, this Python example for a live plot of a microphone signal will not work simply because you have no access to a microphone from a remote server. So we can do things on the client side and use JavaScript Web Audio API. So this part is an HTML code to create a canvas where we will plot our uh, audio waveform and a button to mute and unmute the microphone. So here we create a canvas, we create this button control. Here is the JavaScript. So uh, we create and configure the audio context. Uh, we have configurations for the button, the mute button. We have this audio nodes. So the gain node will control. So this mute, so we can set the gain to a zero or to a maximum. One, we uh, use this analyzer so we can get the audio samples to plot. We need to have some configuration for the canvas. This part here takes care of the audio recording itself. It connects source with the nodes. We, it's calling the visualize function. The visualize function takes care of the plotting. It gets the uh, audio data and it plots in the canvas. This is the function to uh, mute and unmute the microphone. So basically we set this gain node gain to zero or to one. Uh, and we have a live plot using JavaScript uh, web audio. Here is a reminder of the Nyquist theorem. This theorem is very important and fundamental in signal processing. It tells us that our signal needs to be band limited to less than half the sampling frequency. And half the sampling frequency is called the Nyquist frequency. So if we have a sampling frequency of 44.1 kHz, our signal must be band limited to less than 22.05 kHz. We need to make sure that all frequencies above the Nyquist frequency are filtered out in order to avoid aliasing. For time discrete signals, we often use normalized frequencies. And we can normalize frequencies to the sampling frequency or to the Nyquist frequency. When we normalize to the Nyquist frequency, the normalized frequency of 1, and a lot of time we also use pi, would be the Nyquist frequency. Let's take a look at a sample rate conversion example. In this example, we're going to convert an audio signal from a CD with a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz down to a computer file with a sampling rate of 32 kilohertz. So the signal at 44.1 kilohertz has all frequencies below 22.05 kilohertz. However, a signal at 32 kilohertz sampling rate needs all frequencies to be below 16 kilohertz to respect the Nyquist theorem. 
So in this conversion, we are going to lose the highest frequency component from 16 kilohertz to 22 kilohertz to respect the Nyquist theorem. So before downsampling, we have to remove this high frequency component by low pass filtering. In the previous section, we discussed the downsampling in an example where we wanted to convert from 44.1 kHz sampling rate to 32 kHz. But imagine the other way around, when we want to convert from 32 kHz to 44.1 kHz sampling rate. So it's important to observe that in this case, we obtain a new frequency range from 16 kHz to 22 kHz, which should contain no signal components. So we must low pass the upsampled signal to this 16 kHz. So in this picture, we can see the basic building blocks of multi rate signal processing downsampling and upsampling. In downsampling, we have a low pass and then we downsample by a factor of n. In upsampling, we upsample our signal and then we have a low pass filter. So we can do this uh, downsampling and upsampling without loss of information as long as we respect the Shannon Nyquist law. So we must have a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 1 over n normalized to the Nyquist frequency. And in this case, we can reconstruct the lowest 1 nth of our signal spectrum. So perhaps you're finding this downsampling and upsampling and all these sampling frequencies and Nyquist frequencies uh, too confusing. So uh, let's try to explain it again using an example. So in our example, we will take our signal, which has a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz. We will downsample by a factor of n equals to 2. So at this point, it will have a sampling frequency of 16 kilohertz. We will take the signal, we will upsample by a factor of 2. So it goes from 16 kilohertz back to 32 kilohertz. What we need to do and observe in this process? We uh, go from 32 kilohertz to a sampling rate of 16 kilohertz. The Nyquist theorem tells us that a signal with a sampling frequency of 16 kilohertz must be band limited to 8 kilohertz. So we need to remove all frequencies above the Nyquist frequency, in this case 8 kilohertz, from our original signal before downsampling. So we pass our signal to a low pass frequency, a uh, low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 8 kilohertz. As uh, we showed here, the cutoff frequency normalized to the Nyquist frequency at the higher sampling rate must be 1 over n. So n is equal to 2, 1 over n is 0 0.5. The Nyquist frequency from of 32 kilohertz is 16 kilohertz. 0 0.5 is equal to half the Nyquist frequency. So half of 16 kilohertz is 8 kilohertz. So we take our signal, we pass it through a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 8 kilohertz. So at this point, we didn't change the sampling rate, but we band limited our signal to 8 kilohertz. Now we drop every second sample. So we remove every, se every second sample. And at this time, this point here, we have a signal with a sampling frequency of 16 kilohertz and band limited to 8 kilohertz, respecting the Nyquist theorem. Now we take the signal and we want to upsample it by 2 to go back to a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz. So, what we need to do? We take our signal and we can upsample by 2 by insert a zero after every sample. So at this point here, we change the sampling frequency of our signal. It goes from 16 kilohertz to 32 kilohertz. 
But in this process, by inserting zeros after each sample, we introduced alias. And we don't want this alias. So what we need to do, we need to pass this signal to a low pass filter. We apply a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 8 kilohertz, which is 1 over n normalized to the Nyquist frequency at the higher sampling rate. So the higher sampling rate is 32 kilohertz. The Nyquist frequency is 16 kilohertz. Half of the Nyquist frequency is a cutoff frequency of 0 0.5 is equivalent to 8 kilohertz. So at this point, our signal has a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz, but it has this alias components that we will remove after we apply a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 8 kilohertz. So now our signal has a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz and it's band limited to 8 kilohertz. So as we said here, we reconstructed our signal identical to the low pass version of the downsampling size. So at this point, we had a signal with 32 kilohertz band limited to 8 kilohertz. And at this point, we have a signal with 32 kilohertz band limited to 8 kilohertz. After downsampling, we have a signal with a sampling rate of 16 kilohertz and band limited to 8 kilohertz. So far, we used the basic building blocks of multi-rate signal processing, downsampling and upsampling by a factor of n, and we are able to reconstruct the lowest one nth of our signal spectrum. Later on, we are going to see that uh, we can use aliasing into our favor, and with a combination of different filters, like low-pass filters, band-pass filters, high-pass filters, using more subbands and paying attention to the bandpass Nyquist theorem, we are able to reconstruct the full range of uh, the signal spectrum. Now we are going to talk about critical sampling. So critical sampling means that the down sampling rate n is identical to the number of subbands. In our previous example, we had a down sampling rate of n equals to 2, but we only had one subband. In critical sampling, the number of subbands must be equal to the downsampling rate. So if we have a downsampling rate n equals to 4, we need 4 subbands to have critical sampling. We reached now a point to talk about filter banks. So filter banks are the principal tool for multi-rate signal processing, and we can have analysis filter banks, we can have synthesis filter banks. So let's take a look at the analysis filter banks. So in this diagram, we can see our input signal x of n. We can see these boxes, the h of n's, that they are representing impulse responses of filters and the convolution operation. We have our boxes for our down samplers with a down sampling rate equals to n. And we have our result y of n. So we can um, see the result two ways. When we look into each subband, we have narrow bandwidth time signal. But if we look at each step m, we have spectra. So we have a set of spectra if we look for each step m, or we have a set of narrow bandwidth time signals if we look to each subband. This, is, this representation is called a time frequency rep representation because depending of, on our perspective, we will have a set of spectra or we have a set of bandwidth, narrow bandwidth time signals. So let's take a look at the operations involved in the analysis filter bank. We have a convolution operation and we have a downsampling operation. So the convolution operation is given by this formula here where x of n is our input signal, h of n is the impulse response of a filter with length capital L, and this sum here is diff is goes over only uh, where x of n and h of n are defined. So if you need a revision of uh, convolution 
or if you want to go a bit deeper into convolution, uh, you can go to Guitars AI GitHub, and there we will find a repository called Algorithms Repository, where I will I give um, some explanation and implementation of very important algorithms in four different programming languages, Python, JavaScript, Java, and C++. So there you'll find convolution in one dimension with a short explanation and the implementation in four different uh, programming languages. Then we um, there's an example, so it's an application of the convolution in one dimension with a moving average filter. There is the convolution in two dimensions and also an example with an application of the convolution in two dimensions which is an image edge detection filter. So you find this at the Guitars AI GitHub with the algorithms repository. So going back now at this point, we have X of N convolved with the, our filter and we have this formula. And now we need to take a look at the downsampling. So what is the downsampling operation doing? The downsampling operation is replacing our index n at the higher sampling rate so at this point, and we are replacing by m times our downsampling rate plus n0, which is the phase index. So we are repl replacing in this after the convolution, we are replacing the index m by m times n plus n0. And we have our downsampled signal that looks like this. So the analysis filter bank is decomposing the signal into different subbands with different frequency bands. So each frequency band has a lower bandwidth and has a lower sampling rate. And later on, we can use um, Bandpass Nyquist theorem, and we can reconstruct the original signal from these subbands. To reconstruct the original signal from the different frequency bands, we need the synthesis filter bank. So, in our synthesis filter bank, we have our different subbands with the different frequency bands. We have our upsampling stage, we have our filter stage, we add the output of the filters and we have our reconstructed signal. So for example, in a two-band system, with n equals to 2, so we have critical sampling, the tau sampling rate is equal to the number of subbands, and if we have a sampling rate for, of 32 kilohertz, for example, we will have two branches. One low-pass branch will reconstruct signals from 0 to 8 kilohertz, and also we have a high pass branch that will reconstruct the frequencies from 8 to 16 kilohertz. When we add these two subbands, uh, we obtain the full bandwidth from 0 to 16 kilohertz. So both in the analysis uh, filter bank and in the synthesis filter bank, we can make use of the band pass uh, Nyquist theorem. We can use different uh, filters and we can fish out the correct frequency image out of the alias images for a specific subband. Then when the subbands are added up we reconstruct our original signal. Hello there and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanau University of Technology. I am Renato and this is our second notebook, Multi-Resolution. So, in this notebook we are going to see uniform and non-uniform filter banks and then we are going to talk about uh, common types of frequency transforms we will be using. So we will talk about the discrete time Fourier transform, we will talk about the discrete Fourier transform, the discrete cosine transform, the Z transform, and uh, the short time Fourier transform. So let's get started. The frequency decomposition of a uniform filter bank has uniform bandwidth subbands and has the same sampling intervals 
for all subbands. So here, these re rectangles are representing time frequency beams. So we have uniform bandwidth subbands and the same sampling intervals for all subbands. One example of a uniform filter bank is a spectrogram. And we can use Python to plot a spectrogram of um, an audio file. So here we'll be using SciPy IO wave file to load our audio and matplotlib pyplot to plot our spectrogram. We import our libraries and make some configuration for matplotlib. We uh, load our audio file using uh, SciPy. We convert this to stereo, we convert it to mono. Then we plot the spectrogram using most of the default parameters, just changing the number of FFD and the sampling frequency. So here we have our spectrogram with no normalized frequency and the time in FFT blocks. We can play uh, this audio file using PyAudio. So um, in this case we're importing PyAudio and other libraries. We define some parameters. We create a PyAudio instance. We create um, a stream and then we convert our um, numbers that was loaded with um, the SciPy to, to a stream of bytes and then we uh, write these bytes to the stream and we close the stream so if we run the cell we should listen So uh, one of the reasons I chose this uh, audio file is not only is a classic and an incendiary song from ACDC, but also we can see some things here at the spectrogram and we can see this percussive sounds in the beginning and they have this vertical characteristics. At this point here is where it enters the drums with the guitars and we can see a bit more horizontal structure. This Things can be used in a harmonic percussive source separation so we can have some vertical filters and we can have some horizontal filters and try to separate the percussive sounds from harmonic sounds. It's a very interesting application in a musical information retrieval and we can see these things by um, analyzing a spectrogram. Another way to play audio files uh, is a very convenient way is using the IPython display so you uh, pass the name of our audio file and then it will create this it gives you these controls you can also download your file and it's very convenient if you want to uh, to play some, uh, some files. And we can also plot a spectrogram using Librosa. And Librosa is a very powerful Python library for audio processing, for music information retrieval. So it offers a lot of uh, functions. Now I'm uh, importing Librosa and I'm loading our new audio file using Librosa. So uh, then I am again displaying if we want to play it back so uh, here we just pass to the to the display to the audio display uh, the name of our file here we are loading our audio file with Librosa it's giving a numpy array and we can also play this numpy array if we pass it to the uh, display audio and we give it the sampling rate then we are using Librosa to uh, calculate the short time Fourier transform with 2048 FFT points and the hop length of 256. Then we are taking the magnitude. Here we are normalizing the magnitude. Then we are creating our plot and we're having our spectrogram. Now I'm using, uh, it's not the uh, power spectral density, but it's just the magnitude and I'm having the y-axis in log so here it is this is 
the classic sweet chocolate. One of the most iconic guitar introductions in modern rock by Maestro Slash. And I also chose this uh, piece, not only because it's magnificent, but also because we can also see some things in the spectrogram. So I chose this configuration. I have the uh, frequencies in logarithmic scale. And I have just the magnitude, not the power spectral density. And we can see, mostly here are the fundamental frequencies, so you can almost see how uh, transcription of uh, what Slash is playing. Once again, if we... So it gives you a uh, way to uh, see uh, very interesting how the notes are being played and we can see harmonics uh, and we can see the fundamental frequencies so these are two examples of spectrogram so uh, we have a spectrogram using matplotlib we play audio you you we load audio using scipy we play audio using pi audio then we uh, go to Librosa, we uh, load audio with Librosa, we play audio with I IPython display, we plot the spectrogram using Librosa, we calculated the short time Fourier transform with Librosa. These are examples of uh, uniform filter banks, same bandwidth for all frequency bands, the same sampling interval, the same time windows uh, for all subbands. Now we have another Python example. We will have a live spectrogram of a microphone signal and we'll talk about aliasing and um, downsampling, upsampling, like the uh, previous uh, basic blocks of multi rate uh, signal processing we talked about last um, uh, notebook. At this point, I am importing all the libraries. We're going to use Pi Audio again. We are going to use matplotlib, we are going to use uh, Jupyter widgets to um, have a graphical user interface, we are going to use threading, these are the libraries. Here is the uh, configuration of the parameters we are going to use, so we are defining sampling rate, defining the uh, factor of downsampling and upsampling, number of FFT, overlap, and now we are creating a low pass filter. We are using uh, SciPy to have this filter. Notice that we have a sampling rate of 32 kilohertz and our downsampling and upsampling factor is 8. So we remember that uh, we discussed that we have, we need to have a filter 1 eighth of the Nyquist frequency of the higher sampling rate. So Sampling rate is 32 kilohertz. The Nyquist frequency would be 16 kilohertz. One eighth of 16 is two, so we need to have it smaller than two. I'm having here 1.9 kilohertz, and here we are defining our low pass filter, and we can see just plotting frequency response of our low pass filter. We have phase, and we have our cutoff frequency at around 1.9 kilohertz and this is a function that will uh, plot the spectrogram that will get the uh, audio stream convert it to samples plot the uh, spectrogram so this is the function I'm calling run spectrogram it will be controlled by a button so we are reading from the stream getting the samples if the low pass filter before downsampling is on, it will filter the signal. This part here is a combination of downsampling and upsampling together. So when we downsampling, we are removing number of samples and we are upsampling, we are inserting zeros in between samples. So uh, when we combine these two, it's like if we are 
making some um, a number of samples to zero so it will be what we're doing in this part here this is the uh, low pass filter after up sampling so if the filter will be on it will filter the signal this part will play back the uh, the audio from the microphone and this will update our spectrogram at this part we are creating our graphical user interface we are having some buttons to control the start and stop and to to use down sampling and up sampling is on or is off and the low pass filters here we are creating a thread so we want to run this function inside a separate thread so we can have access to uh, the control buttons at this point is the usual configuration of pi audio we create a pi audio instance we create a stream here it will initialize our plot and create our graphical user interface so we will display the buttons it will display a starting plot this will handle when we close the plot what should happen when we run this cell we have here our controls and this will be our live spectrogram when we start so we can see our spectrogram now we are using the guitar as a signal input and we are playing a note when we activate down sampling and up sampling we can hear and see aliasing so there are no filters at the moment, but we, when we activate the filters, we can reconstruct up to 2 kHz. If we remove the filters, we can hear and see aliasing again. After the uniform frequency decomposition, the uniform filter banks, we'll just take a quick look on non-uniform frequency decomposition. For example, uh, the discrete wavelet transform which is basically a two-band decomposition. We have our signal, and we have a high-pass section and with downsampling, and then we have a low-pass section with downsampling, and we cascade these this blocks of high-pass filters and low-pass filters with downsampling, and we achieve frequency decompositions with different um, bandwidth for frequency subbands with uh, sampling intervals that halve at each step. For example, we can have scaled wavelet, we have, um, there are many types of wavelets. There, the har, there is the HAR uh, wavelet, the um, Dobeshi wavelet. You can spend months just studying wavelets. It's very powerful for many applications, but we will not go further. We will not go deeper in wavelets uh, in this course and in this uh, Jupyter tutorials and notebooks. So let's move on. During this course, Professor Schuller adopts um, notation convention and we will also adopt in this Jupyter notebooks and tutorials. So we'll use this sign to uh, refer to defined as. So we're defining, when we are defining something, we'll use this notation. We will use the letters T and F and capital T for continuous values and we use N, M, K, L for discrete values. We will use uh, lowercase uh, letters for time domain signals and we will use the uppercase letters for the transform domain signals. So for example, uh, X of omega, X of um, Z. We will use bold uh, face letters to denote vectors or matrices in both uh, time domain and both uh, transform domain. So uh, when we're using bold, we're referring to vectors and matrices. The conjugate complex is symbolized by the um, star, superscript star. In, in the transform domain, we will use the superscript star to denote the conjugate uh, only on coefficients, not including the argument C, and then we we'll use the overline to denote the complete conjugate complex operation, meaning that we are including the argument Z. Uh, we use the E of X as the expectation, which uh, we will use as the average of a signal X of N, for example. 
the down arrow n will symbolize a down sampling by a factor of n. We've seen before the down sampling will substitute n by this, and, uh, where n0 is the phase or the index of the first sample we keep in the down sampling. The uh, upper arrow n is the up sampling by a factor of n, including the insertion of zeros. Uh, and the uh, n0 is the phase. So it's the index of the first non-zero sample in the up-sampled signal. So we will follow these conventions during uh, all the course and all these tutorials. In the last part of this notebook, we will talk about common types of frequency transforms. Those frequency transforms are fundamental in signal processing. We will be using them in multi-rate signal processing in the course, in the examples, in our tutorials. And we will start with the discrete time Fourier transform, the DTFT. So uh, the DTFT is time discrete. So uh, our samples only exist at some sampling time points. We have a sampling interval, capital T. We have a sampling frequency, FS, that is one over the sampling interval. We have uh, infinite signal length from minus infinity to infinity. There is the uh, omega, which is the normalized angular frequency, which is 2 pi times f divided by the sampling frequency. Uh, just remembering that uh, half of the sampling frequency is called the Nyquist frequency. We talked about that before. And it's... Um, this transform is continuous in frequency and it's periodic, so it has a periodicity of 2 pi. And um, one thing to have in mind is that when one domain is discrete, the other domain is periodic. So we are in time discrete and that's periodic in frequency. This is also... Um, this transform is also invertible, so we have an inverse DTFT is given by this formula. And it's very, very uh, interesting to note and useful that uh, uh, convolution in time domain becomes a multiplication in the DTFT domain. And uh, multiplication is usually much more simple uh, then a convolution. Convolution is mathematically, mathematically more complicated. And that's the DTFT. Another transform is the discrete Fourier transform. So this transform it is a still time discrete, but now it's finite in time. So our signal has a fixed length of n samples. We can obtain the DFT as a special case of the DTFT, the discrete time Fourier transform that we've seen before, if we take our finite signal and we uh, repeat it mm, infinite times in the past and infinite times in the future, making it periodic with a period equals to n. Here is the equation to calculate the DFT, and we note that we have now a discrete frequency index k that goes from zero to n minus 1, where n is our n the number of samples. This uh, transform is also invertible, so we have an inverse transform given by this equation. So the DFT is discrete in frequency. It has the frequency index k, that is an integer between 0 to n minus 1. So it is periodic in frequency with period equals to n. And because we're dealing with a periodic uh, signal in time, we have what is called the circular convolution, which is given by this equation here, where mod is the modulus, so it's uh, the remainder of the division by n still applies that the uh, circular convolution in time becomes a multiplication in the DFT domain. 
one of the most important um, uh, properties in uh, these transforms is to remember that a periodic signal in time leads to discrete frequency. And discrete signal in time leads to periodic spectrum. And uh, we also have this symmetry between time and frequency, so it also holds that the discrete frequency will lead to peri periodic time and periodic frequency will lead to discrete time. The discrete cosine transform is a very important block transform and it can be a bit confusing because it exists many types of the DCT and each type may have several definitions. So for example, if we take a look at the documentation of the SciPy FFT pack, the DCT documentation, we see that they are offering four types of the DCT. They also offer a normalization mode, so it's basically a multiplication by a scaling factor. So they explain here which definition, so there are several definitions of the DCT one, we use the following. So they explain um, for each type, what is the definition they use, and what is the um, normalization mode, so what's the scaling factor they use if you set this normalization mode to ortho. In our case, we are going to use this definition here, which is not defined, there is no inbuilt type, uh, even though it's the type 4 is a different um, way that we are implementing here. So we see there is this scaling factor square root 2 over n. We can see a shift of 0 0.5 in the subband index k in the time index n. We can see this factor here of pi over n in contrast to a factor of um, 2 pi over n we have uh, seen in this uh, TFT. So this also will have some implications in terms of the properties of the DCT, we see here the block index M, so we're processing streams, and because we don't have an inbuilt function the way we want, we will adapt the uh, DCT type 3, so we can define the DCT type 4 like this, we uh, initialize, we have, um, we sample up the signal, we take the DCT type 3 with the uh, upsample signal. We use the uh, orthogonal norm normalization. We multiply it by uh, square root of 2 and we will have what we want. The DCT4, uh, when you multiply by a scaling factor, it um, can become uh, the, mat the DCT matrix can become orthogonal and because of the symmetry the inverse transform becomes exactly like the forward transform and that's our case. We are having here this um, orthonormal transform and we have that the uh, inverse DCT4 is exactly like the forward DCT4. So we can use this definition for both the transform the DCT4 and to in the inverse transform of the DCT4. The DCT has a different subband density, so as we are talking about this factor pi over n instead of the 2 pi over n, the frequency distance between two neighboring subband is only half as much as of the DFT, so the DCT provides twice the subband density when compared to the DFT. We now reached the Z transform, it's one of the most powerful transforms of discrete time. And we can see the Z transform as a generalization of the discrete time Fourier transform, the DTFT. So if we recall the definition of the DTFT, we see this e to the power of j omega, which is a complex number on the unit circle. But we, if we replace this complex number on the unit circle by a general complex number that doesn't need to be on the unit circle, we get the Z-transform. So 
So we are replacing e to the power of j omega by z. So um, in very general terms, the z-transform is turning a sequence into a polynomial. And we could use uh, SymPy, for example, to transform a sequence into a polynomial. So the uh, z-transform is more general than the DTFT, and it becomes more powerful because we can compute the z-transform for unstable signals of systems. So um, that would not be possible for the DTFT because the sum would not converge. We can determine if a um, system or a signal has damping. So if it lies inside a unit circle, we can see um, if it's unstable, if there are poles outside the unit circle generating exponentially growing signals. And this is the so-called two-sided Z-transform. But when you're, we are dealing with causal systems that has um, a starting point in time, we can have the one-sided uh, Z-transform that goes from zero to infinity. The convolution in time also becomes a multiplication in the Z domain, so we can take advantage of this. The Z transform is also invertible, so we have the inverse Z transform defined by this equation here with this closed contour integral. But when we have causal and stable Z transform, where all the poles are inside the unit circle, our closed contour can become the unit circle around the origin and we can set z to be equal to e to the power of j omega for omega in between 0 to 2 pi. So if we apply some um, variable substitution, we have that dz over d omega is equal to j times e to the power of j omega and our z transform, inverse z transform equation we can replace z by e to the powers of g, g, j omega. This z we replace by this here. The closed contour becomes the um, normal integral for omega going from 0 to 2 pi. And we have that the z transform, the inverse z transform for causal stable signals of our system becomes the inverse dtft identical to the inverse dt ft. So in practice, um, all finite length sequences are always causal and stable, and their inverse transform becomes the inverse dt ft, which um, are the coefficients of the z transform polynomial. And we can also use Python to get the coefficients of the uh, z transform Polynomial. Still um, remembering that what is periodic in time results in discrete frequency and the discrete time um, results into periodic frequency. So in practice we always will have discrete finite signals so our frequency domain will be discrete and periodic. Let's now take a look at a few Python examples for Z-transform Z and we will start with the Z-transform of an exponentially decaying function defined like this. So we have our signal 0 0.5 to the power of n for n greater or equal to 0 and 0 elsewhere. When we apply the Z-transform we will get this summation here and this summation is equal to this here. So here we can see a pole when z is equal to 0 0.5. We can see that the uh, z transform converse for all values um, the, when the absolute value of z is greater than 0 0.5. And this is called the region of convergency. And we can see there is a, a, a correspondence of an exponential time function to a pole in the z domain. So by looking at the uh, z transform here we can see that there is a, a correspondence of uh, an exponential uh, time function and a pole in z domain. So uh, let's see how did we solve this, how do we go from here to here and let's make use of the geometric sum. So the geometric sum is a summation uh, like this. 
So let's uh, use a trick. So if we multiply this here by a, so we will have a times s. So a will go inside here and there will be a summation with a to the power of n plus 1. And this is the same as if we do the summation from n equals to 1 until n, capital N, plus 1. So this is the original geometric sum. We multiply this by a and we obtain this. So now we will take a times s, which is this, minus s, which is this. So a times s minus s is the same as s times a minus 1, so a times s minus s, and we will have that a times s we had here, and s we have here. So when we take this summation minus this summation, we will end up with a to the power of n, capital N, plus 1, minus 1. So when we, if we expand the sum, we will see that uh, all the um, elements will cancel because we're taking one minus the other and they will be equal not for the last element of this sum which is a to the power of n when n is equal to n plus one and here we will have when n is equal to zero so we have here a to, to the power of zero which is this one here so when we take a times s this summation minus s this summation we will end up with these two elements here so if we now divide these elements by a minus one we will get that this summation is equal to this divided by this with some manipulation we end up like this so we just if we multiply uh, up and down by minus one we have here now if we replace this a by the z transform here so this is a summation if all of this is equal to a a to the power of n from n from zero to infinity so that's what we're doing here we're replacing this a here by this and we get this here but now we don't want from 0 to n we want from 0 to infinity so if we take the limit when n goes to infinity this factor here will go to 0 and we will end up with this result here 1 over 1 minus 0 0.5 times z to the power of minus 1 which is what we've seen here so we use the geometric sum and this trick here of uh, multiplying by a and then take a times s minus s so when we do this summation minus this summation only what is left is this factor here minus this uh, when n is equal to zero here and we have our result we can also use uh, simpy to uh, solve this so uh, if we don't want to uh, do all these maths we can make use of symbolic pi so we're importing symbolic pi we're defining the symbols and here we're doing summation 0 0.5 times z to the power of minus 1 here to the power of n here going from n going from 0 to n so there it is we have here the same result as here so it's 1 minus 0 0.5 times z to the power of minus 1 to the power of n plus 1 what we have here and this here is here so when uh, if we would do the limit when n goes to infinity this here goes to 0 and we end up is with this here unfortunately some pi sin pi has some limitations and especially when we are dealing with um, infinity and it cannot calculate um, the infinity in this case so for example if I change here to infinity 
we will have an error so it just gives me which is the uh, exactly this here so we cannot calculate or if we try to take the limit of this result here when n goes to infinity we have this result it doesn't know how to calculate um, so there is uh, this limitation but we can still use up to a certain level this next example is a simple example and we want to convolve the a signal x with a future impulse response h using the z transform so we know that the convolution in time is equal to a multiplication in the z domain so we can make the z, uh, take the z transform of uh, both the signal and the future impulse response multiplying the z domain take the inverse uh, z transform and we will have the result of the convolution of x with h so if we take the z transform of x we have this polynomial here the z transform of h we have this polynomial here and we multiply in the z domain we have this polynomial here we take the inverse of z trans transform that we've seen that the inverse of z transform are the coefficients of this polynomial so we have this as a result of y to see if it's correct the convolution in the time domain if we use numpy and we convolve x with h and we have the same result and also remembering that the convolution is defined by this equation here we can implement this equation using pure python without uh, using numpy and we see that we get the same result so if the simple example we um, showed that the convolution in time corresponds to a multiplication in the z domain so we took the z transform of um, the sequence x and the future impulse response h we multiply them in the z domain we take the inverse z transform which is just the coefficients of this polynomial and we have the result which is the same as convolving the two signals and that's it for the z transform let's move on and this is the last topic of this notebook it is the short time Fourier transform widely used in signal processing and is basically a discrete Fourier transform applied to short blocks of the signal so we take our signal and we divide it into overlapping blocks each block has a length of n and um, the overlapping is defined by the hop size m so here is the uh, analysis equation so we have m is the block index and h of n is a window a window uh, function in the synthesis part we have the synthesis equation and the overlap box they are added up which is called the overlap add and also the window has uh, the overlap add property defined here that it's equal to one so we can see the short time Fourier transform as a filter bank with non-critical sampling that's usually m is smaller than n so the overlap uh, the hop length is smaller than the block length so in literature literature you find um, the window function applied only in the analysis part but applying it into the synthesis part it improves the um, resulting synthesis uh, filters and it's um, more similar like usual uh, future banks so here's a python example so we will take the short time Fourier transform of a sequence from 0 to 31 so this is our signal we will use the um, scipy stft function so uh, we're taking a block size of 4 and um, the default overlap is um, block size divided by 2 so this will result in three subbands 
that was sampled by two. So here is the result of the short time Fourier transform. We have the frequencies of the FFT subbands. So we have three subbands. We have the times of the uh, subband uh, samples. And we can reconstruct by taking the inverse STFT and we get our signal back. So here is one last example. We will take the uh, short time Fourier transform of uh, an audio file. So I'm loading the audio file with SciPy like we did before, converting it to mono, taking the short time Fourier transform like we did in the previous example by using different parameters. And then I'm plotting using PyPlot P color mesh. And it gives us a spectrogram very similar to the one we had before in the first examples when we use the matplotlib pyplot spectrogram function and we also use Librosa to have the short time Fourier transform and the spectral to plot the, the spectrogram. So that's it for this um, notebook. We've seen uniform and non-uniform future banks and then we went through many frequency transforms that we um, will be using uh, during the course and then in all these uh, Jupyter Notebooks tutorials and um, that's it. See you next time. Hello there and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanal University of Technology. I am Renato and this notebook is about frequency response. We are going to revise and see ways of computing the frequency response, the relation between impulse response and frequency response. We will see uh, how to calculate frequency response and we go through many examples, a bit of revision on decibels, on filters. We are going to see uh, the discrete convolution as matrix multiplication. Let's get started. The impulse response and the frequency response are related by the DTFT. This gives us two ways to describe a system, or in time or space domain with the impulse response, or in frequency domain with the frequency response, and we can go back and forth by taking the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform. An impulse has a flat spectrum, and this allows us to investigate all the frequencies of interest in the frequency domain. But in many applications, it's not possible to feed a system with the impulse. This may damage or destroy the system, for example. And uh, we can use different techniques to have a measurement of the frequency response. And from the frequency response, if we, if we take the inverse Fourier transform, we get the impulse response. So um, we are going to take a look at two examples on how to measure a frequency response. First, using a white noise, because the white noise has approximately a, f a flat spectrum, similar to an impulse. And then we are going to use a sweeping sinusoid, where we increase the frequency of a sinusoid and we keep the amplitude constant to get a measurement of the frequency response. In this example, we are going to use noise to obtain the frequency response of a black box system. By black box system, I mean a system that we don't have any information about, that we don't know what it does. The only thing we know when we can pretend is just a black box that we can feed in some input uh, signal and we can measure the output of this black box. The idea here is to use noise because it has approximately flat frequency spectrum. So all the frequencies we are interested to investigate are present in this input signal. And we will make use of the concept of transfer function. So in the frequency domain, we will divide the output of this black box by the input signal, this gives us a transfer function, and when we take the inverse Fourier transform of this uh, transfer function, we will end up with an impulse response of the system. 
Here we are loading some Python libraries. So we are going to use SciPy to calculate the FFTs. We are going to use matplotlib and plotly to plot. And um, these are the signal processing parameters we are going to use for this example. So we're using a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz and a number of FFT points, 2 to the power of 16 points. So that's approximately 65,500 and something. So uh, the time interval we're going to use to generate our signals will be approximately uh, 2 seconds. So we are using 32 kilohertz sampling frequency and 2 to the power of 16 points that gives us approximately 2 seconds. Here is our black box system. So um, it's this array of numbers. So we can, we can pretend that we don't know uh, what's inside here. It's just a black box. But in any case, this is um, we can see as an impulse response of a system. And even if we look at those numbers, we don't know what it's doing. We don't know the characteristics of the system. So um, we will try to, uh, when we get the frequency response of the system and we get the impulse response, it should be, we should get the same numbers as we're, that are inside here, this black box. At this point, we're defining our input signal. So we are creating this noise vector from a normal distribution with zero mean and unit variance using uh, 2 to the power 16 points. So this will give us around 2 seconds when we use a sampling frequency of 32 kilohertz. Here we are taking the FFT of this noise vector. So by default, SciPy using the length of this, uh, this vector, we give it as an input to calculate the FFT. So um, this will be also 2 to the power of 16 uh, FFT points and here is our noise in the time domain so we can it's around two seconds we can listen so it sounds like noise here is our output signal so we're convolving noise with the black box and this gives us an output so here we can listen to this output. So we perceive that there is an impression of much less high frequencies in this um, in this signal. Uh, this indicates perhaps an idea that our black box could be a low pass filter. Uh, here we are taking the FFT of the output of the black box with the convolution of noise with the black box. Then what we will do is like in the frequency domain, we are dividing the output of the black box by the input of the black box. And we have this uh, shape here that really indicates like a low, low pass filter. We are using noise and we are using this technique of transfer function. This curve, it's very noisy, so what we can do is we can smooth out a bit this curve. So I will implement a moving average filter. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm creating a moving average filter with 32 points. And this red curve now is a smooth version of our transfer function of the black box. So uh, just reminding, we divided the output of the black box with the input of the black box in the frequency domain and this is what we are looking here so the red is a smooth version so i applied a moving average filter with 32 points and we can see around 200 hertz we have um, this minus 3 db so uh, we could say that maybe this is a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 200 hertz um, then at 2000 hertz we have minus 20 something uh, dBs and this indicate that um, there is a roll off of minus 20 dB per decade and this could be a characteristic of a first order low pass um, filter so just by looking at this 
let's say the frequency response obtained use noise uh, in the transfer function of this black box we already can see that this could be uh, a low pass filter so then what we can do now is like um, if we take the inverse we transform of the transfer function we just have here this is what we do here and we will plot those array of numbers that was our black box and we will plot the inverse we transform of the um, transfer function and we can see that our calculated impulse response is very similar to the black box itself so uh, we succeeded in a good approximation so this is uh, what uh, we expected so after this process of measuring a frequency response and taking the inverse Fourier transform to end up with the same numbers that were inside this black box array so by analyzing here we've seen that it could be a first order low pass filter and if we compare with a butterworth filter first order 200 hertz cutoff frequency we see that um, our black box is a very good approximation of this butterworth filter so um, in fact what i did to have this black box is that i already uh, had this butterworth filter then i simulated uh, some kind of impulse response using 128 points so let's say it's a truncated version of uh, impulse response of a butterworth filter as uh, analog filters have infinite um, impulse response but we can have approximation by truncating so this is what i used uh, to construct this uh, black box so we can see that uh, using noise and using this transfer function uh, technique getting the frequency response turned out to be a good approximation of uh, a real um, system in the second example we are going to use the same technique but instead of using noise we are going to use a sweeping sinusoid as an input signal and we also have a different black box so we will call it black box 2 the same array of numbers but let's pretend we don't know what's inside even if we look at these numbers it's not saying um, uh, anything to us so um, our input signal will be a sweeping sinusoid so here is where I am creating the sweeping sinusoid it will go from 0 to um, 16 kilohertz so it's the sampling frequency divided by 2 and we will have uh, 2 to the power of 16 points so here is how it looks like just the beginning of our sweeping sinusoid I'm not plotting all the points otherwise it's difficult to see and we can have the spectrogram of this uh, sweeping sinusoid and we see it goes to a bit more than two seconds and frequency uh, we increase the frequency and we keep the amplitude constant so we have here frequency from 0 to 16 kilohertz but we can also listen to this sweeping sinusoid What we do, the same uh, procedure like before, we will take the uh, Fourier transform of our input uh, signal, which is the sweeping sinusoid, and here we can see the um, in frequency domain, the frequency and the magnitude of our sweeping sinusoid. Uh, we can see that there is this um, these parts with many oscillations. And this could be due to the Gibbs phenomenon or we have these discontinuities in the beginning in the end of our our signal uh, we are going to use the transfer function uh, concept again so it doesn't really matter uh, that we have this um, 
these uh, oscillations here uh, at this part but just to um, to revise a bit uh, and to for learning purposes let's apply a window to our signal and see what happens in the frequency domain so I will apply a tucky window so this is our sweeping sinusoid in blue our just the beginning of the uh, tucky window here in um, orange and in green is a result of our signal our sweeping sinusoid in blue our just the beginning of the uh, tucky window here in um, orange and in green is a result of our signal we see that the wire is moving also the beginning and end of um, our signal avoiding this kind of um, abrupt uh, discontinuations and then in the uh, we can listen to the window we don't really notice uh, so much difference but we can see in the frequency domain so in blue was our original signal and in orange is the windowed signal so we can see that by introducing this windowing we avoided this uh, this kind of uh, oscillations so um, it's normalized to the peak so um, i'm normalizing here both signals so this is why zero to be um, is showing here but we just see now that the windowed version of um, our signal get um, much smoother uh, frequency characteristics and we see that our signal has frequencies from 0 to 16 kilohertz so this is what we want to investigate and now we will convolve our input signal with the black box number two then we will take the fft of um, the output of the black box number two and we can also listen we can notice that seems to have less low frequency content when we take the transfer function so we're dividing the output of the black box with the input of the black box and we see that this is the curve that we obtain when we plot this transfer function by analyzing here we see these ripples in the uh, pass band it looks like a, a um, high pass so it's cutting to around 8 kilohertz it has these ripples and it's at 800 hertz it's uh, already on minus 80 minus 78 we see here that there is a roll off that is more than 60 db but less than 80 db perhaps this would indicate that it's a third order filter and if you remember uh, analog filters the chebby chev filter has these characteristics of ripples in the pass band and a steeper roll off in the uh, cut region uh, that's more than the butterworth filter and if we compare with a chebby chev filter type 1 so i'm constructing here a Chebyshev with third order with 3 uh, db in the allowance in the pass band as a ripple 8 kilohertz cutoff frequency and i'm also compared with the bertha Ward filter just so we can have an idea so we see that the black box and the Chebyshev third order type 1 filter they are very close to each other so it could be a very good approximation so the we have uh, much more uh, attenuation in the Chebyshev even if the same order as the Butterworth filter if we take the inverse Fourier transform of our black box we will have our impulse response of the um, 
of the filter and again I expect it to be a truncated version of the um, impulse response of a Chebyshev filter. I also constructed this black box this way so when we plot the impulse response and the black box we see that they match so indeed we have achieved our purpose of identifying the system uh, using a frequency response calculated using a sinusoid um, sweeping sinusoid so it's the same technique we used before but with a different input signal if you're interested in these techniques i leave here a video that i took part in the matlab context um, five years ago so i implemented a dual channel fft audio analyzer so it's based in this principle of transfer function and i give a small demonstration in this um, in this video and that these techniques they are used in many professional audio analyzers so we have um, from Meyer Sound the SIM3 uh, audio analyzer they use it to align uh, sound systems we have Smart and we have many others um, other manufacturers that are offering this kind of uh, transfer function audio analyzers so we can also uh, obtain the frequency response of a system if we have the Z transform if we replace Z by e to the power of uh, J omega so this is also the relation between Z transform and the DTFT that we seen before in this case when we replace Z by e to the power of J omega the formulas of both transforms becomes identical and this is something like reading now the Z transform along the unit circle in the complex domain so we also have a periodicity uh, of 2 pi and we have that for real valued signals there is a symmetry between the upper half of this circle and the lower half of this um, circle so we have a complex conjugate symmetry uh, in this complex plane so by uh, replacing z by e to the power of g omega we can compute the frequency response of uh, our system and we can uh, have an example of this process so here we have a low pass filter as a moving average so this is the equation for this um, moving average filter and we know that a unit impulse is equal to one when n is equal to zero and zero elsewhere so if we replace here uh, the, u the unit uh, impulse x will be the unit impulse and then we will have our impulse response h of n and it will be half and half so we can see the impulse response also in a factor way so um, it's good to uh, point out that the discrete convolution operation can also be written as a matrix multiplication when we use a so-called Sylvester matrix so if we change the shape of our impulse response vector in the format of a Sylvester matrix like this and then we have convolution in terms of matrix multiplication so we have our input vector we multiply by the Sylvester matrix and we have an output which is the discrete convolution we can also change the shape of our input signal and multiply a matrix multiplication with the impulse response vector and we still have the convolution so we can have an example I will use the uh, impulse response the same as we have here 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 and our test signal will be 1 2 3 4 5 sequence of numbers from 1 to 6 here I'm creating the Sylvester matrix so we have from our vector of impulse response now we change it into matrix form using this so-called Sylvester matrix and now if a matrix do a matrix multiplication with our test signal which is a vector 1 2 3 4 5 6 and we multiply by the Sylvester matrix 
and then we will have our output. And in fact, we can see that when we use NumPy convolve, so the convolution by the NumPy library, and we have this matrix multiplication, we have exactly the same results. So another example, not using the Sylvester matrix, but using this change of shape in the input signal, we will now convolve our sweep sinusoid that we used in previous example with the black box number two that we also used in the previous example. Uh, so this is a, a high pass um, a pro filter approximation of a Chebyshev uh, type one of third order with a 3db allowance and ripple in the pass band. And the uh, uh, cutoff frequency was um, 8 kilohertz. So when we uh, apply this matrix operation, so we're multiplying, we will change the shape of our sinusoid, uh, sweeping sinusoid. So this is what we're doing here. And then we'll multiply with our black box uh, vector. So it's the impulse response and we will have our So if you remember the sweeping sinusoid, you've seen here that it removed the uh, low frequencies from the sweeping sinusoid. And in fact, if we plot a spectrogram of the output of this convolution, we see that um, uh, around it's cutting, attenuating the signals on the cut band, and then after the cutoff frequency, the signals are back to normal. So now we use here um, convolution as a matrix multiplication. So we can see the discrete convolution operation also as matrix multiplication. So let's go back to the frequency response. So the Z transform of this uh, moving average low pass filter is given here. So when we replace z by e to the power of j omega, we will have this thing here. And usually you were interested in a magnitude and phase, phase of the frequency response. So we can take the magnitude operation uh, here and the phase. So we can compute using Python. So here I'm importing SymPy, defining z as a symbol. So we'll have Z transform as a polynomial. So this is what we are doing here. So we usually we flip the coefficients of the input response and then we construct a polynomial with Z to the power of minus one. So here what we have is the Z transform. Uh, with a bit of expression manipulation, we can change. So here it's easier to see that we have a pole when z is equal to zero and a zero when z is equal to minus one and we have also this gain factor of 0 0.5 and now if we replace z by e to the power of j omega and we choose a desired frequency so we're choosing 100 points between zero and pi so pi will be until half of the um, upper circle on the uh, complex domain so we're initializing a frequency response with complex zeros and here we are replacing c by e to the power of j omega and then we can compute here we have the magnitude response for 100 points so we see uh, that it's a low pass filter here. This is a normalized frequency, so pi is 3.14 here is the Nyquist frequency. And we see it's far from being a perfect uh, ideal low pass filter. So if we plot in the dB scale and also the phase, we will have here is what we're doing. We're plotting now in um, the dB scale, and we're also plotting the phase so we see it's a linear phase with a slope of 0 0.5 so uh, here we see the normalized frequency so pi is the Nyquist frequency and we see the slope 
of 0 0.5 so it's a linear phase and here we can see the um, magnitude in the db scale we can also do using frac z so i'm using the same 100 points uh, that we uh, used before it will give us, give us the frequency response and the omegas used to calculate and we can plot so here also is the magnitude in the db scale so this is our uh, moving average low pass future given by these coefficients 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 We can also make use of signal SciPy and Python control library to calculate uh, magnitude and phase and plot zeros and poles and have different uh, functions uh, creating LTI systems. So here I'm extracting pole zeros and gain from the polynomial of the Z-transform that we defined here. here we can now plot these pole zeros and gain in this nice complex plane so we have a pole when z is equal to zero and a zero when z is equal to minus one and we can create an lti system we're using the scipy signal libraries that's what we're doing here we can also convert from zeros poles and gain and now we'll make use of um, the control library and have a transfer function so from uh, zero poles in gain we go to um, nominator and denominator of uh, transfer function then we are using the control to have a transfer function and then we can plot using this pz map and we have this kind of plot which is pole zero map so we have a pole when z is equal to zero and a zero when z is equal to minus one and we can also with this transfer function system we can use the both diagram and we have our magnitude and our phase uh, just like we did uh, with previous techniques we come to the end of this notebook with a revision of the decibel so we'll go through an experiment and in this process we will investigate uh, different uh, characteristics of the decibels and um, many other things so in this experiment we will have uh, two input signals so we'll have a sine wave with a 50 hertz and an amplitude equals to two and we will pretend this uh, for example our voltage values and we will have a cosine with two uh, hertz two kilohertz and the amplitude of 10 and we will add these two signals when we see we have our sine wave so i'm plotting just the one period of the sine wave and then we have our cosine with uh, amplitude of 10 and our sine wave with amplitude of 2 and when we add uh, these two signals we have this uh, input signal here so then we will take the fft of uh, this input signal and here i'm having the fft that now i'm uh, using uh, 2 to the power of 16 a number of FFT points I'm calculating the magnitude I'm compensating here for the number of FFT points and the frequencies on the uh, the negative frequencies so when I plot uh, the magnitude of the FFT we have here our two components one at 50 Hertz another one at 2000 Hertz so we have here a magnitude of almost 10 but here we already see that our magnitude is 1.5 so this is due to the scalloping error so it happens uh, the FFT here has a limited number of FFT points and depending where your frequency is located maybe it's in not in the center of the beam but it's in um, in the middle of two beams and we have this error in amplitude so bear in mind that when, when we don't have any um, window we are in fact using rectangular window and the rectangular window has certain characteristics in frequency so what we can do is we can use windowing and a very good window 
to estimate the amplitude of um, sine waves in the frequency domain is the so-called the flat top window. So what I'm going to do here is I'm creating this flat top window and then I am um, multiplying our signal in time domain with uh, this window. Then I'm taking the FFT of the windowed input signal and here I taking into consideration also the the window and now we have here our um, new windowed signal so the um, magnitude and also in db scale so now the same signal but a windowed version of this um, signal and we see now we have two at 50 hertz and 10 uh, at 2000 hertz which were the original amplitudes of our input signal and now we come in the db scale so uh, we will take a reference as one voltage so we had an amplitude of two volts in the db scale it will represent by 6 db if we have 10 volts in the db scale with a reference to one volt we have 20 db so we can already see that there is a ratio of two so two volts and our reference voltage is one so we get 6 db and when we have 10 volts and the reference voltage is one volt we have 20 db so let's go back and um, revise the db so db is a ratio and now we have two different um, equations depending if we're dealing with voltage or if we're dealing with power so usually we can have power um, is uh, proportional to the voltage squared and this is why we have this difference so the equation for voltage is 20 log 10 of v2 uh, divided by v1 and then Simpy already transforms this log 10 as two uh, natural logarithm in the base of um, natural logarithm. So it gets a 20 log of v2 or v1 divided by uh, log 10. So this is um, what Simpy already simplifies uh, the um, logarithms in the base 10 to 2 division in logarithms of um, natural logarithms so and we see the biggest difference here is that we have 10 log for power and 20 log for voltage so if we have our values here and we solve these equations we will see that for example when uh, the amplitude is 2 and then we will our reference voltage is 1 our voltage is 2 and then we have 6 db as we seen here so we had 2 here and we have 6 here we will now design some filters and make more experiments with our input signal so i will start designing a butterworth filter a low pass second order with a cutoff frequency at 200 hertz and we can see here's the frequency response of the low pass filter so i'm giving a gain of 10 and as we've seen a gain of 10 in db scale is um, 20 db then i'm also designing a high pass butterworth filter of first order uh, with a cutoff frequency of 1000 hertz or one kilohertz so this filter has no gain so it should be 0 db in the log scale so we have our high pass filter here and now we will cascade these two filters and we will see the resulting um, cascading filter is somehow a band pass and we see that we had here a 20 db gain uh, in the um, pass band of the low pass but when it's cascaded with this roll off of minus 20 um, db of the high pass then we will have here the resulting uh, attenuation 
in this frequency region. So we see that here we have um, at 200 hertz. So if we zoom in 200 hertz, we have 2.81. DB, this is the result because we have uh, 16.9 DB here from the low pass and we also have uh, approximately so it's uh, minus 14 so we add this to uh, DB and we have the resulting um, DB here. So on the when we see our input signals, so we will see we have here 6 dB, but our filter will attenuate at 200 Hertz, we will attenuate uh, at 50 Hertz, we will attenuate uh, minus 6.03 uh, dB. And at uh, 2 uh, kilohertz, it will, our resulting filter will attenuate uh, minus 21.175 um, dBs. So this is what we, uh, we will do now is we will take the, uh, we'll filter our signals in the frequency domain, so we are multiplying our input signals by the cascaded filters, and then we will uh, already solve our dB equation for V2, and so now we will compare the, um, the signals before filtering and after filtering, so our reference voltage now would be before filtering, and we want to find out what will be the new uh, voltage amplitude uh, with filtering. So we solve for V2 and we get this equation. And when we substitute the value, so our voltage was 2. And then we will have a um, attenuation of minus 6.025 uh, dB. So the new amplitude for the 50 Hertz component should be 0. 99, so approximately uh, 1. It makes sense because minus 6 dB is like if we're a ratio of uh, half, so 0 0.5, so 2 divided by 2 is uh, 1, uh, 2 divided by uh, 2 is 1. And uh, for the our frequency component of 2 uh, kilohertz, it was uh, 10 volts before filtering, but we'll have an attenuation of minus 21.175, so it's a bit more than 20 dB. If it would be 20 dB, then it will be uh, a 1 volt, so we have this ratio of 10, uh, gain of 10 and 20 dB in the dB scale, so the new amplitude for the 2 kilohertz component will be 0.87. So, if we uh, take now, if we plot the frequency domain, uh, the frequency uh, in the frequency domain, our output signal, we will see that indeed we have an amplitude of um, zero, approximately zero dB in the 50 hertz um, component that it's equal to an amplitude of 1, approximately 1, like we calculated before, and the 2 kilohertz component is minus 1.17 uh, dB, and it's equal to 0 0.873, like we calculated with the equations the, uh, for dB. So we've seen that uh, when we cascade uh, two systems, and then the uh, in dB we are going to add the um, the attenuations or gains, and we see there's a ratio of a 6 dB in voltage 
that is uh, we're doubling the uh, amplitude and if we have a 10 times ratio we have this 20 dB and we see also that 0 dB gain it's, um, uh, in the dB in the amplitude is equal to 1 so there's no no change there's no gain or, or no attenuation uh, when it's 0 dB and this was our revision of uh, decibels and it's the end of this notebook about frequency response. Hello there and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Sula at the UMNL University of Technology. I am Renato and on this notebook we will start talking about filters. So we will analyze an ideal low pass filter in the frequency domain. We will compute its impulse response using the inverse DTFT and we will take a look at the characteristics of this filter in the time domain and we will see why an ideal filter is not practically implementable. We will also start looking on ways to make an approxim approximation of an ideal filter using uh, windows and using delay. So uh, let's get started. An ideal low pass filter looks like this brick wall filter described by this picture here. So we have a magnitude of 1 in the pass band and a magnitude of 0 in the stop band. So these equations here are describing the frequency response of an ideal low pass filter. So we have from minus omega c to plus omega c. Omega c is our cutoff frequency. Is, um, it's equal to 1 in the pass band and equal to 0 elsewhere. So when we apply the inverse DTFT to this frequency response described by this equation, we will have the impulse response. So here we have the equation of the inverse DTFT and we see that uh, outside the pass band it's equal to zero so this integral would go to zero but inside the pass band from minus omega c to plus omega c this um, frequency response is equal to one so we are substituting this by one and when we solve this integral we have this result here with this complex exponent so if you uh, remember the Euler's formula we can replace this uh, complex exponential by a sign so this is what I am reminding here about the Euler's formula and then we have the final result of our impulse response which is a sync function it is important to notice that when n is equal to zero we will have an indetermination of zero divided by zero so we can apply the L'Hopital rule uh, to obtain a value for when n is equal to 0. So the L'Hopital rule tells us that the limit when n goes to 0 of the derivative of uh, this function here divided by this function here. So uh, the derivative of this uh, related to n is pi and the derivative of this part related to n is a cosine so it's omega c times cosine of omega c times n when n goes to 0 the cosine goes to 1 and we end up with omega c divided by pi so these two equations here now are describing the impulse response of an ideal low pass filter so we can also use simpy instead of doing this mathematical calculations so here I'm importing symbols integral simplify pi exponential and complex numbers from simpy here I'm defining the symbols omega c omega and n here I'm defining this this inverse DTFT integral so it's 1 divided by 2 pi times this integral here so this is what we have here and here we are solving we are obtaining exactly what we had before with this complex exponential and when we uh, tell simplify to simplify it will apply the Euler's formula like we did here and we end up with the sync function so from here there are two things uh, very important that we need to pay attention 
So the first one is that our signal goes from minus infinity to infinity. So it is an infinite length. And this is not very good for practical applications. If we want to implement a finite impulse response filter, we cannot deal with um, infinite values and uh, it should have a filter with a certain length. So this is already a problem for um, implementation. And another problem is that this uh, system is non-causal. So we have these values of n going uh, to minus infinity. So this is another problem if uh, we want to have causal systems. So there are two things we can do. We already see that it's uh, not possible to implement an ideal low pass filter, but we can have approximations of an ideal low pass filter. Uh, if we could give the system an infinite delay, so this would make the system causal, but it's also not possible to give an infinite delay to a system. Another thing what we can do is to truncate, we can truncate um, this uh, impulse response. So instead of having infinite values, it will have a limited length of a um, certain number of samples, so the length L. And then with this truncated version, we can apply a certain delay of a certain number of samples. And we have now a finite signal and causal system. So we will need to see the effect of uh, truncating uh, this impulse response and giving it a delay to make it practically implementable. So let's take a look at the delay. Uh, we can write a delay by n sample points as a multiplication of the signal with z to the power of minus m in the z domain. So here we have a multiplication with t to the power of minus m, and we see that this is a delay of n samples. So a delay of n samples in the time domain corresponds to a multiplication with z to the power, power of minus m in the z domain. And we can also observe that this delay can be written as a convolution of this impulse response uh, in the time domain. So this impulse response will have n zeros before a one. So f is equal to one when n is equal to n and zero elsewhere. And then this convolution sum will uh, show us that it's indeed a delay. And if we take the z-transform of this impulse response, we end up with the z to the power of minus m as we said before. So it's very important to remember that the um, multiplication of z to the power of minus m in the z domain corresponds to a time domain delay of n samples. And this is one of the fundamentals of multi-ray signal processing. Let's take a look uh, into a Python example of delay. So here I have my signal, so it's this uh, input signal. It's a sequence of numbers from zero to um, n equals to zero until n equals to three. So we have four samples and it's a sequence from one to four. Here is our delay, so it's our shift operator. So we have uh, three zeros before a one and we will convolve this signal with our delay. That's what we are doing here. And what we have is our original signal. It's one, two, three, four, exactly like this, but with a delay of three samples. So M in this case is equal to three. So we can observe here delay by three samples. So if we want to see the frequency response of our delay or our shift operator, we can use this uh, trick we um, used before. So we replace z by e to the power of j omega, and we see that this is the frequency response of our delay. So it has a magnitude of one, and it has a phase of minus m times omega. So we can see that it's linear phase with a slope of minus m. 
So if we plot with the frequency response, this is what we are doing here now. I'm using track V from a sci-fi signal. And we have here the phase of our uh, frequency response of our delay. And this is the unwrapped version. So it's m omega going from 0 to pi. This is the Nyquist frequency. And we have the slope of minus m, as we've seen before here. Finally, we can apply the inverse discrete time Fourier transform to obtain the corresponding impulse response f h of n. For our ideal low pass filter, we obtain the well known sync function as the impulse response. For the phase equals to zero, and for a desired upper limit of our passband omega p, we obtain the following. So h of n is equal to sine of n times omega p divided by n times omega p, with n going from minus infinity to plus infinity, which makes the future indeed non-causal, and it cannot be made causal. So this shows that that's, that's a future that's not practically implementable. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanau University of Technology. I am Renato, and on this tutorial, we are going to start talking about window functions and how to design filters using this window method. Let's get started. Last time we saw how we can obtain the impulse response of the ideal low pass filter, the sync function. The problem of this impulse response is that it's non causal and we also cannot make it causal because it starts at minus infinity. We cannot add infinite delay. So here is our sync fun function going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Assume we would like to have a causal finite impulse response, uh, FIR low pass filter meaning the impulse response starts at time zero and extends over only a finite amount of samples and goes from zero to L minus one for a length L. So observe that FIR filters have no, no correspondence in the analog domain. Analog filters always have an infinite impulse response, IIR. How do we design this filter such that it becomes similar in some sense to the ideal? since we cannot get the ideal filter. So let's take a look at this example. We will design an anti-aliasing filter for sampling rate conversion. The original signal is from a CD with 44.1 uh, kilohertz sampling rate, hence an audio bandwidth of about up to uh, 20 kilohertz. And we would like to downsample it to 22 kilohertz sampling rate. For example, for a Mac computer. In order to be able to downsample it, we first have to low pass it. For instance, the pass band should be from 0 to 9 kHz and the stop band to avoid aliasing of frequencies above 11 kHz should be from 11 kHz on to the maximum. Here is 22.05 kHz. Since we don't have an ideal filter, we need to include a transition band here from 9 kHz to 11 kHz to let the filter transition from pass band to stop band with intermediate attenuations. Aliasing is something that is easily perceived by the ear, hence we would like to have at least 60 dB attenuation from 11 kHz and up. The pass band can take some ripples in the frequency response, for instance plus or minus 2 dB corresponding to about plus or minus 25% in voltage. The frequency range from 9 kHz to 11 kHz is the so-called transition band, which gives the filter space to build up its attenuation from 0 to 60 dB to make sure it already has the 60 dB at 11 kHz. In this way, we can formulate requirements for a similarity of our filter, even though we know we cannot reach the optimum. 
so that's a practical approach. A first and perhaps naive approach is to define the similarity as the quadratic error of the frequency response of our FIR filter to our given ideal frequency response. Mostly this means the magnitude of the frequency response. This has the advantage of being mathematically very simple. This means our goal is to minimize this quadratic error. So assume our desired frequency response is h d of omega and the real frequency response of our causal FIR filter is h of omega. Then the quadratic error is given by this integral here. So we would like to make this error as small as possible. Observe that we need an integral here because the frequency domain signal is continuous since the time domain signal is not periodic. Only then would the Fourier transform be discrete over the frequency. But here we have the sync function with infinite extent over time. Observe that because of this we also cannot apply the discrete Fourier transform because it's made for periodic signals with a finite period. period. The DFT is usually applied just to this finite period. But the discrete time Fourier transform is for discrete time signals with infinite period. We need to minimize the quadratic error E to find the best approximation with our FIR filter. We cannot solve this problem in the frequency domain, but we can solve the equivalent formulation in the time domain. To obtain this, we use the so-called Parseval theorem which states that the power of a signal, the sum of its magnitude squares, is the same in the time and in the frequency domain. This is true for the discrete time Fourier transform as well as for the DFT. So here we have the Parseval theorem. Uh, so the power of a signal is the same in the time and in the frequency domain. The beauty here is now is that we obtain a sum which we can now compute more easily. So we want to obtain h of n. For our ideal low pass filter, h of t was the sync function. To obtain a causal filter, we already allow the time shift n t for the ideal impulse response using our FIR filter h of n makes causality possible. Plugging this into this equation yields this other equation here. So how should we choose h of n and the delay n of d to obtain the minimum possible quadratic error e for a given length l of h of n? So how should we choose h of n and the delay n of d to obtain the minimum possible quadratic error e for a given length l of h of n? Given the length l, we need to determine the l coefficients h of n and the delay parameter n of d. To make this solution more easy to see, we can divide the sum into two parts, one over the extent of h of n and one for the rest. So here we are dividing into sum, so 1 for the uh, extent of um, h of n and 1 for the rest. So n is smaller than 0 and n is um, bigger than L minus 1. Both terms are positive, so to minimize E we have to minimize both terms. To minimize the right hand term we only have n of d. So we can choose n of d such only the smallest values appear there and the biggest values of h of d are not seen by the right hand sum and covered by h of n in the left hand sum. We can imagine the left hand sum being a so called rectangular window where we can shift the sync function over this window function to obtain h of n. The rectangular window is a function which has the value 1 inside the window length and the value 0 outside the window length. The finite sum can be imagined as resulting from first multiplying the 
infinite sync function with this rectangular window and then compute the sum which hence becomes finite. The goal here would be to shift the sync function using the delay n of e such that the window for h of n sees the biggest values of the sync function. Observe that this leads to a contiguous impulse response. Using the above formulas, it would also be possible to just pick the biggest magnitude values of the sync uh, function for h of n, the maxima and minima. For a non-contiguous impulse response, which would lead to a smaller quadratic error for L coefficients. So how would the resulting frequency response look like? Let's assume L equals to 2, then we have a filter with two coefficients. The biggest two values in the sync function are around the center, around zero. Hence, we would like to choose a delay of half a sample so that the new center is around n equals to 0 0.5 and the right hand side see some, sees only the smaller values. In general, we would like to choose this delay n of d equals to L, the future length, minus 1, divided by 2, meaning that we shift the maximum of the sync function exactly in the center of our window for h of n. What do we do with the left hand side inside of our window? We choose h of n identical to h of t of n and the left hand sum with the window becomes indeed zero. This way we get a simple recipe for designing an FIR filter with minimum squared error. Take the center of the sync function or the ideal impulse response h of t and window it with a so-called rectangular window because it has a rectangular form in time or space. Inside the sum for h of n, this imagined window has a value of 1 and outside it has a value of 0. So here is our sync function, here is our window, our rectangular window, and we are shifting the sync function so that the maximum value is in the center of the rectangular window. So we just apply a delay, and d equals to l minus 1 divided by 2. And this is this FIR filter h of n. This imagined window function will become more interesting if we modify the values from one to other values. So we can see FIR filter equals to the think sync function times the rectangular window in this case. Observe that if we only use a finite piece of the sync function as our filter, we implicitly already apply the rectangular window. Hence, there is no need to apply it explicitly anymore. This multiplication of the rectangular window with the ideal impulse response in the time domain becomes a convolution of the DTFT of the rectangular window with the ideal frequency response in the frequency domain. In this way, we can see the result in the frequency domain. In effect, the ideal frequency response of the sync function is blurred by convolving it with the DTFT of the window function. Ideally, this DTFT of the window should be an impulse at frequency zero, because then the convolution would not change the ideal frequency response. But this would mean an infinitely long window in the time domain. We have a finite rectangular window in the time domain, which becomes another sync function in the frequency domain. And that's quite different from pulse at frequency zero. Observe that the longer the window in the time domain, the more narrow its sync function in the frequency domain becomes and the more similar to an impulse. Hence, for better filters, we need a longer window. So now, let's have a Python example for the rectangular window. So here, I'm using matplotlib to plot and uh, numpy or mathematical computations and we're defining a rectangular window with uh, 11 samples from 0 to 10 and here there are 0 when um, n is smaller than 0 and 0 when n is bigger than 10 so this is just constructing our rectangular window now I'm going to use uh, Py, IPy widgets interact just to give some interaction of our uh, 
uh, plot and we can change the length of the uh, rectangular window. We are going to use some MyPy widgets, it's just a slider. We are also going to use SciPy signal to compute the frequency response of the rectangular window. And here, this is how we are defining this interact with a slider. And this is the function to plot the rectangular the frequency response of the rectangular window. So we are defining our um, rectangular window in the time domain. Then we are calculating with signal frec z. So the SciPy signal frec z, we are calculating the frequency response. And here we are um, having the magnitude of the frequency response in um, 20 log 10, so it's in dB. And we are finding uh, some maximum values, so we will have here like this uh, we have the omega at 3 dB and we have the omega at the uh, first side lobe, so we can have um, better see this attenuation from um, omega equals to minus 3 dB and um, omega at the uh, peak of the side lobe. Then this part here we are using to annotate, so we are creating these arrows and this text. And then we have two plots, one for the magnitude in dB and one for the phase in degree, in the degrees. And here we have a slider and just uh, unwrap so we can see uh, the linear phase easier uh, when using unwrap. So this is our uh, function, it's interact. It's a rectangular window, so it starts with a 16, uh, the length of this rectangular window, and we see that if we make the window longer, we see that it's trying to go and become similar to an impulse, but of course we cannot go infinitely long, so we will always have these characteristics. And we see that even this attenuation uh, for the, the peak of the side lobe uh, it decreases, but it's not so significant in this case. So we have we notice that the longer the window, the narrower become the main lobe. And if we go, for example, to a very short window, so let's say uh, 8, then we see that the main lobe and also the side lobes, they become wider. And we have this difference in attenuation here. So we have from uh, minus 3 dB to minus 12 dB. So maybe we have here something like 10 dB. And here, how the phase also, it's a linear phase, so this is just um, a plot so we can investigate a bit more the rectangular window. And we can see that this is far for, for bringing an impulse at frequency zero. In fact, it's somewhat broad and also the attenuation is not very high, so it's in the order of uh, minus 15 to minus 20 dB. We expect that our resulting low-pass filter will inherit these properties through the convolution in the frequency domain. So the pass band or the main lobe width of our function will determine the transition bandwidth. So the main lobe width of our function. So let's uh, have a the main lobe width will determine the transition band of our resulting filter. And the stop band attenuation of the window will determine the resulting stop band attenuation of our filter. So this shows that the window function shapes the key characteristics of our resulting FIR filter. Let's go back to our example of downsampling filter which should attenuate frequencies starting at 11 kHz at a sampling rate of 44.1 kHz. We would like to have minus 60 dB attenuation in the stop band. Hence, we obtain the normalized frequency for the start of our stop band as 
11 divided by 44.1 times 2 times pi, and we have 0 0.5 pi. This is the uh, start of our stop band. Hence, our desired frequency response is 1 between frequencies 0 and omega s, or better, between minus omega s to plus omega, uh, omega s to also include the negative frequency axis. Now, we take the inverse DTFT of the ideal desired frequency response, H desired, of omega, to obtain the ideal impulse response, H desired of n. Since at first we assume an, an ideal filter, we set the end of the pass band identical to the beginning of the stop band. So HC is equal to HS. And this is the end of the pass band identical to the beginning of stop band. So here we have our H of D, our desired. So this is the ideal. And we have this integral. This is the H of D. And when we solve, we have this, uh, we must remember this trigonometric property here, that the sine of omega, it's uh, equivalent of this sum um, of uh, exponentials, so it's a 1 divided by 2 times um, j, the imaginary number, times e to the power of j omega minus e to the power of minus j omega, and if we replace this here, we have these so the h desired of n equals to the sine omega c times n divided by pi times n. So let's uh, take a look at the approximation of an ideal low pass filter using a rectangular window and delay. We've seen that the impulse response of an ideal low pass filter is given by this equation here. So it's the sine of omega c times n divided by pi times omega n. Truncating the impulse response, so multiplying by a rectangular window, so it has a length L, and applying a delay of n d equals to L minus 1 divided by 2, so we're replacing here, so n, and we will apply a delay, and we will make this delay equals to L minus 1 divided by 2. We can also use SimPy to solve this. So here I'm importing SimPy and I'm importing sine, symbols, simplify, pi, lambda phi, and limit. Here I'm defining my symbol of omega c, and another, other symbols are the n and the l, so the length and the n. Here then I am defining the delay, so it's l minus 1 divided by 2. And here we have our sine of omega times n minus nd, so it's the delay, divided by pi times n minus nd, and nd is equal to L minus 1 divided by 2. So when we uh, set sin pi, it gives us this expression here, which is equivalent to this one here. We can also see that the limit yeah, when n is equal to L minus 1 divided by 2, we would have here a division by 0. And we, need to, we can take a limit to see that the value. So the value is omega c divided by pi, the limit when n is equal goes to L minus 1 divided by 2. So here we have um, the plots. So we will uh, assume that L is equal to 16, and I'm here using lambda phi, so I want that these symbolic expressions become available to use with NumPy, so I can use this lambda phi instead of redefining them uh, using NumPy. Then I'm defining some axes and figures for our plots. I'm using interact again, so we can use this slider to change the values of the length of our uh, filter and also the omega c for now I will leave like this so here we are using again frac z to um, calculate the frequency response here we have the impulse response 
so we're just doing something for even and for odd um, values of L so depending if L is even we will use the um, impulse response like this and if it's odd we will have this uh, impulse response given by this here so we have this value for um, when i is equal to the uh, delay so it, it, we can see here there is this big difference because for even there is here supposedly uh, at 7.5 when we're using a 16 but if we go for example to 15 and then we need this value here and when n is equal to um, the delay we would end up with that what we discussed before this would go to zero so we need to take the limit and we need to find out the value for n is equal to l minus 1 divided by 2 and this is what we are doing here then we are having the magnitude in db also some annotations to find out the uh, the omega at minus 3 db and the omega for the peak of the side lobe and also we are plotting phase and that's what we have here now if we use our example that l is equal to 16 so 16 minus 1 is 15 divided by 2 is 7.5 and we can have here calculate our delay and it's equal to 7.5 so this is what we're doing l is equal to 16 our delay to make the resulting filter cause is 7.5 then our filter becomes this um, expression here and this is our resulting causal FIR filter with a rectangular function so we can see that the pass band has some ripples so we can uh, zoom in a bit to see the ripples so we see the ripples in the pass band and they are more or less um, plus or minus 0 0.5 dB corresponding to a factor of 6% uh, of over or undershoot and that's usually okay but we can also see that this filter has maybe minus 10 dB attenuation and the first side lobe has only about minus 20 dB attenuation so if we go back to we have here the second side lobe here is more or less minus 20 dB attenuation and uh, is not satisfying our requirement for at least minus 60 dB uh, starting at normalized frequency 0 0.5 pi for the place plot we have a delay of 7.5 and this is a linear phase so we expect the phase to be minus 7.5 times omega we can verify this in our plots for example if you, you take a certain frequency and then you obtain 7.5 times if it's a 0 0.1 and then pi 180 divided by pi is more or less 135 and you can see uh, here we are not in um, degrees but you can also set and look for example here when uh, there is a value for omega and you see the angle and you just make these calculations and you see that this is how we verify the delay now um, we have a filter with the minimum squared error in compares with the ideal filter but this is um, not really what we like to have the problem is that we get the so-called Gibbs phenomenon it says that the error appears as ripples along the magnitude of the pass band and the stop band. The interesting part is that the ripples near the pass band and stop band, they don't become smaller 
SL becomes larger. So, but they only become more narrow. You know, this is uh, the result of convolving our ideal frequency response with the sync function from the rectangular window. The sync function only becomes narrower as we increase its length, but the height of the ripples they stay the same. And we can verify if we increase, we see it's becoming narrower. but we don't see significant change in the height of the this means that the maximum error that we retain does not become smaller as we, as we increase L so observe that the ripple size near the pass band and stop band only becomes more narrow, hence a reduced area and hence a reduced quadratic area, but their height does not become smaller with increasing L. Here they always stay at around 0 0.1 in the stop band, which corresponds to about minus 20 dB, which is not sufficient for uh, our aliasing future exam. To see how the Gibbs phenomenon results, we can take a look at our scheme in the frequency domain. So in principle, we multiplied our ideal impulse response with the rectangular window. In the frequency domain, this means a convolution of the ideal frequency response with a phase change through a delay MD with the frequency response of the rectangular window. The later is a narrow sync function which corresponds in ripples to the sides of its main lobe. And those ripples are what shows up as Gibson phenomenon. If we make our window uh, longer, the sync function becomes more narrow, but the height of the ripples does not decrease, but stays constant. Actually, in most applications, what we want is not minimizing the quadratic error, but minimizing the maximum error. So basically, we chose the wrong error measure. This suggests a modification to lower the height of the ripples. And instead of a rectangular window, we can take alternative windows which have lower ripples in the frequency domain. And very common used windows are the raised cosine or the sine window. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing this is a course offered by Professor Schula at the UMNL University of Technology. I am Renato, and on this notebook we'll talk about windows. So we are going to see how to design a window uh, using optimization, and also we'll take a look at the characteristics of different, different window types that uh, already exist. So let's get started. So how do we design window functions to obtain higher stop band attenuation? We need to think about two versions for windows, one with even and odd length. So we now analyze a few common types uh, of window. Now we will start with the rectangular window, which is um, equals to a 1 for n going from 0 to L minus 1, where L is the length of the window. So we can uh, design here our window, a rectangular window, with L equals to 16, and we use SciPy signal uh, frac C to compute its frequency response. And we have the frequency response here, and the normalized frequency from 0 to pi, our magnitude in dB. Here we can observe that its main lobe has a 3 dB width of about 0 0.05 uh, pi, it's approximately uh, 0 0.16 and the side low, uh, side low attenuation is about um, minus uh, 15 to minus 25 dB. So we can design different windows which de-emphasize a transition region from the pass band to the stop band and emphasize the stop band attenuation more than the pass band attenuation. So this can be seen as a minimizing uh, weighted squared error function where the parts that we want to emphasize get a higher weight. 
Well, we can formulate a narrow function with a weighted square error as follows. Here we have PB and TB, and the number of frequency samples in the pass band and the transition band respectively. So here we are defining our error function. In this case, we are using uh, 512 um, frequency samples. Here we have our desired pass band, so we are dividing this number by 4. Here we have our desired transition band, we are dividing this number by 8. Here we are computing these uh, frequency response using frac C. And here we are defining our desired um, frequency response. So we are concatenated uh, ones and then zeros and we are taking into account the desired pass band and the desired transition band. Here we are computing the weights. So we are giving um, more emphasis depending on the if we want to emphasize the pass band or the uh, stop band attenuation, we emphasize the transition re region. So in this case here, we are multiplying this part here by 1000 and our error will be we are summing here the absolute, absolute value of the H, so our frequency response minus the H desired that we define here and we are multiplying by the weights. We can then apply some optimization to obtain the window or filter samples which minimize this error for instance using SciPy optimize. In this example a window or filter H depending on how it's used of length 16 samples or taps is obtained by this way here. So here we are using um, from SciPy optimize opt we pass this error function we defined here. We give this um, initial values, so it's kind of uh, the guess, the starting point, um, and then this function will minimize this error function. And we will have here the um, uh, our window or our filter H. So we get the samples or impulse response, and we plot. We see here. Observe that the negative sign doesn't matter because we only optimize for the magnitude and the magnitude of the frequency response is given here. And we are using frac C once again to plot the uh, magnitude in dB. We have our normalized frequency and here is our magnitude of the frequency response. Observe the decently high stop band attenuation of about uh, minus 80 dB. So usually this optimization gives the best answer for most applications, but there are also more prefabricated windows for future design with different trade-offs of transition bandwidth and stop band attenuation for convenience. Just as curiosity, here is how it looks like the um, H desire that we defined here. So we have it here. So it's 1 until this point and then 0 and here the weights we're giving so we're giving 0 here and here we're giving a weight of 1000 that's what we are doing here and then we are minimizing and we get this impulse uh, response the first window we're going to look at is the raid, raised cosine window also known as the hand or handing window and it's given by this formula here with this cosine we have this 2 pi divided by L and this factor of 0 0.5 here so uh, we can see for L equals to 16 we have this is an example of uh, the raised cosine window and we have here the equation exactly like defined here so we observe that the center is in between two samples. We can obtain uh, its frequent response with frac C. Uh, this time we are going to define a function just to plot automatically uh, the um, frequency response because we are going to analyze the frequency response of uh, many different windows so we don't need to write this all the time. 
So it's the same, we use signal, SciPy signal frac Z, we have our normalized frequency, we calculate our magnitude in dB with 20 times log 10. In this case here, we're just adding this um, small number to avoid uh, the log of zero. Then we are having these two plots, one for the magnitude in dB and one for the phase in degrees. So here is the frequency response for the raised cosine window with even length. So this time L is equal to 16. Here we can see that it will obtain a much higher attenuation in comparison to the rectangular uh, function. Uh, for the first side lobe um, at um, more or less minus 35 uh, dB measured from the maximum of the main lobe, so it's the pass band, and far off in the stop end we get about uh, minus 60 dB, so it's far off um, the stop end. But at the cost of a wider main lobe, so it's 3 dB is at about 0 0.1 pi, and that's twice as wide as for the rectangular window, which leads to a wider uh, transition band. So we have a wider main lobe, a wider transition band. So this shows that there's a general trade-off. We can trade transition width for stop end attenuation. For odd win uh, window lengths, we have here this formula here and we know there is a difference here it's 2 pi divided by l and here we have 2 pi divided by l minus 1 so for 17 uh, samples so the number of samples of the input response equal to the coefficient so this represents an fir filter so we have now here our uh, equation just uh, as given here and here we have our input response of our filter and here the center is right on the sample so when we compare to the uh, even the center is in between two samples and here the center is just right on one sample so another uh, window it's not a raised cosine window but we also have the sine window it's uh, widely used and the equation for the sine window is given by these uh, functions here. We have this for um, even lengths or for odd lengths. We have here this difference here. An example for uh, even length where L is equal to 16 using the sine window is given by this plot here. And we know this is quite different from the raised cosine we have uh, here this shape and with the sign we have this shape here and the frequency response is given by this plot here and here we can see that the main lobe is somewhat narrower for, than when compared to the raised cosine with a 3 dB width of about 0 0.04 pi but the first side lobe has only minus 20 dB attenuation but the further side lobes increase in attenuation. So this attenuation is more than, uh, for, than when compared to the rectangular window, but less than for the raised cosine. On the other hand, its transition bandwidth is less than for the raised cosine window. So we always have this trade-off of the transition bandwidth and stop band attenuation. Observe that this always results in positive values for the window functions and that they are perfectly symmetric. For odd lengths, there is a sample right at the center, and for even lengths, the center is right between two uh, center samples. Another well-known window is the so-called Kaiser window, it's given by these more complex uh, equations here, where uh, the Bessel function is used, and we have here this IO, this is the Bessel function, given by this uh, function here where in practical designs often the first 20 turns are used and you can refer for um, this wavelets and filter banks by uh, Strang and, uh, and Guyen and the parameter beta here 
is used to trade off the transition bandwidth of the filter and the stop band attenuation. So an example for L equals to 16 and beta equals to 2. So we have here, there is a NumPy already um, embedded Kaiser function, so we don't need to write all these equations. So it's very convenient. We can use a NumPy Kaiser. Here we pass uh, the length and the beta. And here we have our plot of the Kaiser window. And with frac C, we obtain the frequency response. And here we can see that the main lobe, so the pass band and the transition band for beta equals to 2, is even narrower than for the sine window. The first lobe uh, also has about minus 20 dB attenuation, but the further side lobes don't have much increasing attenuation. If we increase beta from 2 to 8, so we just change this value here, and we have this shape for the Kaiser. And now we have a very different um, frequency response when compared to this one. So here we can see the other extreme with a very wide main lobe. So the pass and the transition band. But the first side lobe, we already have about minus 60 dB attenuation, which would fulfill our requirements, for example, for an anti-aliasing uh, filter. Another example is a window used by the 4Bs. So you can take a look at this um, PDF, which is the 4Bs specification. So the 4Bs is a um, perceptual um, audio a codec, as intended to allow maximum encoder flexibility, allowing to scale competitively over a um, wide range of bit rates. And they use uh, windows there as well. And it's given by this equation here. So we have this squared sign, and for L equals to 16, so uh, an example with uh, even uh, length for the window. So we're defining here this equation, and we have this kind of shape, and the frequency response is given here. So here we can see that the main lobe is wider than when compared to the sine window. The first side lobe also has about minus 20 dB uh, stop band attenuation, but the further side lobes, so here we are at more or less minus 20 dB, and the further side lobes increase, and here we are almost on minus 40 dB. So it results in a good stop band attenuation, but it's lacking the additional parameter like we saw uh, with the Kaiser window. So the um, MPEG AAC audio coder also uses an optimized window function, it's the so-called Kaiser Bessel derived window, and it results from numerical optimization. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schula at the Humanau University of Technology. I am Renato, and on this notebook we'll talk about filter design using the window method. Let's get started. We start with the ideal filter, the sync function, which is infinitely long. To make it causal and to obtain a desired trade-off between the transition band width and the stop band attenuation, we multiply it with a finite length window. This window is either obtained by op optimization or is chosen from one of the well-known and studied windows like we've seen in the previous tutorial. Longer filters also lead to narrower transition bands. The resulting frequency response after multiplying the ideal impulse response, the sync function, with the window function is then the convolution of the ideal frequency response and the window frequency response. The, re the resulting pass band width is the ideal pass band width plus the pass band width of the window. And the resulting stop band starts at the stop band frequency of the ideal frequency response, the cutoff frequency, plus the frequency of the start of the stop band of the window function, adding the transition band. To obtain a given pass band or stop band, this has to be taken into account and the cutoff frequency has to be modified accordingly. 
Let's take a look at this example. We saw that the Kaiser window at least fulfills the requirement for the attenuation of our downsampling application example. How do we get the correct start of the stop end for attenuating the aliasing for downsampling sufficiently using our filter design method? Our stop band should start at 0.5 for a downsampling factor of n equals to 2. Looking at the Kaiser window with beta equals to 8, we see that we get minus 60 dB at a normalized frequency of about 0.36. Hence, our ideal filter needs to have the end of its pass band at 0.5, it's our desired, minus 0.36, and it's equal to 0.14. Remember here that 1 is the Nyquist frequency. Hence, our omega for the stop end should be 0.14 pi. Observe here, we need the multiplication with pi, since for our formula, pi is the Nyquist frequency. Now, we just need to plug this into our formula for the ideal future, the sync function, with L equals to 16. So here we have our uh, formula, and we will plug in the 0 0.14 pi here, and we are using L equals to 16, so we have this 7.5 here and here, or we can have a different formulation uh, with normalization to let the pass band start at 0 dB, so we have this formula here, and then omega c should be equal to 0 0.14 pi, and then we multiply it with our Kaiser window. We can use Python to visualize this example from here. We are using NumPy and um, Matplotlib to plot. We are defining our Kaiser window here with um, 16, the length is equal to 16. Here we are defining our ideal sync function with the omega c equals to 0 0.14 pi. Here we are multiplying the Kaiser window with the ideal impulse response, and here is the plot of the impulse response. Now, when we take a look at the, its frequency response, again, we are going to use the same function frec z uh, from signal, side by signal, and here we have the frequency response of this filter here, and we see that at normalized frequency 0 0.5, it has indeed enough attenuation at about minus 80 dB, but the pass band up to about minus 6 dB is only up to about the normalized frequency uh, 0 0.15, which is usually not enough. We didn't really specify it, but for practical reasons, this would usually not work. So how can we improve the pass band now? Since we already tried different compromises for the width of the transition band and the stop band attenuation, we can try to increase the filter length. So if we try the length equals to 32 instead of 16, and we will use the Kaiser window with beta equals to 8. So here now we are defining um, the Kaiser window with beta equals to 8 and the length is equals to 32. So we have, this is the Kaiser uh, impulse uh, window. The frequency response is given here for the Kaiser window with um, beta equals to 8 and the length equals to 32. And the Kaiser window would already be our final filter uh, if our ideal impulse response would consist of an infinite sequence of ones. So this is the case if our ideal filter is only a delta pulse at frequency zero, hence an infinitely small low pass filter. Observe that the main lobe of this um, line 32 window is up to about 0 0.17, is half as wide as the main lobe uh, at length 16. In this way, we have the transition wind width of our resulting filter. Here we can say that our pass band ends at normalized frequency 0 
Hence, we need to have our ideal filter with a stop end starting at 0 0.5. This is our desired um, cutoff frequency. Then minus 0 0.17, which is the end of the pass band from the Kaiser window. So it's equal to 0 0.33, resulting in the formula for the ideal impulse response as above for the length of, uh, of 16. So now we are using the length of uh, 32. Then we have here is 15.5, and we need to have the omega c 0 0.33 uh, times pi, and then we multiply it with the Kaiser window. So here in Python we have our ideal impulse response, and we have the 0 0.33 times pi that we calculated before from here. Here we have our Kaiser window, length equals 32 and beta equals to 8. We are multiplying the ideal filter and the Kaiser window and here is the impulse response of our filter. So the um, frequency response of this filter is given here and we see that uh, our stop end which starts at 0 0.5 has indeed still enough um, attenuation at about minus 8 dB and if we take um, the 3 dB as the limit for our um, pass band it goes up to the normalized frequency of 0 0.3 going back to our downsampling example where we downsample from 44.1 kilohertz to 22.05 kilohertz sampling rate the normalized frequency 0 0.5 corresponds to 11 kilohertz and the upper limit of our pass band is 0 0.3 or 6.6 .6 kilohertz this now looks like a usable filter for our application this also show why the usable frequencies in a time discrete representation is always clearly lower than the Nyquist frequency so we need filters which have transition bands So far we only designed low pass filters, so how do we obtain a high pass or a band pass um, filters? So the first approach is to uh, design an ideal filter. So again we design an ideal filter and then window it. For instance, if we want to obtain a high pass, we can start to design an ideal high pass filter using our inverse DTFT, which gives, gives us a doubly um, infinite impulse response from minus infinity to plus infinity and then we window this ideal impulse response to obtain an FIR filter. For the ideal high pass we can define the desired frequency uh, response as 1 at the high frequencies above the cutoff frequency and 0 at the low frequencies given by this uh, system of equations here. If we want to have a real value impulse response, we need to make the frequency response such that its values at negative frequencies are conjugate complex of the values at positive frequencies. The easy way to do uh, it here is to have the negative frequencies identical to the uh, positive frequencies. So we have this um, system of equations here. Now we can apply the inverse DTFT find an analytical solution just like with the low pass filter to obtain the ideal impulse response and then multiply it with a window uh, to obtain an FIR filter. So in case we would like to do a pass, a band pass, uh, the approach is the same. We design an ideal band pass a filter, then we take the inverse DTFT, find an analytical solution and then we multiply it with a window to obtain an FIR filter. Another approach is to use modulation, so shifting our ideal pass band to the desired position in frequency. In this way, we can turn a low pass into a band pass or a high pass depending on where we shift our pass band. In this way, we can turn a new problem into our known prob problem, the designing of a low pass filter. So the idea is that we design just the low pass filter and then we use modulation, so we shift um, to the desired position. And how do we shift our pass band in the frequency domain? We convolve it in the frequency domain with a Dirac impulse at the desired center frequency omega zero. So here we have frequency response of our 
um, a filter and then we multiply with the DRAC um, at the desired center frequency omega and then we will have our frequency response at the desired frequency. If we want to have real value in impulse response, we need to preserve the symmetry between positive and negative frequency by also shifting the frequency response by the same amount to the negative frequencies. So we have here, this is uh, the equations, we have this, we are shifting the positive frequencies and we are shifting the negative frequencies and we end up with our um, filter. And how does this change our ideal impulse response? To answer, we take the inverse DTFT. So the convolution in the frequency domain becomes a multiplication in the time domain. And now we just need the inverse DTFT of this part here. And to obtain it, we can simply use our formula for the inverse DTFT. And remember that the in integration of a function multiplied with a Dirac impulse is the function value at the position of the Dirac, and here is omega uh, nu. So we have that this is the uh, resulting frequency uh, response. Now we can get the inverse DTFT, which is now this, and we have this result here. So this is the function which we need to multiply with our ideal low pass filter to obtain an ideal filter where the pass band is centered at around omega nu. We call this cosine function a modulation function and the multiplication with this function is a modulation. Observe that we can also introduce a phase shift p into this modulation function, for instance, turning the cosine function into a sine function. This would still work because the frequency domain, uh, in the frequency domain, this is a multiplication with another complex exponential from the phase term in the time domain, just like uh, from my time lag. It would just introduce a phase change in the final filter. We also have a Python example for this modulation principles. So in the following example, we take the signal from a microphone and we'll modulate it with a, a 500 Hertz sine function. So we're multiplying it with a 500 Hertz function. Here we are going to use Pi Audio and iPy widgets to uh, control. So we define our parameters. So we are using 32 kilohertz as sampling rate. Uh, here is the function that's going to be run on the separate thread. Uh, then we are reading from the audio input stream into the data with the block length defined by chunk. We are converting this stream of bytes to a list of short integers. Here we are computing this um, block array of uh, the sign samples with 500 hertz and then we're multiplying our samples so this is where the modulation takes part then we are convert from integers back to the stream of data and we write the stream here is just the GUI so we have a start and a stop button so let's um, let's run and see what happens hello, hello. So we see that the sound um, and the voice sound higher in pitch, something like a Mike and Moe's voice, uh, voice, and this is the result of the frequency shift. So the conclusion is that we can shift our ideal filter in the frequency domain by, by multiplying the ideal or already windowed impulse response with a modulation function defined like this, for example, where P can be some phase delay. And this is illustrated in the following picture. So we have our low pass original spectrum. And then after modulation with the frequency omega null, and we have copies of the original spectrum where the center frequency now is our modulation um, omega null. Now we have another example. So to obtain a high pass, 
we need to shift the passband from 0 to pi, hence we get the omega nu is equal to pi, we will choose p equals to 0, and the modulation function is going to be 1 divided by pi times cosine of pi times n, which is simply a sequence of plus or minus 1. So here we are defining our low pass, so this is the ideal low pass we are defining. Then we are multiplying the ideal filter with a Kaiser window, the same principle like we did before. So we are using the window method to design a low pass. And then we are going to use the modulation to transform this low pass into a high pass. So how can we make a high pass out of this low pass using modulation? we are going to multiply our filter by the cosine of pi times n, like we are doing here. And here is the input response of the modulated. So this is, we will see that uh, we can see the effect of modulation with the plus or minus one sequence and the resulting frequency response, when you'll see the frac z, we have now a high pass filter. So we design the low pass using the window method, then we just use modulation to transform the low pass to a high pass. And we see that we indeed obtain a high pass. So it basically looks like a mirrored around the center. In reality, it's shifted, but what we see as the high pass part was the negative frequency part of our low pass. We can also obtain a band pass if now the center frequency will be pi divided by 2. So we are multiplying our low pass filter with this modulation function. If the center frequency is pi divided by 2, and we see we have a band pass. But observe that we obtain a bad pass, that in the, this band pass case in which is twice as wide as the case of low pass or high pass, because here the negative frequencies of the low or high pass can appear as the other half of the pass band. So when you are going to use modulation, you need to design the low pass and then you must adjust the bandwidth, so the pass band of the low pass and the center frequency of the modulation function, so you can achieve the desired characteristics of the band pass, yeah, you, we see that in this case, the band, the band pass here is twice as wide. Maybe we don't want this. So what we can do is that we can make the low pass, we designed low pass and the, the cutoff frequency would be half perhaps of the, um, what we would design for a normal low pass. And then when we modulate, we'll have the desired band pass future. So that's it for this notebook and I see you next time. Hello there and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the UMNL University of Technology. I am Renato and this notebook is about sampling. So basically this is a repetition of um, a lecture from another series we have in Advanced Digital Signal Processing and there I recommend you to check uh, the lecture number six that we also talk about sampling but we go more in depth into certain topics and here we give a general overview and we also include an example in the end and we will use concepts from the previous tutorial uh, and we use filters and Kaiser windows and things like this. So let's get started. In this is example we will just create an audio signal in Python and then we will filter it with our previous low pass filter that we use the Kaiser window with beta equals to 8. So here I'm just importing uh, some libraries. I'm going to use uh, matplotlib and numpy and scipy signal. I decided not to use Librosa this time because um, instead of using uh, music, I am creating some a signal with some tones. So we have this fundamental uh, frequency of 220 hertz. And then I'm doing just some um, fade in, fade out. So our signal is a bit smoother. And then 
I'm just adding some harmonics in high frequencies and this is how our signal sounds. Well, when we look at its frequency um, spectrum, we see that, that we have our frequency of 220 Hz here and then we have all these frequencies here above uh, 8 kilohertz so we are using a 32 kilohertz of sampling frequency so our our nyquist frequency is 16 kilohertz and uh, that would be equals to pi and uh, half pi would be approximately 8 kilohertz so we have all these frequencies over uh, 8 kilohertz so we will low pass it and we will take our Kaiser window, the low pass design, a length uh, equals to 32, and it's the same what we did in the previous uh, tutorial. And here now we have our filtered signal. So, for example, if we're doing down sampling when n is equal to 2, uh, so we would have up to 8 kilohertz. And we would like to filter out everything uh, above 8 kHz. So maybe we could use this filter and we see that we have indeed above the um, half pi, everything is um, attenuated. So we observe that the beginning frequency uh, 1.5 will have indeed much attenuation. And we can listen. So this is the original with the high frequency components and here is the low pass version and now we can downsample it by a factor of n equals to 2 including the removal of zeros so this is what we are doing here we are downsampling by a factor of 2 and this is the frequency response so observe that now we obtain a stretched spectrum so this part here is very similar to this part here and we can listen to uh, this uh, down sample so we see uh, it's muffled it's the same but now at half the sampling rate if we want to uh, upsample it again we can use this uh, indexing trick and now just on the receiving side we are effectively inserting a zero after each sample so observe that in this way we can avoid the function down sampling or up sample which makes it clear to see and check what happens so here now we have the up sampled version of our signal and now we have the shrieking and periodic continuation of the spectrum so we have this aliasing components at high frequencies so this was the low pass version down sampled now we up sample by inserting zeros and then we have this here so we have all these aliasing components so this part is effectively this part here so we have the shrinking and we can listen it's difficult to hear alias in here because um, with my headphones or with my computer speaking, this is very hard to reproduce to reproduce uh, these high frequencies. But the aliasing components are here, and we must get rid of them. So we will low pass these results. So now we will low pass again using the same filter, and this is the frequency response. We're using a signal SciPy signal frac Z. We're convolving with the filter, doing the same what we did. And observe that now we remove the aliasing component at high frequencies and when we listen sound the same as the lower sampling rate but now at the higher sampling rate of 32 kilohertz sometimes if you use different audio uh, signal to test you'll find that there uh, could be differences due to not sufficiently attenuated aliasing Hello there, 
and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanal University of Technology to different uh, master's degree programs. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this tutorial we will talk about the effects in the Z domain of sampling a digital signal. Let's get started. The Z-transform is a more general transform than the Fourier transform and we will use it to obtain perfect reconstruction in filter banks and wavelets. Hence, we will now look at the effects of sampling and some more tools in the Z-domain. Since we usually deal with causal systems in practice, we use the one-sided Z-transform defined as this sum here. It goes from n from 0 to infinity. This is our signal and here is z to the power of minus n. First, observe that we get our usual frequency response, the discrete time Fourier transform, the DTFT, if we evaluate the z-transform along the unit circle in the z-domain when z is equal to e to the power of j omega. What is now the effect of multiplying our signal with the unit pulse train in the z-domain? To see this, we simply apply the Z-transform and use our sum formulation for the delta impulse train. It is given here. Using delta capital N of N is equal to 1 divided by M and, and this summation here. And you can see more details about this at our lecture on advanced digital signal process in you know, lesson 6. It's also available uh, as uh, notebooks and tutorials with embedded videos, so you can check uh, at Guitars AI uh, GitHub or at the uh, Humanal University of Technology uh, homepage at the Applied Media Systems Group. There is also a link to uh, the GitHub repository with the Jupyter Notebooks and there are YouTube videos like this one embedded on them. So this becomes this double sum here and the result is this sum here, 1 divided by n, the sum from k going from 0 to n minus 1, capital X of e to the power of minus j 2 pi divided by n k times z. Using the z-transform definition and replacing z by e to the power of minus j times 2 pi divided by n times k times z, we get this relation here. Or in short, we have that g, uh, x in the z domain is equal to 1 divided by n, the sum from k going from 0 to n minus 1, and this x is the same right here, x e to the power minus j omega 2 pi divided by n times k times c. There is a mistake here, let's just correct z transform definition, and we have here this relation here. This is very similar to the discrete time Fourier transform formulation. We get a sum with aliasing components, just that we don't have frequency shifts for the aliasing terms, but a multiplication of their exponential functions to z. Here we effectively shift the phase, or use rotation, of the complex number z using the complex exponential. This also makes sense since the frequency information is contained in the phase of C, which we see if we replace Z equals to E to the power of J capital omega. The next effect is the removal or reinsertion of the zeros from or into the signal. Let's again use our definition, Y of M is equal to X is M times capital N, meaning the Y of M is the signal without the zeros, then the z-transform becomes this relation here. Replacing the sum index m, the lower sampling rate, by the higher sampling rate, n equals to m times capital N, and observing that the sequence x su superscript d of n contains the zeros, with x superscript d of n is equal to 0 for n different than m times capital N, this results in, using this index substitution, uh, n equals to m times capital N, uh, some uh, many 
typos here so let's just fix them this is fixed here this is also fixed here so we have this sum here observe the one divided by capital n in the exponent of z here and in short we get that y of z is equal to capital x superscript t z to one divided by capital n this exponent one divided of capital n of z now corresponds to the stretching of our frequency scale in the Fourier spectrum. Another very useful tool, which we already saw, is the modulation. This is the multiplication of our signal with, the, with a periodic function, for instance, an exponential function. It can be written as the multiplication of our uh, signal with an exponential function, where a capital N denotes uh, modulation. Observe that the modulation function here has a periodicity of 2 pi divided by capital omega n. Its z transform hence becomes this summation here and going from 0 to infinity. We have our signal, we have the periodic function, this exponential, and then we have z to the power of minus n. Other important tool is the reverse of the ordering of a finite length signal sequence with length L, meaning x uh, of n is non-zero only for n going from 0 to L minus 1, that's defined here. So its Z transform is this sum here. We can now reverse the order of the summation, of course without affecting the result by starting at the highest index, index going to the lowest, replacing the index n by the expression L minus 1 minus L prime, index substitution. So here we have the index substitution and we have the reverse order of the summation. Yeah. In short, it goes like this. So remember the Z transform was given by this and now we have the reverse which is given by this. So what we obtain is the inverse of the Z in the Z transform, which signifies the time reversal. And a factor of Z to the power of minus L minus 1, which is simply a delay of L minus 1 samples. Important here is the inverse of Z. What difference does this make in our Fourier spectrum? replacing z by e to the power of j to the capital omega. We obtain x of minus capital omega instead of x of, cap of capital omega. For real valued signal, this only makes a difference for the phases of our frequency response. They are sine flipped because of the spectral symmetries for real valued signals. The magnitudes remain the same. This can still be of importance for instance, in filter banks with aliasing cancellation. Here, the different signs also change the sign of the aliasing components, and that can make the difference between aliasing components canceling between different bands or adding up. For complex value signals, the negative and positive frequencies can be completely different, and hence, time reversal would make a bigger difference. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-ray signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanau University of Technology to different master's degree programs. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this tutorial we will talk about non-ideal filters and filter banks. Let's get started! We saw that we get perfect reconstruction in a filter bank using ideal filters. Ideally, we remove all aliasing components. But in practice, we don't have ideal filters. They are not realizable, because their impulse response stretches from minus infinity to infinity. How can we obtain perfect reconstruction using realizable non-ideal filters? And still, critical sampling, 
meaning the downsampling rate capital N is equal to the number of subbands, as in the case of ideal filters. Let's first take a look at the resulting spectrum when we use non-ideal filters. We start with the spectrum at the output of non-ideal high pass. We have here a non-ideal part. Observe that the slope at pi divided by 2 and minus pi divided by 2 is not infinite, but we get a more or less slow transition into the higher attenuation towards lower frequencies. Hence, we also get frequencies below pi divided by 2 or above minus pi divided by 2 in our signal. This will become a problem after downsampling by a factor of 2. For now, just the multiplication with the delta impulse train. As can be seen in the next pictures. Remember that for the multiplication with the delta train, we get aliasing components at frequency shifts of 2 pi divided by capital N, hence, in this case, pi. So here we have the overlapping of aliasing components. Observe, even if we now used ideal filters for the synthesis for the high pass part, we would still have the overlapped aliasing component, and hence, no perfect reconstruction. Filter banks consist of a bank of subband filters which cover the entire frequency band of our signal, followed by downsampling in the analysis filter bank and preceded by upsampling in the synthesis filter bank. This can be seen in the following pictures. So here we have the analysis part, here we have the downsampling, and here we have the synthesis part, and here we have the upsampling. In the picture, x of n is the input signal, for instance, our audio signal. y subscript k of n are the downsampled subband signals, with k the subband index and m the index at the lower sampling rate, and x hat of n is the reconstructed signal. So we have here the reconstructed signal. As described in lecture 2, uh, the down arrow, capital N, symbolizes downsampling by a factor of n, including removal of zeros. If x of n is the signal we downsample, then we also write the downsample signal this way. So we see we have m times capital N plus n0, where n0 is the index of the first sample we keep in the downsampling, or the phase, with n0 greater or equal to 0, n smaller and equal to n minus 1. The up arrow n symbolizes upsampling by a factor of n, including insertion of zeros. If y of m is the signal we upsample, then we also write the upsample signal as, so we have here y of superscript n0, Super, subscript n0, superscript up arrow capital N of n. It's equal to y of m when n is equal to m plus capital N plus n0 or 0 elsewhere, where n0 is the index of the first non-zero sample in the upsampled signal or the phase. So the only hope we have to obtain perfect reconstruction with non-ideal filters and still critical sampling in filter banks is that somehow the aliasing from different subbands cancels out during the synthesis process when we add up all the subbands. If we add, for example, the low pass signal and the high pass signal for the reconstruction. Or in other words, we would like to we would like the sum of all aliasing components at the output of the synthesis filters to become zero. The question now is, how do we obtain this goal? We could now analyze all the aliasing components to find out when they cancel each other. This is how researchers actually approach this problem first 
for instance, in the first derivation of the so-called time domain aliasing constellation, TDAC, Future Banks, by Princeton and Bradley. Or using the aliasing component matrices by Vetterli et al. But it turned out that a simpler mathematical approach is possible by just using the goal of overall perfect reconstruction of our future bank, regardless of all aliasing components. This is now the goal of the following derivation. Here, we need to analyze in more detail what happens in the filtering and downsampling process in our future bank. To come to a solution, we need to apply the Z-transform to our future bank with non-ideal filters. Here is the analysis future bank. Just the filtering can be written with the convolution equation given here. The filtering and subsequent downsampling by capital N of the kth analysis future H subscript of N of impulse response length L can be written as a downsampled convolution sum with phase offset N subscript zero, simply with the substitution n times capital N plus n zero by n prime, and have the new argument m of y. So we end up with this here. So you need to go back to lecture one to review this. Now m is again the Dow sample index at the lower sampling rate. n zero is our phase index for the downsampling. Often we assume n0 equals to 0, which means that we start downsampling at the first sample, keeping the first sample. In this way, the sum only computes values which the downsampler keeps. The downsampling in this equation is now the hurdle to simply applying the Z-transform to turn the convolution into a multiplication for easy invertibility. To look for a solution for invertibility, perfect reconstruction and alias constellation, we now take a detour to fast implementation using transforms like the DFT and its fast implementation, the FFT. This is also the approach used by the short time Fourier transform, STFT. If we divide our signal into blocks of length capital M, so here we are dividing our signal into blocks of um, length capital M, where M is the block index or index at the lower sampling rate. You can imagine the signal as a long horizontal sequence of samples, which we subdivide into small blocks of length capital M. We then stack those blocks on top of each other. Then going vertically down, we obtain downsampled versions of our signal at different phase legs. Yeah, we see here. The DFT computes a block with capital N frequency or subband values for each signal block X of M. If capital T is the DFT transform matrix, then the DFT of each signal block is given here, where Y of M contains the DFT coefficients, as we show here. Here, YK of M is the Kth DFT coefficient for block M. Hence, index K denotes the subband or frequency. And the index M is the block index, or time, at the lower sampling rate. Hence, if we keep K fixed, we obtain a time signal for the K's subband. If we keep M fixed, we obtain a spectrum for block M. This is very important. So once again, if we keep the K fixed, we obtain a time signal. If we keep M fixed, we obtain a spectrum. 
That is why this is called a time frequency re representation, since we have both time m and frequency k indices in it. This shows that the DFT is simply a special case of an analysis filter bank with critical sample and perfect reconstruction through the inverse DFT. Now we have a Python example of a time frequency representation. So it's a spectrogram. So here we have our imports. We are using PyAudio. We're using NumPy, SciPy signal, Matplotlib. We've seen this before. We're using different threads. So we keep um, the audio part separate from the uh, GUI. Here we have the parameters of our signal processing. For the Pi audio, so we have the chunk size, number of channels, sampling rate, down sampling rate, so the format for the Pi audio stream, the number of um, FFT, uh, and the overlap. Here we are designing a uh, low pass filter. Actually, this is not uh, important, but uh, this is the same example as we've seen before for down sampling and. Um, sampling but I'm just uh, repeating here so we have just uh, for down sampling and up sampling uh, there's a low pass filter here is the function to plot the spectrogram so we have here we read from the audio input into data blocks with length chuck then we have here we can turn on the low pass filter on and off we compute the array of a unit post strain corresponding of downsampling rate of capital N, we do this here, we do the low pass filter after upsampling here, and here we play out the samples, here is something to update the plot. Now we are defining our GUI, it's just a start button and a stop button, and then we can turn on and off the filters, so this is, we have already seen this example, and you can go back to uh, the lectures to see uh, this is spectrogram uh, in action. So here we have our spectrogram. I will start our example and see what happens. Hello. A. One, two. We can see here there is the time frequency representation. We can turn on. Without the low pass filter, and we see all the energy components. So we've seen that with downsampling, without the low pass filter, we have all this aliasing. Now we will turn on the low pass filter. Hey, you can already see that my voice is downsampled. Uh, it, it's a uh, filter, and now I will turn on downsampling and upsampling. Hello, a a. We don't see the aliasing components but we see much less bandwidth. Hey, hello, hello. Hello, hey, hey, one, two, test. But the goal here was just to show the um, time frequency. So we have time and we have the frequency displayed in this graph. As the name says, the FFT has a fast implementation. When we compare it to our filter banks, so per subband, we need to calculate the convolution sum. If we have filters of length L, that means that we have L multiplications per output sample. We neglect the sum operations for each subband. Without downsamplers, we get L times N multiplications for each block of N input samples for each subband leading to L times N squared multiplications for all subbands for the block of N input samples. Now, we can reduce this amount by only computing the output samples which the downsampler keeps. This reduces the computational complexity by a factor of N, resulting in L times N multiplications for each input block of length N to obtain N output values one value in each subband. In other words, 
Each sample in a subband is computed, is computed by a filter of length L, which needs L multiplications in the convolution sum. We need L multiplications per sample. If we compare it to um, an FFT, it only needs on the order of n times log 2 of n multiplications. Order meaning up to a fixed factor for each block. Hence, for each subband sample, we need log n multiplications. When we compare this with the L multiplications per sample for the critically sampled filter bank. Since usually we have that L is, is greater than log 2 of n, this is more efficient. Example, if n equals to 1024 subbands, then we need filters which are longer than L equals to 1024, and L is much bigger than log 2 of 1024, which is equals to 10. Hence, in this case, we save more than an order of a factor of 100 in complexity if we use the FFT. Another interesting effect is that we obtain perfect reconstruction using the inverse FFT for the synthesis process, even though the equivalent FFT filter bank has no perfect filters. So this might give us a hint on how to obtain perfect reconstruction without ideal filters. And the question is, what is the equivalent FFT filter bank? So we will look into this into, uh, in our next tutorial. Check you later. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schula at the UMNL University of Technology to different master's degree programs. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this notebook we'll talk about transforms as filter banks, specifically the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, as a filter bank. Let's get started. From the definitions of previous lectures, we know that the DFT of a block signal X is defined as this sum here. Therefore, we can rewrite the DFT as a matrix multiplication with the matrix T with the elements given by E to the power of minus J, 2 times pi divided by capital N times K times N, where N is the time and rho index and K is the frequency and column index. Using the signal block factor, given here, we can rewrite the DFT of block M as a matrix mul multiplication, Y of M is equal to X of M times T, where T is a matrix with these elements here. This is the matrix formulation of the DFT, where the matrix multiplication, given here, is YK of M, is this sum here, like we've seen, similar to this here. Here now we can extract the equivalent impulse responses. Now we can compare the above transform on 3 with the convolution and the downsampling equation given here. So we have this symbol here to indicate that there is this downsampling. And we see that here the index n for our signal x has the reverse order or reverse sign as in equation 3. But since we are interested in the equivalent impulse response, we simply reverse the index order in the transform equation 3. And we can use index substitution when n is substituted by n minus 1 minus n prime. So this is what we will do. We will substitute n by this here. And we will still obtain the sum because the sum ordering doesn't change the result. So now we have here this um, equation with the sum and we uh, replaced n by n minus 1 n prime and we get this equation here. When we compare this with our convolution sum in equation 4 in here, it looks like the convolution sum with the phase index of 
n0 equals to n minus 1, and with future length equal to the block length L. So L equals to n when we compare these two equations here. This indicates that yk of m contains phase n minus 1 of the downsample subband signal. Through this comparison, we obtain the equivalent impulse response of our DFT given by here. So this is the equivalent impulse response. This is now the equivalent analysis impulse response of our DFT interpreted as an analysis future bank. Observe that it can also be interpreted as a rectangular window of length n with modulation of this exponential term. In conclusion, the DFT can also be seen as a special kind of a future bank. Each DFT coefficient can be seen as a sample of one of the downsampled subbands. Each column of our transform matrix T represents the impulse response of one subband filter, but in reverse order. We can read the impulse response out of the transform matrix starting from the bottom and going up. We still need to find the equivalent synthesis filters if we apply the um, inverse transform for the perfect reconstruction of our signal. We get perfect reconstruction, the original signal, if the transform T is invertible. For mathematical formulation of the inverse transform, we can again write the reconstructed signal x hat as a sequence of blocks, like we did before. We can obtain the reconstructed signal by simply multiplying the blocks of subband samples y of m with the inverse transform matrix, so given here. The elements of this inverse DFT matrix are given by this equation here. Now, equation 5 can also be written as this here using rows times columns. So we have the sum k going from 0 to n minus 1, with n is 0 to n minus 1. That's equation 6. To see the result in impulse response of the equivalent synthesis future bank, we need the equations for upsampling and filter in the synthesis future bank. In the synthesis future bank, the subbands signals yk of m are upsampled first and we obtain the upsampled signal with phase 0 and time index n because we are at the higher sampling rate. The following filtering is the convolution with the synthesis subband impulse responses gk of n, hence we get the output of the k filter as given by equation 7, where L is the length of the synthesis filter. We assume that L is a multiple of n, which we can always obtain by appending zeros if necessary. Observe that most of the samples of y upsampled uh, n are zero. To rewrite this equation here such that we only process the non-zero samples, we again use the blockwise processing by substituting n by m times capital N plus n and n prime by m prime times capital N plus n prime. Using block indices m and m prime and in block or phase indices n and n prime to obtain this double sum here. Here we can see that we get the non-zero elements of y absent of n if its argument is integer multiples of n, and we get this if we have n equals to n prime. Because of this, um, the inner sum only consists of one sum, because the sum over n prime disappears. Well, when we make n equals to n prime, uh, we will have here um, the inner sum consists of one sum, and the sum over n prime disappears. So we end up in this case here. For the reconstructed signal, we simply add up all the n subbands. So now we're adding up the n subbands. From here we add up all the n subbands. And here we can now replace the um, y upsampled k m times n by yk of m, since we now address only the non-zero elements. And we reach here equation 8. This is now our reconstructed signal 
where the first sum is over the sub ends and the second sum is over the blocks. At this point, we can compare this uh, future bank equation 8 with the synthesis transform of equation 6. And we have here equation 6. We're just repeating it here. And we can compare with equation 8. First, we see that the transform of equation 6 has no sum over the blocks, meaning the filters only have length L equals to N. Hence, the inner sum disappears with m prime equals to zero. With this, equation eight becomes this equation here. And when we compare this with the transform equation six, we can see now the equivalent impulse response are given by jk of n, given by this here. Looking at our transform matrix, we see that this impulse response correspond to each row of the inverse transform matrix non reversed in conclusion the impulse responses of our subends are the rows of the synthesis transform matrix here not time reversed we can read out the impulse responses of the synthesis filter bank from left to right in each column of the transform matrix observe each time we got our result by comparing the convolution sum of our equivalent filter bank with the transform sum. This theory can seem a little bit complicated, so let's take a look into a Python example so we can try to clear some points out. So take a DFT of size n equals to 4. Its transform matrix T can be obtained using this FFT, FFTI. So we have our transform matrix here. Observe that we have complex values in the transform and hence we obtain complex valued filters. To evaluate complex valued filters, we need the full circle in the frequency domain from 0 to 2 pi. If we want to obtain the frequency response of the subband k equals to 1 of this DFT filter bank, we take the second column, time reverse it, and then plot the frequency response with psi pi signal frac z. So here we are importing a psi pi signal, matplotlib to plot numpy. And here we are computing the frac z, so the frequency response of sub n k equals to 1. Here is just to um, avoid um, log 10 of 0. And now we are plotting the magnitude response for the TFT for sub n k equals to 1. So we have dB and we have normalized frequency. Here is approximately a pi and here we are at 2 pi. Observe we have, we have a bad stop end attenuation, so it's less than 20 dB. Also observe that the frequency axis is going from 0 to 2 pi instead of just pi. This is because we have complex impulse response. The normalized frequency 2 pi is the sampling frequency. Since we have a 2 pi periodic frequency, this is identical to frequency 0. And the frequencies from pi to 2 pi can also be seen as the negative frequencies from minus pi to zero. This shows that this filter has a pass band at the positive frequencies, but not at the negative frequencies. The equivalent pass band at the negative frequencies is obtained from sub band k equals to three. So first we plotted the sub band k equals to one. Now we move to sub band k equals to three. We do the same procedure. We calculate the frequency response and we have the magnitude response for the DFT subband k is equal to 3. Observe that this looks like the frequency mirrored version of the filter for k equals to 1. This also shows how to separate positive and negative frequencies. The low pass is at k equals to 0 and the high pass appears at k equals to 2. Observe that here the high pass appears in the middle because of the symmetry between positive and negative frequencies. In this example now we show that the transform is indeed a special case of a critically sampled filter bank with the above computed filters. So let's take an example signal of length equals to 8. So here what we're doing we are having here 
a signal length equals to 8 we have this array here and then we do its decomposition into blocks of length 4 by using this convenient Python, uh, Python NumPy indexing here so we have here decomposition into blocks of length 4 Again, we obtain our DFT transform matrix using the FFT and I that we have here, and we obtain the transformed blocks with this dot multiplication of our decomposition into blocks of length 4 and our transform matrix. And this is the result Y of T. Here, each row contains the spectrum of each corresponding block. Now, we process the input signal X through a critically sampled filter bank with the equivalent filter impulse response. The transform matrix columns flipped up down and down sampled with the last phase of the blocks N0 equals to capital N minus 1, which is equal to 3, as it appeared in our derivation of the equivalent impulse responses. So here we have... Um, this filtering, so we are flipping, and here we get the output of this filtered uh, signal through a critically sampled filter bank. Now let's compare with YOT. So YOT was given here, and now Y is given here. And we see that Y of T from the transform and Y from the critically sampled filter bank are indeed the same. So we do the two different procedures. Here we did a matrix multiplication. And here we did filtering. So uh, using the critically sampled filter bank with the equivalent filter impulse response, but we achieved the same results. In co conclusion, we see that a transform is a special case of a future bank. The tool of reading out the impulse responses from a transform matrix allows us to analyze the resulting futures and to judge if they fulfill our requirements. Hello there! And welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schula at the Ilmenau University of Technology. I am Renato and on this tutorial we will continue talking about the DCT and then we will move on to an introduction to polyphase representation. So let's get started. Another widely used block transform is this critical sign transform. Uh, when you look in literature, you will find many different definitions of the DCT type 4, but this is the one we're going to use for this lecture, and you can see also in lesson number 2, that we talk about the DCT. So the DCT type 4 that we are going to use has this equation here, and we notice we have this um, squared root of 2 divided by capital N, we have this 0 0.5 here, this 0 0.5 here, and this um, analysis go from k going from 0 to n minus 1 and we have the sum from n going to 0 to n minus 1 so the characteristic here is the shift of 0 0.5 in the smooth band index k and at the time index n so we have the 0 0.5 shift for smooth band index and for the time index if we compare it to the DCT type 2 and we see that the DCT type 2 is defined by this equation here. And we only notice the difference is this CK here, this coefficient, where the C of 0 is the square root of 0 0.5, and then the CK is equal to 1 for K uh, greater than 0, for K going from 0 to N minus 1. So observe that the only difference is that the DCT4 also has a shift of 0 0.5 for the frequency, index um, k. The DCT2 is mostly used for images and video coding 
whereas the DCT4 is mostly used for audio CDs. So using the definition of the DCT4, we can now construct the transform matrix and extract the equivalent input responses. So the analysis transform matrix becomes this here. In the impulse response of the equivalent analysis filters, they are the time reversed columns. So this is the impulse response of the equivalent analysis filters. So in this way, we get capital N impulse responses. So the synthesis impulse responses are simply the rows of this transform matrix, which in this case is identical to the columns. So we have here the synthesis impulse response. So here we have our transform matrix, and then we get the impulse response of the analysis filters as the time reversed columns of this matrix. And the synthesis impulse response are the rows of this transform matrix, and in this case, is identical to the columns. So we see that they are simply the time reversed analysis filters, since here we don't have um, time reversal. Here we have perfect reconstruction filter banks with critical sampling, both desirable properties for coding. But our equivalent filters, they are restricted to a length of capital N. This leads to filters which do not really have good frequency responses. We can get wide transition bands for our band pass filters relative to the width of the path band and not enough stop band attenuation. So in Python we can get a transform matrix for the DCT using this here. So here we are starting um, with empty zeros 4 by 4 matrix, so n is equal to 4, then we iterate through n and k, and we will set these values here, and then we have our transform matrix for the DCT4. And now we can plot the frequency response of the analysis filters, for instance for subband k equals to 0. So now I'm importing scipy signal, and I'm importing netplotlib, uh, pi plot, so we will plot the scipy signal once again when you use FRAXZ to get the frequency response. It's done here. This time we're using subband k equals to zero, and then we plot here and we see the magnitude response for the DCT4 subband k equals to zero. Here we have our normalized frequency going from zero to pi, and here we have our magnitude in dB. So observe the low stop band attenuation of less than 20 dB. A solution is to allow filters with longer impulse response, longer than the block size n. This would lead to non-square transform matrices, but non-square transform matrices are not invertible in general. We can only obtain a pseudo-inverse. Hence, we would lose perfect reconstruction, which is a problem. Alternatively, we could have overlapping blocks, which could provide perfect reconstruction, but then we would lose critical sampling. Again, a problem for coding applications. Our goal is to obtain longer filters, have the same block length for critical sampling, sampling and perfect reconstruction. This means the transform matrix approach, or view, comes to its limits. We need new tools. This leads us to the polyphase representation, which can be seen as an extension of the transform matrix approach or as a mixture between the transform view and the filter bank view. We start our journey into polyphase representation taking a look at the analysis filter bank. So we start with writing our analysis filter with FIR filters of length capital L and downsampling operation in terms of our block index M and an in block or phase index N with N between 0 and capital N minus 1. The original formulation for our subband signals for the convolution and downsampling with phase N0 was given by this, equa this uh, equation here. Here we have our phase N0, this downsampling, and we have the sum N going from 0 to L minus 1 where L is the fit filter length 
um, of our FIR filter. In general, we assume that the filter length L is an integer multiple of n, and we can always zero pad it if necessary. We can now split this sum into an in block processing with the phase index n that runs from 0 to n minus 1, and an out of block processing with the block index m prime, which runs from 0 to the end, by using an index substitution. In this way, the index m prime corresponds to our downsampled index. To obtain the same ordering for the signal x as we use for our block transform approach, with its index n going up, we substitute n by m prime times capital N plus n minus 1 minus n, and we choose the downsampling phase as n0 equals to n minus 1, and then we'll substitute from here and we'll go to here. And then we have here a double sum. And we have this uh, m prime now, so we replace uh, m by this here. And we'll observe that this is still our filter bank formulation. But the interesting part here is that the inner sum, again, looks like our block transform formulation with blocks or vectors of size n and an impulse response along the column vector of length capital N. We can reformulate or simplify the inner sum as a vector multiplication when we rewrite the impulse response page and as a vector which contains a sequence of blocks. So this is now the uh, impulse response h of n as a vector. And we will use the vector of input blocks given here. Hence, we will get this equation now here which is exactly the inner sum of 8. So here is equation 8, and now we have here. Hence, using these two vectors, we can replace the inner sum by this vector multiplication and rewrite or simplify equation 8 to this here. So now we have um, the inner part of the sum is now uh, like our block transform, if we view our impulse response h of k as um, one column uh, reversed of a transform matrix. So again, this is the transform view inside the filter bank view with longer filters, which is why we also have the outer sum, the out of block processing. That's the convolution. The remaining outer sum now looks like a convolution again, but now with a sequence of blocks instead of samples, and we have a vector convolution given here. Observe that our downsampling factor is now embedded in our block size. This has the advantage that we can now apply the z-transform to this equation to turn the convolution into a multiplication. First, we need to z-transform our vectors. So we start with the signal vector, vector x of n in the time domain, and we can compute the z-transform of each element of this vector as polyphase elements, given here. So the z-transform of our signal vector x of n then becomes the polyphase vector. So we have here. Since we have n phases, we call this approach polyphase. We will use the same method for the vector of impulse responses. So we have here a vector of impulse responses, and then we will have the polyphase element given by here. So this is our vector of impulse response, and then we have the polyphase element, each one given by here. And the output of our case filter is still just a polynomial, not a vector or matrix given here. The result of filtering and downsampling for the case filter in the z domain is then the following simple multiplication of vectors. 
observe here, we rewrote the analysis filter in subsequent downsampling by this multiplication of vectors in the Z domain. For an implementation, we can convert this equation back in the time domain, starting with rewriting the vector multiplication as a sum over the phase index n. So we will rewrite this um, vector multiplication as a sum over phase index n. The multiplications in the z domain become a sum with simple convolutions in the time domain, which is here. This is the sum over the phases of the convolution of the blocks. With this equation, we can now implement the polyphase structure in the time domain. So here we have a visualization of the polyphase elements and the blocks. So given a signal x of n and a Dow sampling rate of n equals to 2, we get the following blocks and polyphase elements. So we have blocks and we have polyphase elements. Let's try to have a better understanding of all this theory using a Python example for polyphase. So we will assume our signal x is equal to this array of numbers 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we use n equals to 3. So then we get the signal blocks if x of m with m in a range as we need to fit the signal. So x 0 will be 5, 6, and 7, and x1 will be 8, 9, and 10. We can use Python SymPy, and we use three-dimensional arrays or tensors to represent the coefficients of the different exponents of z in the third dimension. So now we are going to use SymPy and define here z as a symbol, and then the polyphase matrix now is a row vector with two blocks. So I'm defining here first uh, xp, so zeros, so this is the um, size as a three-dimensional array, and then we have if x um, zero here is with zero, and then we have five, six, and seven, and here is one, and we have eight, nine, and ten, and then we'll add these two, but this one has a coefficient for z uh, to the power of minus 1. So we end up with this um, array here. And we have 5 plus 8 z to the power of minus 1, 6 plus 9 z to the power of uh, minus 1, 7 plus 10 z to the power of minus 1. So the polyphase elements x and of z with phase zero, uh, n and from 0 to n minus 1 are given here. So the polyphase vector is, so we have this element here, this element here, this element here, and we have this polyphase vector. So we see that it corresponds to exactly the same as our Python output. Assume we have the first analysis impulse response given by the h of 0, which is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and for n equals to 3, then its polyphase vector is in general given here, with our phases going down. And for this example, we'll take sub n k equals to 0, and then we have this definition here. So in Python, again, we can calculate this. So the H polyphase matrix is a column vector with two blocks. And we are doing 5, 4, 3, 8, 7, 6. And then we're, again, we have this 0 and 1. And we multiply the 1 with z to the power of minus 1. And we will get this here, which is identical to what we have here. So filtering with downsample as a multiplication of the polyphase matrices x of z and h of z, 
is done here. So what we're doing is we are doing a dot multiplication x of um, z and h of z and what we have is this result here. So this is the filtering with downsampling as a multiplication of the polyphase matrices x of z and h of z. SimPy is a great tool for symbolic mathematical operations, but it's not really efficient for other applications. So we will obtain a faster implementation without SimPy if we go back into the time domain and write our polyphase matrices as polynomials with matrix, matrix coefficients. So this is what we are going to do here, where a, n, and b, n contain all the coefficients of z to the power of minus 1 and capital NA and capital NB are the length of the polynomials. So we see here capital NA, capital NB, the length of the polynomials AN and um, BN. Uh, there is a mistake here. Let's just quickly fix. And then their product is given here. Remember that a0 plus a1 to z to the power of minus 1 times b0 plus b1 z to the power of minus 1 is given by a0 b0 plus a0 b1 a1 b0 times z to the power of minus 1 plus a1 b1 times z to the power of minus 2. Observe that in the z domain, this is a multiplication of matrix polynomials. In the time domain, this is a convolution of matrix sequences. So now what we can do is to write a Python function that will, uh, will be called the polmatmult. So it uh, multiplies two polynomial matrix, so the arrays A and B, where each matrix entry is a polynomial itself. So those polynomial entries are in the third dimension. And the third dimension can be interpreted as containing the coefficient matrix of exponents of z to the power of minus 1. So this is what we're doing. We're defining here um, this function to do the multiplication of matrix polynomials. And we will use this later. Here we have an application example and we will use this function we just defined for uh, the multiplication of a matrix with polynomials. So let's take our signal and filter as in our SimPy example, but we will write them as polynomials of vector x equals to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 with n equals 3 and its polyphase representation then is this um, 5, 6, 7, plus z to the power of minus 1, 8, 9, 10. Similar for our filter, we have this equals response, and then the polyphase representation will be 5, 4, 3, plus z to the power of minus 1, 8, 7, 6. So these are polynomials whose coefficients are vectors. In Python, we simply uh, store the sequence of vectors with the exponent as index in the third dimension. So this is what we are doing here. The exponents are on the third dimension for 0 and for um, z to the power of uh, minus 1. And then we are multiplying this 2. And what we have is 70, 230, 187. And if we look back, is 70. 187. And this is what we have here. Observe that this result in the time domain corresponds indeed uh, to the one with SimPy in the Z domain. Now we will define different functions that will make our life easier when we will uh, work with polyphase. So here's a function to turn a signal 
into a polyphase vector. So it turns, uh, for example, an audio signal into a polyphase vector that can be used as the input or of our function that we define, the polyphase matrix multiplication. So here, this is a phase that converts, uh, given an input signal x, which is a row vector, into a polyphase row vector for blocks of length m, n. And this is what we are doing here. Another useful function is to turn a polyphase vector back into a sequential signal. So this is what we're doing, is polyphase to x, and this converts the polyphase into signal p, this is a row vector, into a contiguous row vector for block length n. And we have here this function. So with these functions, the polyphase to x and x to polyphase, and also with our uh, pole math mode, so the multiplication of matrix polynomials, we are now able to work with polyphase in a more efficient way and not using SIMPI. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Shula at the Humanal University of Technology. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this notebook we continue talking about polyphase representation. So let's get started. Last time we saw how to obtain the polyphase representation for the filtering and downsampling operation of one filter. We now extend this formulation for a bank of n filters. Here we not only have one filter but n filters in our analysis filter bank and hence we can assemble the n filter outputs or n subbands into a vector of n elements given here. We also now have n filters instead of one filter, and we assemble the polyphase vectors of our filters into a matrix in which each column corresponds to an analysis filter. So we have this matrix here, and then we have each element of this matrix given by this equation here. So this matrix of polynomials now contains all our n impulsive responses for our analysis filter bank, just like in our block transform case, but with arbitrarily long filters. Unlike our transform case, here we now have Z transforms, or polynomials in Z, as our matrix entries. This now enables us to write the filtering and downsampling operations of our entire analysis filter bank as a simple multiplication using the above polyphase matrix. And this is a very important result. Mathematically, this looks similar to the block transform case, but with Z transforms. Observe that this equation now contains all the samples of our input signal and also our subband signals and our impulse responses because we use the Z transform signals. The Z transform converts a potentially infinite sequence into just a scalar or an element, its Z-transform, which can be seen as a one by one matrix. The Z-transform of the sequence is one big polynomial. All the input samples are in vector X of C. This is important because it allows us to use longer filters than just one block, longer than with the block transforms. Observe that for an implementation, we can write the polyphase matrix as a polynomial of matrix, matrices HM. So we have our polyphase matrix as a polynomial of matrices HM, where the elements of the nth row and the kth column of HM are given here. In Python, the exponent M would appear as a third dimension or as a slices of matrices even here. In conclusion, we can write the entire analysis filter bank with its n filters and DAO samplers by n with a size n by n polyphase matrix H of C, which is multiplied by the polyphase vector of the signal X 
of C. Now we move to the synthesis filter link. Just as for the block transform case, we can also get a corresponding formulation for the synthesis filter bank. For the, filters, for the synthesis filter bank, we can now also write the reconstructed C sequence x hat of n in terms of blocks with index m and phases n and obtain the synthesis upsampling and convolution as we've seen before in the previous lecture. That's given by equation number 8. And we have it here with some still to be determined g uh, k. We can now use vectors for our sequences of blocks to simplify this equation using a vector of, for our reconstructed signal and for our case synthesis filters. And we start again with looking at just one filter. So what we're doing here is uh, we're using vectors for sequences of blocks and vector for um, our reconstructed signal and for our cave synthesis filter. Now we can rewrite our synthesis equation as given here, where L is the length of the synthesis filters. So the inner sum is a convolution where we now no longer have our phase index n because we now have output blocks instead of samples. So we can turn the convolution into a multiplication using the Z-transform. And this is what we're doing here. And now we can extend this notation to our bank of N synthesis filters using our subband vector YZ and the synthesis polyphase matrix. Since the output is the sum of all subbands, we obtain our polyphase matrix by collecting all, all our polyphase, in this case, uh, row vectors of our synthesis filters G, K of C into a matrix, such that the outer sum of the above equation turns into a matrix multiplication. So we have this here where each row of G of C now contains one synthesis filter. And this is the synthesis polyphase matrix. Observe that for this polyphase matrix, the indices for the subbands K and for the phase, phase N are in reverse order when compared to the analysis polyphase matrix that we've seen before. In conclusion, again, we turned the mathematically very complex operation of upsampling and synthesis filtering into a mathematically very simple operation with the multiplication of the subband vector with the polyphase matrix, and we have here our reconstructed signal. Our goal is to obtain perfect reconstruction. Perfect reconstruction is defined as a reconstructed signal which is identical to the original signal, except for a delay. So here we have our reconstructed signal, and we have the original signal with a delay. In this case, ND uh, is this delay at the original sampling rate. This delay usually results from our filtering and the downsampling and upsampling operations. So to obtain perfect reconstruction, we can simply take a look at the output of our synthesis filter bank. The structure of the polyphase analysis and synthesis filter bank can be seen also in the following picture. So here we have our original input signal. We have here this uh, delay of z to the power of minus one. We have downsampling. We have a transfer function or, or filtering. And then we will have the output and then it goes to the synthesis filter, then we have upsampling with delays, and we have our reconstructed um, signal. So the structure of the delays and downsamplers on the left of the analysis polyphase matrix, it's converting a sequence of samples at high sampling rate into a sequence of blocks at the low sampling rate. And it's called blocking. And this is what our Python function x to polyphase is doing. Conversely, 
the structure to the right of the synthesis polyphase matrix converts a sequence of blocks at the low sampling rate into a sequence of samples at the high sampling rate. It's called deblocking, and this is what our function polyphase to x is doing. And here we can see that we will obtain perfect reconstruction if we have the synthesis polyphase matrix as the inverse of the analysis polyphase times a delay by d blocks. So here we have the inverse of the analysis polyphase and we have a delay of d blocks. And where d here is the delay at the downsampled rate. This is basically again like in our block transform case. And this is now the constraint for obtaining perfect reconstruction. The question is, how do we obtain filters for perfect reconstruction? How do we invert a polyphase matrix containing the polynomials? And how do we get good synthesis filters? A simple approach is analog to the orthogonal block transform matrices, where the inverse is simply the transpose matrix. There, the analysis and synthesis filters are identical, except for the time reversal for the analysis filters. The corresponding property of polyphase matrices is called para-unitary, and you can see more in this reference here, multi-rate systems and filter banks, and it's defined by this equation here. So the transposition is the case for real-valued coefficients in the polyphase matrix. Otherwise, we need conjugate transposition for the coefficients. This definition is very similar to the definition of orthonormal matrices, except that we have the z to the power of minus 1 on the right-hand side, and that corresponds to a time reversal. The advantage, or rather one of its advantages, of a polyphase matrix with this property is that we don't need to explicitly compute its inverse. We just need to transpose it and replace all z's by z to the power of minus 1. Observe, if our polynomials in the polyphase matrix only have zeroth order, only constant, no z, only z to the power of 0, which is equal to 1, then the polyphase matrix is identical to the transform matrix, for instance, in the case of our DCT4. And we obtain the simple case if our filters are no longer than n and they fit into one block. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanal University of Technology. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this notebook we will talk about the modified discrete cosine transform, the MDCT. So, let's get started. Last time we saw that para-unitary polyphase matrices are an easy way to obtain the inverse polyphase matrix for the synthesis. We just need to transpose the matrix and replace z by z to the power of minus 1. But how do we obtain useful para-unitary polyphase matrices or filter banks? More useful than a simple transform matrix. We now need to go one step further in increasing the length of our polynomials in the polyphase matrix. We saw that the zeroth order polynomials result in our usual transform matrices, like a DCT. But we already know their frequency response are often not good enough. The next step is to look at polynomials of first order, where we have elements of z to the power of minus 1. Then, this leads to impulse response with a length of two blocks. The first block corresponds to a delay of z to the power of 0, and the second block to the c to the power of minus 1. Hence, we get the impulse response length of L equals to 2n, with n the block length and the number of subbands. One widespread example are the so-called MDCT, the Modified Discrete Cosine Transform Future Banks, which are so-called cosine-modulated future banks. 
as we saw in lecture 6. Modulation means the multiplication of a base baseband prototype filter impulse response with a periodic modulation function, here a cosine function. In this way, all the subband filters are obtained from one prototype filter H of n, in this case uh, for the analysis filter band, uh, filters uh, are given uh, here, this equation 1. And we have that the k goes from 0 to n minus 1, and here are the subbands, and the time index n goes from 0 to 2n minus 1, meaning we have filter length uh, with length L equals to 2n. The prototype filter, h of n, is a low-pass filter, and the cosine function is the cosine modulation function that shifts the center frequency of the filter to the cosine function frequency, given by pi divided by capital N times k plus 0 0.5, such that we evenly cover the entire frequency range from 0 to pi. Imagine the low pass having a pass band from a minus pi divided by 2 times capital N to pi divided by 2 times capital N, then the first subband or the subband for when k is equal to 0, already results from modulation with frequency pi divided by 2 times capital N, and hence it goes on the positive side from 0 to pi divided by N. In this way, we obtain N filter of passband width pi divided by capital N, which then cover the entire frequency range between 0 and pi in the positive frequency range. Again, the negative frequencies are the mirrored version. Observe that we can view in equation 1, again here, the multiplication of h of n with the cosine term also as a window design method. Yeah? So we can see this multiplication like we've seen before with the window design method. Here, the ideal filter would not be a sync function, but an infinitely long cosine function. This corresponds to infinitely narrow bandpass filters at the cosine frequencies as ideal filters. After windowing, they then become wider. Because of these two different views, we see two different names in literature for this H of n. It could be a baseband prototype, but we also see as a window function, it's a time-reversed uh, baseband prototype. Let's take a look now in a Python example for such filters. Let's take the so-called sine window or baseband prototype for n equals to 8 subbands. Once again, we are importing our Python libraries. We are using NumPy, PyPlot, and SciPy signal. Here we are defining the block size, so the number of subbands. Here we are defining the length of the filter. And here we are calculating the number of blocks in the filter. Here we have the sine window impulse response, so this is the sine window, and here we are plotting the frequency um, response for the filters, so we have k is from 0 to 8, and we have this uh, 0 to 7, so we have this uh, 8 subbands, which is the same number of the block size. You see here the k goes from 0 to n, and n goes uh, from 0 to l, and l is the length of the filter. In this case, it's 2 times the block size, or the number of subbands. And here we have the MDCT, Analysis Filter Bank uh, Frequency Response, so it's given in this plot. We see that h is indeed a low-pass filter. It works as both a window and a low-pass prototype filter. We see that our low-pass filter H is indeed shifted in frequency, H and of K, to become a band-pass filters and a high-pass filter. So we have the low-pass, then we shift, and we have these band-passes, and the last one is a high-pass filter. So the baseband prototype of window H of N is what we need for the design of our filter bank. H of n is a low pass, which we want to design now with the goal that we get high stop band attenuation and also obtain perfect reconstruction.
For the synthesis filters, we have the baseband prototype filter G of n, which produces the subband filters given by G of k of n, with k is our subbands. How do we now design the prototype filters H of n and G of n such that we obtain perfect reconstruction? At this point, it's, it is not even clear if it works with this modulation constraint we just introduced. To see that, we first con construct the polyphase matrices. Here is the analysis polyphase matrix, and we get its elements given by these equations here. Observe the upper limit of our summation index is L divided by capital N minus 1, and here it's equal to 1 because we have L equals to 2N. So we have two blocks, block 0 and block 1. This means we only have two summons for M equals to 0 and M equals to 1. For the synthesis polyphase matrix, we get these equations here. And in this way, we obtain the analysis polyphase matrix given here. So here we have the case of MDCP, and we have all these elements of our analysis polyphase matrices. And here we see that we have our um, only polynomials of the first order as elements of our a matrix, which we have z to the power of 0, and we have z to the power of minus 1. The, um, the synthesis polyphase matrix is something similar, and we have here this synthesis polyphase matrix. So observe the corresponding time phase indices for the analysis and synthesis polyphase matrix, which run the transpose way for the synthesis. Here we have page 0 and n, which is here, 0 and n. Here we have um, n minus 1 and 2n minus 1n, and we have n minus 1, 2n minus 1n, and so on and so forth. The problem is that we still don't know how to proceed with the design of our prototype filters. We basically could start constructing an analysis polyphase matrix and then invert it to obtain perfect reconstruction. But the inverse of a polynomial matrix is not easy to compute, and also the inverse polyphase matrix might have filters which are not good. For, for uh, instance, no real pass band or no, not sufficient stop band attenuation, or we could get um, IIR filters instead of FIR filters. But here we can apply a trick that will help. Since we have a modulated filter bank, we have certain periodicities hidden in the impulse response and hence in the polyphase matrix. It is possible to investigate those periodicities manually and come up with a solution for perfect reconstruction. As Princeton and Bradley did in the late 80s, who first described the MDCP, which they called the T TDAC then, it was the time domain alias in cancellation, because that was the approach that they used. They analyzed all the aliasing components in the time domain and found one condition to cancel them in the time domain. And this leads to the sign window. And later, people, uh, especially in the MPEG context, called it the MDCP. Here, we will investigate the symmetries of a longer cosine modulation function using a Python example. So let's take a modulated analysis future bank uh, with impulse responses given by these equations. Here, if a cosine modulation function is like a DCP4, then for subband k equals to 0, for n equals to 8 subbands, and for a length of 32, we get this plot here. And we see the symmetries. So we have blocks of 8 samples. This is the block 0. And then we see the block 1 is equal to the block the block zero but with inverted sign and flipped from left to right. Then block two it will be equal to block zero but with an inverted sign. And finally block three is just the flipped version from left to right of block zero. So this image visualizes the following symmetry. We have that the second block 
is identical to flipping and negating the first block. And we can see just uh, by the numbers as the same as was described by this picture. Uh, the third, the second block is identical to flipping and ne negating the first block. The third block is identical to negating the first block. And the last block is identical to flipping the first block. And here is the proof of how we are doing. And so on. So we see the following rule. Every second block is flipped. And after two blocks, we get a sign change. This is not only true for the first subband, but also for all other subbands K. To show this, uh, how this is useful for a matrix implementation, let's take the following example. We have a prototype function h of n, and we have n is equal to four subbands. Then our modulated impulse response for subband k equals to zero with the basic DCT4 cosine modulation function is given here. And to show that the basic principle, the time shift of the um, MDCT was omitted. Now we can implement it with a block size of 4 for a filter length of 8, twice as long as the DCT4. We have two modulated blocks with block number 0 and 1 with the time reversal for the analysis, so for H0. So we have here H0, block 0 and block 1. And we have here these elements. You can see there is a time reversal for the analysis for H0. Now we can write the modulation with the length 2 times n with our cosine function with the help of a matrix formulation which includes the flipping and the sign change of the second cosine modulation block. For that, we also define the first block of our cosine modulation function given here. Observe that the T0 transposed is also the first column of our DCT4 matrix. Hence, for the first block of the modulated impulse response, we simply get this here. You can see this diagonal here. And because of the modulation block, block 1, um, is time flipped and sign changed compared to the first block, block 0, we obtain our second modulated block as um, given here. So instead of flipping and changing the sign of our modulation vector Tz, we apply the flipping and sign change to the matrix of the prototype function. And we have now this diagonal here, and we see we have these sign changes here. And then we have this equation, and hence we can put both together in the z domain, it's given here. So we have our first block, z to the power of 0. We have a, a second block, z to the power of minus 1. And this is what we get here. And observe that we can simply add the two previous matrices since they have the same size, and we can factor out um, the vector of the modulation function t of 0 and multiply the second block with z to the power of minus 1 to obtain the z transform. So this is what we are doing here. We have this matrix. We are adding this matrix to this one. And this is the result. And we can also um, factor out the vector of the modulation t, 0. And we are multiplying the second block with z to the power of minus 1. And then we have our z transform. We see that we obtain a very compact representation for the modulation where we separated the prototype function and the modulation function into two different matrices and the matrix with the prototype function is a sparse matrix. If uh, we extend this example to filters of length of um, four blocks, we would get this cross-shaped matrix. Observe that every polynomial in this resulting matrix is downsampled version of the prototype uh, H of n by a factor of 2 times capital N. 
in our case, 2 times capital N is equal to 8. In addition, every second resulting value after this down sampling is also sign change. We can also obtain the sign change by replacing z to the power of 2 by minus z to the power of 2 in the z transform for the 2 times capital N down sampled version. So this matrix times our column vector T0 transpose above results in the polyphase representation of our subband filter H0 and for the subband K equals to 0. So this is the first of the four filters we have in our modulated filter band. We obtain all four filters if we just use the complete DCT4 transform matrix T given here. So for instance, with n equals to 4, we get for T these values here using this Python function. We are just implementing this in Python. Fortunately, we obtain the same symmetries for the first subband also for the higher subbands. In summary, we have an analysis filter bank with the impulse response given here, and its analysis polyphase matrix H of C can be written as a multiplication of a sparse cross-shaped matrix with a DCT4 transform matrix T given here. And notice that for odd numbers of subbands n, we would obtain one value or one polynomial in the center of the matrix. We will now go deeper into this investigation of sparse matrices and the MDCT. So let's remember that the MDCT analysis impulse responses are given by this equation 2b here. And that the filter length here is limited to 2 times capital N, meaning that a small n goes from 0 to 2 times capital N minus 1. And since the MDCT has a very similar modulation function as a DCT4, we just have this uh, time shift of N capital N divided by 2 in it. We suspect that we can also factor it into a sparse matrix and a DCT transform matrix like here. Here, there's some uh, sparse matrix F A of C. If this assumption is true, we can obtain the sparse matrix by bringing the transform matrix from the above form, uh, formula to the other side of the equation, and we will have that the sparse matrix is given by the H MDCT Z times T to the power of minus 1. We can simply start with uh, construct, constructing the complete polyphase matrix H MDCT using equations 1 and 2 that we've seen before. So here we have equation 1, here we have equation 2, and then if we plug in to this equation 2b, we can compute f a of c as follows, resulting in this equation 3. This is for the simple case of a filter length of just 2 times capital N, which is the length of a MDCT. For odd numbers of subbands n, we will get one value or one polynomial in the top and bottom row centers and the left and right most columns. Observe that we now have all the lays on the left side of the matrix, uh, which allows us to factor them out. So we just see the delays on the left um, side hand side of the matrix, and there are no delays here. Once again, let's use Python to take a look at what we've seen. So we can try out this factorization, for instance, if we use the SymPy, the symbolic uh, mathematics package, and uh, observe that the exponentiation in Python is symbolized with uh, two stars. So here, from SymPy, we are importing all, and from SciPy, we are also importing everything. Here, we are defining Z as a symbol. We define n equals to 4, and we are having a baseband prototype which is from h0 to h7 as symbols. So the MDCT uh, polyphase matrix H, we are doing this here, 
Uh, since each column contains the time reversed impulse response, we need n minus 1 minus n instead of n. And we start with a n by n uh, matrix of zeros. So what we're doing, we're having a matrix of zeros, n by n. And then we are going to n going to 0 to n, and k also going from 0 to n. And here we have our n minus 1 minus n, and this will give all the elements for our matrix, and this is the equation we see before. Here we have our z to the power of minus 1, and here we would have our z to the power of 0. So then the transform matrix T for the DCT4 is given here. And now our sparse matrix FA is the H, which we computed here, times T here to the power of minus 1. And then we will print uh, this matrix. And this is what we have. This is our matrix H. And this is our mm, sparse matrix uh, FA. Here we see that it's the same as equation 3, apart from some rounding errors, and that we get a diamond matrix shape. This diamond shape results from the time shift of n capital N divided by 2 in the cosine modulation function. It has the effect of shifting the left and the right halves of the above cross shaped matrix and multiplying it with z to the power of minus 1. The result of shifting or exchanging this, those two halves in this diamond shaped matrix uh, that we can see here. This matrix is now surprisingly simple. It only contains the two types capital N samples of our baseband prototype impulse responses. Most entries are zero and we have delays of c to the power of minus one only on the left side. So we have z to the power of minus one here on the left side. And this was the purpose of the sum in capital N divided by two on the cosine modulation function. In this way, we can factor out the delays using a, what we will call a delay matrix, which is uh, very important for invertibility and perfect reconstruction. The particular diamond shape of the matrix results from the symmetries of the cosine modulation and the shift of capital N divided by 2 on the modulation function for the time index. As we said before, we can factor out the delays using this, what we are calling the delay matrix, given here. So if um, for faster implementation, so we are not going to use symbolic mathematics, we are not going to use SymPy, and we can again rewrite this matrix here as a polynomial with matrix coefficients. So we have this delay matrix, Z, so here we have the terms of Z to the power of 0, plus this matrix z to the power of minus 1, and we store this matrix coefficients in a three-dimensional tensor. So we will store this matrix coefficients on a three-dimensional tensor. So one tensor for z to the power of 0 and one for z to the power of minus 1. We can factor out this delay matrix, and what remains is a matrix which only contains the coefficients of our baseband prototype filter, which we'll call the folding matrix or the filter matrix FA. So is given here by equation 4. And so we get that FA of Z is equal to FA times D of Z. So we have this is the FA, this is the D of Z, and when we multiply them, we get this FA of Z. Once again, we see this theory into practice using Python, first with SymPy, symbolic mathematics, and then a faster implementation, not using SymPy, here. So we are defining this uh, FA matrix, then we are defining our delay matrix, and then when we multiply FA, times D, 
and you get the following results. Now, this is a faster numerical Python implementation, but we will use the function callMath uh, mode that we've seen last time. Uh, it's, um, just multiply two polynomial matrices, array and B, uh, which each matrix entry is a polynomial, and those polynomials entries are in the third dimension. So the third dimension can also be interpreted as containing the 2D coefficient matrix of exponent z to the power of minus 1, as we've seen before. So now we are defining n equals to 4. Here we have our FA matrix. Here we have our delay matrix as a three-dimensional tensors, one for z to the power of zero, one for z to the power of minus one. Then we will multiply these um, polyphase matrices, these polynomial matrices using this function. So we see now we have FA and we have D with these two components. And here we have their product, and if we see, it's the same like we've seen. It's like one, so um, four, three, minus two, minus one, and we have here four, three, minus two, minus one without delays. And here we have one, two, three, four with the delays. And we have one z to the power of minus 1, 2, z to the power of minus 1, 3 and 4, and we have the same results. You see that the first matrix is the coefficients matrix for z to the power of z, um, z to the power of 0, and the second is the coefficient for matrix z to the power of minus 1. So z to the power of 0, z to the power of minus 1, and we see that this result is identical to the calculation using symbolic mathematics. We can also use Python to implement a function for FA matrix which generates the folding matrix FA from a general coefficient array H. So here we define this FA matrix function that will produce a diamond shaped folding matrix FA from the coefficients H, where H is a row matrix. And we see that this indeed has this diamond shape like we've seen in equation 4. So here we are defining the function. We are using this um, sign chains and we're using this uh, flipping uh, left to right. And then we have here an H array and then the resulting FA matrix using this formula. We can move now to the factorization and we have now an easy way to write or construct our analysis polyphase matrix. We have that HD MDCT of Z is equal to the FA times this delay matrix times this T. And we'll observe that these three matrices are now much simpler and also much more efficiently implementable. FA only contains real or complex numbers and it's uh, a sparse matrix which can be efficiently implemented. And also D of C, we have only the delays. And T, the DC3 for transform, can also be efficiently implemented, for instance, using our DCT4 function uh, from lecture 2, uh, which we uh, apply to each block. For the synthesis polyphase matrix, we get the GM DCT is equal to T to the power of minus 1, then we have this FS of C, and this is equal to T to the power of minus 1 times fs times z to the power of minus 1 and we can apply the same trick now with the synthesis polyphase matrix. We assume that we um, can also write it as a sparse matrix fs and now with the inverse transform matrix in the beginning to invert the analysis transform matrix solving for the sparse matrix fs of z and this yields t times gm dctz is equal to fs of z and this results in this matrix here and we can also use Python to obtain. So what we are doing again we have uh, we will use SymPy, so we are importing SymPy 
we are defining uh, z as a symbol we define n equals to 4 here we are doing our baseband prototype filters uh, the symbols here we have the uh, polyphase matrix g right? each column contains the impulse response here we have our transform matrix t the same principles that we use for the analysis now we are using for the synthesis and we can compute the sparse matrix so it will be t times g and here we have again this diamond shape but now with a different ordering of the coefficients of the baseband prototype g of n so the time or phase coefficient n of our baseband prototype g of n runs from left to right which also corresponds to transposing of matrices you know, observe that here the delays are on the lower half of our matrix we can again factor out these delays with a matrix which we multiply from the left hand side in which has the delay on the lower half of its diagonal we can again write this needed uh, matrix using our just defined matrix dz by using its inverse remember that the inverse of a diagonal matrix is obtained by inverting each element of its diagonal separately so this is an example how to inverse a diagonal matrix and therefore we get this delay inverse of this delay given here this means that we replace z to the power of minus one by z in the delay matrix but this would result in a non-causal system so z denotes the future block to make it causal and also to obtain the delays on the lower half of the diagonal we need to multiply the inverse matrix by z to the power of minus one so we are multiplying this inverse matrix by z to the power of minus one so this now has the delays z to the power of minus one on the lower part of its diagonal as needed so what we did is to make it this delay matrix um, to make it uh, causal and also to obtain the delays on the lower half of the diagonal we multiply the inverse matrix by z to the power of minus one and using this result we obtain the synthesis folding matrix fs it's given by this matrix five in this way we can rewrite the synthesis polyphase matrix as gmdct of c equals to t minus 1 times z using this result we obtain the synthesis folding matrix fs given here by this matrix 5 and we this way we can rewrite the synthesis polyphase matrix as the gmdct of c equals to t to the power of minus 1 times z to the power of minus 1 times d to the power of minus 1 of c times fs we move on to see how to obtain perfect reconstruction the direct concatenation of the analysis and synthesis filter banks without any processing in between leads to the product of their polyphase matrices so it's h m d c t of c times g m d c t of c and when we replace we will have this final result so we have this f a times z to the power of minus one times f s and the product of this uh, their polyphase matrix should result in a pure delay remember our polyphase representation is in the downsample domain since all polyphase elements are downsampled sequences at different phase hence a multiplication with z to the power of minus one corresponds to a delay of one sample in the downsample domain which corresponds to a delay of one block in our original signal domain this is a very important thing to have in mind so again um, a multiplication with z to the power of minus one corresponds to a delay of one sample in the downsample domain which corresponds to a delay of one block in our original signal domain the pure delay is the case if we choose 
that fs is equal to fa to the power of minus 1. Then we can compare this result with the equation 5 to obtain the synthesis prototype function g of n to obtain perfect reconstruction. Once more, we use Python to investigate this result. So we will assume we have a block, a length, and a number of subbands uh, n equal to 4. And our baseband prototype impulse response h of n is given by this array here. And we use equation 4 and we get the analysis folding matrix fa. And here is the analysis folding matrix fa. And then we get its inverse. So observe that usually this folding matrix is invertible because of its special shape resulting from the time shift of capital N divided by 2 in the cosine modulation function. And then this inverse becomes the folding matrix for the synthesis to ensure the perfect reconstruction. So we have here this inverse and this is now equal to the synthesis folding matrix Fs and when we compare it with the equation 5 we can read out the resulting synthesis baseband impulse response given here. And we can see that its values, they are not identical to the analysis prototype H of n. The numerator is the same, but the denominators change. To find out more about inverse in an, anal in an analytical way, the matrices Fa and Fs in equations 4 and 5 can be treated as nested two by two submatrices. We take the second non-zero entries of a given row n and the corresponding non-zero entries of the mirrored row n minus one minus n and these four non-zero entries become our submatrix. So these submatrices have the following form. Because they are nested into each other, they don't interact with the other two by two submatrices in the multiplication. Hence, we only need to consider 2 by 2 matrices at position n. And here n goes from 0 to n, capital N divided by 2, minus 1, such that we obtain capital N divided by 2 submatrices. So, for instance, the submatrix for n equals to 0 would contain the elements of Fa of the first row and the last row. For bigger n, the submatrices contain the non-zero elements of the corresponding rows in between for n equals to 1, the second row, and the row 1 before the last row. In this way, we reduced our bigger matrix into several smaller, simple matrices. And the inverse of the submatrices is easily obtained in closed form. And we have here. Observe that the, den the denominator is the negative determin determinant of the submatrix. The corresponding submatrices for the synthesis are given here. And by setting them equal, we get a solution for perfect reconstruction. So we have the submatrix for synthesis equal to this one, what we calculated here. And this would be the solution for the perfect reconstruction. Here we can see that if we choose the determinant to be minus 1, the denominator to be 1, then we get the identical analysis and synthesis prototype filters up to the sign and not necessarily para-unitary polyphase matrices. If we choose the determinant equals to minus 1, then the comparison of the submatrices shows that g of n is equal to minus h of n for n going from 0 to 2, capital N minus 1. And this means that the analysis and the synthesis window must be identical if the determinant is equal to minus 1 for perfect reconstruction. This must be true for every submetrics. So in conclusion, if we design our window h of n such that the determinant is equal to minus 1, then we would, we would automatically obtain perfect reconstruction if we choose g of n is equal to minus h of n. 
We've seen that if we design our window h of n such that the determinant is equal to minus 1, then we would automatically obtain perfect reconstruction if we choose g of n equals to minus h of n. So observe that this is a very powerful result. It tells us how to obtain perfect reconstruction, including the cancellation of all aliasing components, even though we didn't even look at them. But it comes up a question. Is this now also an orthogonal, or rather a para-unitary matrix? So let's see. For a para-unitary polyphase matrix H of C, meaning H to the power of minus 1 of C is equal to H transpose of C minus 1, we already have an orthogonal matrix T, which in this case of real valued matrix also means uh, orthogonality. So T to the power of minus 1 is equal to T, T transposed. Hence T is also para-unitary. For real or complex valued matrix, orthogonality and para-unitary is the same. Now we check the delay matrix. For DZ, the transpose is identical to the original since it's a diagonal matrix. Remember, we have the DZ, the delay, the, the delay matrix, even here, and we have this diagonal. And if we replace Z by Z to the power of minus 1, and then we take the transpose, and we will get D of Z here. And if we multiply those two matrices, we will get the identity. This means that also the delay matrix is para-unitary. Now we must check the folding matrix. If we now design a FA such that it's um, orthonormal, so with FA to the power of minus 1 is equal to FA transpose, then the entire polyphase matrix is made of this multiplication of the folding matrix times the delay matrix times the T matrix will become para-unitary. Yes, using this property here. So here we have the H transpose of C to the power of minus 1 is equal to the FA times the delay matrix C to the power of minus 1 times T transposed. And we'll have this result here. Since our transform matrix and folding matrix are orthonormal, we have the T, T transpose is equal to the inverse of T, T to the power of minus 1, and the FA transpose is equal to the FA the inverse, the f to the power of minus 1, we see that our analysis poly polyphase matrix is indeed peri-unitary. And we have that the h that the transpose of c to the power of minus 1 is equal to inverse of h in c. This means that if we ensure that every matrix of our product is peri-unitary, the product is also peri-unitary. So what does this mean for analysis uh, for our analysis folding matrix FA? We know now that in our special case of an orthonormal folding matrix, we have the property that the inverse of FA is equal to FA transposed, which we can also apply to our submatrices. And how do we get our matrix FA orthonormal? Well, we take our general inverse and set it equal to the transposed matrix. And that's what we are doing here. Now when we assume that we have the determinant uh, equals to minus 1, then we will have this result here. And we can see that the left side is the result of the inversion and the right hand side is the result of transposing. So looking at the two matrices with n going from 0 to n capital N minus 1, we see that h of n is equal to h of 2, capital, 2 times capital N minus 1 minus uh, N. And this means that we have a symmetric window, symmetric around its center. So it looks the same forward and backwards. If uh, this is the case, then also the FA is para-unitary. To summarize, if we have the determinant of our 2 by 2 submatrices to be equal to minus 1 as part of the design process, then the baseband impulse responses for analysis and synthesis, they are identical with this sign. So h of n is equal minus g of n. 
if we also would like to have orthogonality or para-unitarity, we need symmetric baseband impulse response, and we have f h of n is equal to minus g of n, and h of n is equal to h of the 2 times capital N minus 1 minus n. And these are two important properties which we obtain for our baseband impulse responses. A simple example for this case, where the determinant is equal to minus 1 and orthogonality, is the sign window. And the sign window is given here. This case also leads to para-unitary polyphase matrices because it is a symmetric window, symmetric around its center. The sign window is often used in the MDCT filter bank because it's easy to design. We know it leads to perfect reconstruction and still has a reasonable frequency response. For instance, the raised cosine window would even have a better frequency response, but it would not lead to perfect reconstruction if it's also used for the synthesis. So it does not fulfill the condition that the determinant should be equal to minus one. For perfect reconstruction, we need to compute a different synthesis prototype. So, para-unitarity is good for, a, for an easy design for perfect reconstruction. So, remark that for para-unitary polyphase matrices, Parseval's theorem for the energy conservation still holds, so in the limit of long sequences, meaning that the total energy in the signal in the time domain is equal to the total energy in all subbands. This can be used, for example, for the estimation of the energy of the quantization error in the reconstructed signal, or the total energy of quantization error in the subbands is equal to the energy of the quantization error in the reconstructed signal. This is important, for instance, for design quantizers. Observe that we don't necessarily need the symmetry of our baseband impulse response. If we only have the, the, the determinant condition that the determinant is equal to minus one, we still have h of n is equal to minus g of n, but they don't need to be symmetric. In this case, Parseval's theorem does not need to hold, but it can still hold approximately. Observe the factor of c to the power of minus one, which we obtained in the inversion of the delay matrix D of Z to obtain causal filters. This means we get a delay of one block and it is the source of the algorithm or the system delay and of our analysis and synthesis filter bank. If the synthesis follows directly after the analysis filter bank. In general, the system delay is the blocking delay of N minus one samples to assemble the signal into blocks of length n, plus the delay needed to make our matrices causal. And this is a very important result. It's telling us that the system delay is equal to the blocking delay of n minus one samples. It's necessary to assemble the signal into blocks of length n, plus the delay needed to make our matrices causal. In the case of the MDCT, we get a block delay of uh, n minus one, plus the delay from our delay matrix, which results in a total delay of two times capital N minus one samples. In the MDCT case, our filter length is L equals to two times N. Hence, our total or our system delay can also be written as ND equals to L, yeah, the filter length, minus one. We see that the delay is coupled to the filter length. This is true in general for orthogonal or para-unitary filter banks, and also for longer filters we obtain uh, nd is equal to l minus one. This is one of the drawbacks of orthogonal uh, filter banks. To obtain lower delay, we need to take non-orthogonal or non-para-unitary matrices. So non-para-unitary matrices or filter banks can have some important advantages, but they are more difficult to design. We are reaching the end of this tutorial and now we are going to take a look at the Python implementation of the MDCT, first the analysis and later the synthesis. In this example we are going to use an audio file from this band from Brazil called Double Cross. You can check them out in Spotify and in Instagram or here you can click and check them out. 
we are going to use a song from their first EP. It's called uh, the song is called Paganizer. Oh, that's great stuff. They are very kind to let me use their audio in this uh, tutorial. So you should check them out if you like the sound. And here, so we are using um, Librosa to import this uh, MP3 file. We're just printing here the number of samples. Now we are defining the number of subbands. And we use uh, 1024 subbands. Here is the sign window for the MGCT. And here we're just plotting the sign window. So next, we are calculating the folding matrix using this FA matrix that we've seen before. And here is the window. We are also having here the delay matrix T of C. And then we are multiplying the FA matrix by this delay matrix and we have this FA of C. So now we are converting the input signal X, which is the audio samples from the Paganizer song from Double Cross. And we are converting this into a polyphase row vector for blocks of length n. And we see that we will have 8822 blocks. So then we are multiplying this um, polyphase vector by this FAZ polyphase matrix and we have this y of p. Well here we have uh, L is the number of blocks that we calculated here. Here we are having the DCT4 and then we are applying the DCT4 transform to the rows of this uh, y of p that we have here. And then here is the resulting spectrogram image of this process. Here's the y of p. And you observe that we have the highest frequencies uh, at the small subband in this escape. And we have only 8,822 blocks. So we are dividing this number here by 1,024. This gives us the number of blocks. And this is the MDCT for the analysis. From the critically sampled version, we can go back to the original time domain using the synthesis MDCT. So this is what we're looking at. This is the MDCT synthesis filter bank. And we want to achieve the perfect reconstruction. So what we're doing now is we're computing the inverse folding matrix for the synthesis, FS. And we're doing here. Then we are applying the inverse transform for which the DCT4 is identical to the forward transform. We are applying the DCT4 inverse transform to the rows and we have it here. Then we are calculating the inverse delay matrix with delay, which is here. Then we're multiplying the inverse delay matrix with delay. And we have this pole map mode that we seen before. And then we are multiplying the synthesis folding matrix fs with the y of p and then we have the x reconstructed p so here it's a polyphase signal and we are going to use polyphase to x to convert the polyphase input signal into a contiguous row factor so this is what we're doing now we have this x rec p and we are applying this polyphase to x now before we had an x rec p with these dimensions and then we convert from polyphase to X. We have this here. And here we can plot the original, which is in blue, and the reconstructed, which is in orange. And uh, we see that there is a delay of 1024 samples. So if I introduce this 1024 samples, we have perfect reconstruction with this delay of 1024 samples between the original and the reconstruct signal, which is the system delay without the blocking delay, since the signal is already in memory. That's it for our tutorial. I hope uh, it was useful.
and don't forget to check out the sound this double cross and I hope to use much more of um, their songs in the um, next tutorials. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the UMNL University of Technology. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this tutorial we will talk about low delay filter banks. So let's get started. Last time we saw that an MDCT type filter bank leads to an algorithmic delay of z to the power of minus 1 in the lower sampling rate, hence a delay of one block over the analysis and also synthesis filter bank. Remember, z to the power of minus 1 came from making the inverse delay matrix D of z causal. In addition to this one block, we usually need to take into account the so-called blocking delay, which results from assembling our incoming samples into blocks of length n. We first have to wait for n minus 1 incoming samples on the analysis side, and at the arrival of the nth sample, the block is full, and we can send it immediately to um, immediately to further processing. Hence, the blocking delay is n minus one samples. Observe that we have no blocking delay on the synthesis side. This means that the total delay is both this blocking delay plus the delay resulting from our matrices. In the case of our MDCT type future bank, the total delay, or so-called the system delay, is our blocking delay of n minus one samples plus one block delay from the polyphase matrices, and is given by here the n d. So it's um, our blocking delay of n minus one plus one block delay from the polyphase matrices. So we have uh, we also have the length of our filter l equals to two n which results in the system delay to be the length of the filters minus 1. This relation uh, holds in general for para-unitary filter banks. Observe that mathematically it only makes sense to define a delay over the entire analysis and synthesis filter bank because here we have the exact same signal as the input signal, just delay. After only the analysis, we only have subband signals which look differently and have a different sampling rate. Hence, here we cannot really define a delay. For para-unitary filter banks, the only possibility to, to reduce the system delay is to reduce the filter length. But this also degrades the filter characteristics. For instance, it would lead to reduced stop band attenuation. Often in applications like real-time audio communications, it is desirable to have a lower end-to-end -end delay, but also good filters with high stop band attenuation, uh, such that we will still obtain a good coding or compression performance. There, the solution are the so-called low delay filter banks. With them, it is possible to reduce the system delay without reducing the filter length L. And how does this work? Or first, how do we get longer filters than the MDCT type filter banks in the first place. For MDCT type filter banks, we only had filters of length L equals to 2N. So how do we make them longer? To see a solution, we first need to take a look at the polyphase matrix again, this time for filters of arbitrary length, so more than 2 times N. We again compute our folding matrix of it using this equation here, so FA times D of C, equals to h of c times t to the power of minus 1. As for the MDCT type filter banks, just that now our analysis polyphase matrix h of z can contain base band impulse responses h of n, uh, a of n with arbitrary length l, and l can be much larger than 2 times n here. So the resulting form of our analysis folding uh, matrix is the same as for the MDCT um, type filter banks, but with higher degree polynomials in it as expected. So here we have our uh, analysis folding matrix. We still have 
you tie them on shape and over here we have a H um, N down sampled given by this equation here so we have one and two which are the the Z transforms of the down sampled by two versions of our uh, baseband prototype H of A and here we have the Z transforms for the analysis at phase N and the minus sign in um, minus z to the power of 2 results from our cosine modulation function changing its sign every second block. So here are these equations, they are from these um, transactions on signal processing from Professor Schuller, new framework for perfect reconstruction future banks. So observe that this, uh, that this uh, fa of z corresponds to our fa times d of z and observe that the order of the polyphase uh, polynomials determines the resulting filter length of our filter bank if the highest uh, exponent is m then our filters have length m plus one blocks of two times n here since we have a down sample of two times capital n or the length of m minus one times two times capital N. Here we can observe two effects. One is that the shape of our analysis folding matrix has again the diamond shape, we've seen before, and second that the polynomials in it now have a higher order depending on the length of our filters. For the MDCT type with L equals to 2 times N, we still get an easy solution here. But what about longer filters? Our goal is still to obtain a perfect reconstruction and also to obtain finite impulse response filters for our synthesis to make it easier to handle. The approach now is to use our previous matrix decomposition, writing our polyphase matrices as a product of simpler matrices and simply extend this product with additional matrices such that we keep the diamond shape of our resulting folding matrix intact because this was the result of our cosine modulation which would we would like to keep it intact uh, such that we increase the polynomial order and hence the resulting filter length such that we get easy FIR inverses and such that we can control the resulting system delay. The trick now is to invent additional matrices which fulfill these requirements. These additional matrices can be split into separate types. The first type is the so-called zero delay matrix, which is given here. It has an inverse, which is already causal, so we don't need a delay to make it causal. So here is the inverse. So in SimPy, we can create this matrix, so I'm importing from SimPy, there, all, everything. From NumPy, then I'm creating the symbols for Z. I'm creating symbols for the coefficients E. So this coefficient E here. And then we're having our a zero delay matrix, which indeed if we see here is identical to this one here. And we get we obtain the inverse by making e to the power of minus 1 and then we have the inverse and we see that this is indeed the form as above. We can now multiply our analysis polyphase folding matrix 1 to the analysis folding matrix 1 with the zero delay matrix and get polynomials of higher order because we have elements with z to the power of minus 1 in it. The synthesis polyphase matrix is multiplied by this inverse to still obtain perfect reconstruction. Since the inverse also has polynomials of degree 1, it is still FIR. Also, since the inverse is already causal, we don't need any multiplication with z to the power of minus 1 to make it causal, and hence no additional delay. This means if we use this matrix, we can increase the filter length, but don't increase the delay. In principle, we can repeat this process as often as we like and get arbitrarily a high filter length, but no increase in delay. So zero delay matrices increase the filter block length by one block, 
but don't increase the system delay. We will increase the filter length by one block because the increase of the order of the polynomials by one, which corresponds to one block. There is a second type of matrix with the same properties where we simply use the other half of the diagonal. And we have it here. Its causal and inverse is given here. So contrary to diagonal matrices where we need to take the inverse of each element of the diagonal, here we obtain the inverse by flipping the diagonal half and by flipping just the sign which keeps it causal. So we are flipping the sign and we are flipping the diagonal half. Let's take a look at a Python SymPy example. We would like to see how the product P of A of C um, is equal to F A times T of C times G of Z of our folding matrix F A of C with the zero delay matrix G of Z uh, look like. So here I'm importing SymPy, I'm defining symbols for Z, symbols for G, and symbols for H. Here is our FA matrix, here is the D matrix, here is the G matrix, so we're just printing them here. And here we have the multiplication of a, FA times D times G, it's given here. And we can see that this is indeed the diamond shaped uh, form of equation 1, but when we compare it with equation 1, we could now read out the resulting final baseband prototype filter for the analysis H of A. Observe that equation 1 is for an even number of uh, zero delay matrices. For odd numbers, as in this example, we would need to flip the matrix in equation 1 horizontally, so uh, flip left to right. So now we don't specify H of A in our design process, but we will start with our coefficients for our matrices and obtain a baseband prototype filter H of A with the desired length and delay properties. What is a possible drawback of the zero delay matrices? If we only increase the filter length with our zero delay matrices, we can observe that the far off attenuation increases easily a clear improvement over the MDCT case. But the nearby attenuation to the neighboring subbands increase not as much as for orthogonal filter banks with similar length but with more delay. Hence, it can make sense to also increase the system delay to obtain filters with higher nearby attenuation more easily. This leads us to a matrix which is very efficient in, uh, very efficient in increasing the system delay the opposite of zero delay matrices. The so-called maximum delay matrices. They basically result from exchanging z to the power um, of minus one by z in our zero delay matrices and a multiplication of z to the power of minus one to make them causal. So this is what we are doing here. This is one type of matrix. Each matrix in our cascade has its own coefficients. The order type is given here. Their inverse need a multiplication with z to the power of minus 2 to make it causal, and is correspondingly this one here and this one here with the multiplication of z to the power of minus 2. Here we can see that the matrix and its inverse leads to n blocks of delay. So we have here and here. Observe that the maximum delay matrices have a polynomial order of 1, just like the zero delay matrices, and hence increases the filter length by one block, but increases the delay by two blocks. This is twice as much as for an orthogonal filter bank. Using only maximum delay matrices would result in similar frequency responses as with only zero delay matrices. The impulse response would only appear time reversed. We get increased nearby attenuation only if we mix both type of matrices. Orthogonal filter banks can be obtained if we use the same number of maximum delay and zero delay matrices. Our result in polyphase matrix for the analysis then becomes this product, given here, where H of M is either the H1 of C if P is even or H2 
of z if b is odd. For the synthesis polyphase matrix, we get the inverse product, and the result is given here. Now we can design the impulse response length and the system delay of our filter bank. The total number of our zero delay and maximum delay matrices determines the length of our impulse response, including the effect of the FA times Z of Z matrix, a length of N blocks, and we obtain a total filter length equals to L equals to 2 plus Q plus P times N. And just the number of maximum delay matrix HM of C determines the system delay, including the effects of the matrix multiplication FA times D to the power of C and the blocking delay with a delay of 2 times capital N minus 1 and we obtain a system delay equals to ND with 2 times N minus 1 plus 2 times Q times N. Each zero delay and maximum delay matrix increases the impulse response length by one block of N samples and each maximum delay matrix increases the system delay by n blocks, so 2 times n samples. In this case, starting with the MDCT delay of 2 times capital N minus 1 samples. It is also possible to start with a lower delay than an MDCT by setting the leading samples of the MDCT type part to zero. Observe that we obtain the same analysis and synthesis baseband impulse response if the de determinants of our submatrix of our polyphase matrix are equal to minus 1 as seen before. If we look at the zero delay matrices, we find that the determinant of the submatrices is already equal to minus 1, and it's very practical. If we look at the maximum delay matrices, we see that the their determinant of the submatrices is minus z to the power of minus 2 which is their resulting delay contribution and a factor of minus 1, which has the same effect of leading to the same analysis and synthesis impulse responses. All we need to do now is to make sure that the matrix FA has a determinant of minus 1 in their submatrices to obtain identical analysis and synthesis baseband impulse responses. This means that the number of unknown coefficients for the folding matrix FA is going down from uh, 2 times capital N to 2 times capital N minus capital N divided by 2. So the remaining capital N divided by 2 coefficients come out of the determinant equals 2 minus 1 condition. This also makes the design easier because then we only need to optimize one side of our filter bank. For instance, the analysis side, and we have a reduced number of coefficients. We need a numeric optimization because we now have a long cascade of product with many unknown coefficients in the FA folding matrix, the zero delay and the maximum delay matrices. We need to optimize them such that we obtain a good frequency response for the resulting impulse response. We can use equation one in this lecture and our product for the folding matrix FALC without the transform matrix T to read out the resulting baseband impulse response HA of N. We can then compute the resulting frequency response and use that as a function to optimize towards some optimum frequency response, for instance, an ideal low-pass filter as the prototype. An example application of this type of filter bank is uh, the audio coder enhanced low delay AAC in MPEG-4. And here it is used to obtain a lower encoding and decoding delay. For low delay filter banks, it is useful to process the samples as they come from the sound card. Hence, we need a different implementation, an implementation which is not based on the signal already in memory. To obtain it, we interpret the z to the power of minus 1 as a delay by one sample and implement it using a memory element which stores or delays samples for one sampling interval. So the delay matrix D of C, for instance, for instance, can be implemented as follow in Python. We will now take a look at the real-time MDCT or low delay filter bank implementation, producing a waterfall spectrogram including the synthesis filter bank and playback of the reconstructed signal. 
For that, we are going to, to use a NumPy, SciPy signal, Pi audio, and uh, just IPy widgets to so some controls of the GUI. We are going to use CV2 this time, OpenCV, to plot our spectrogram. Here we are defining some signal processing parameters such as the number of subbands and the block size, uh, the number of audio channels, the sampling rate, and here are some parameters to plot our spectrogram. At this point we are defining our D of C matrix. Here is the inverse of the DLC matrix. Here is the F A F matrix. Here is the inverse F matrix. And here is the DCT4 transform. And here is the complete MDCT analysis. So the inverse MDCT is the synthesis. And we have here. So here we have all the elements required to have a complete MDCT analysis and synthesis filter banks. Here I'm just defining a GUI so we can control uh, our spectrogram start and stop. I'm running on a separate thread so we can have the Pi audio working with audio, OpenCV working with image and we can still access our buttons. So here is the function to plot the um, DCT. So uh, as usual, we read the audio input stream into data. The blocks of length are equal to chunk size. Here we will shift a frame up for our spectrogram. Here is the analysis MDCT of the input. Here we can do some processing if we want. Here we are defining for our waterfall color mapping and we are defining our frames for our OpenCV here we are displaying the frames then we are taking the inverse or the synthesis MDCT to get a reconstructed uh, signal and then we write the samples as uh, audio stream and here when we stop the OpenCV we want to um, release the capture. So here is just a thread that I'm running this function here. And here we will start the audio. And here we will display the, the buttons to start. So now if I start, hello, we have here our MDCT spectrogram. And then we stop and this is our demo hello there and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing this is a course offered by professor Schuller at the Humanao University of Technology I am Renato the instructor for these online materials and on this notebook we'll talk about optimization of future banks so let's get started our goal is to obtain a filter bank from our structure or our product uh, it's the folding matrix times the delay matrix and so on which has good subband filters for example good or sufficient stop band attenuation and not much pass band attenuation an example could be a desired stop band attenuation of minus 6 db and a pass band attenuation of less than minus 3 db so what's the problem to solve the coefficients which determine the frequency response are the coefficients in our cascade or our product and are the coefficients in our matrices. They result in the frequency response in a non-linear way, hence the usual filter design approach, they don't work here. So previous approach like uh, the Remes exchange algorithm, for example. So those traditional filter design methods or algorithms can also be seen as an optimization algorithms for more or less linear problems or maybe quadratic if we take the mean squared error. We know that we can read out the resulting analysis based band prototype impulse response HA of N 
for instance, by computing the sparse folding matrix of the product given here. Without the transform matrix T. And then if we compare it to um, equation one from uh, lesson 14, it was this matrix shown here with this diamond shape. And then in this way, we can obtain a H A of N and hence its frequency response from our matrix coefficients. So we can do the same for the synthesis size, or if we restrict that our matrices to have the determinant equals to minus one, and then in this case, the synthesis baseband impulse response is the same as for the analysis. Another possibility to obtain the analysis baseband impulse response is to compute the polyphase matrix uh, P A of C, and in the first column contains the polyphase elements of the first subband filter in reverse order. And this can be used to read out its impulse response H0 of N. And then to obtain the H A of N, we simply divide H0 of N by the modulation function for the first subband for K equals to zero. So what's our approach? Since we now have this non-linear dependency of our baseband impulse response uh, from the matrix coefficients, we need to use some more powerful optimization algorithms which are made for just mostly uh, convex error functions. We first will define an error function and then we will use an optimization algorithm to minimize this error function. This error function can be the sum of the magnitudes or the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of the differences between our obtained frequency response, given our unknown variables at some point, and our desired frequency response. To give the stop band attenuation and the pass band ripples different weights, we can also assign weights to the different frequency regions for our error function. So our starting point is a vector of all our unknowns of our matrices. So this is vector, it's called x. And now we define a function in which computes the baseband impulse response out of these unknowns by multiplying our matrices to obtain our final folding matrix or the polyphase matrix. And then we read out the baseband impulse response. So this then yields to a baseband prototype for our coefficient set x, which we will call hx of n. And this is now used to compute a weighted frequency response at k frequency points with weights w, y for each frequency point. So this is given here. And you can see more at this paper from the um, IEEE uh, transactions of signal on signal processing, new framework for modulated perfect reconstruction filter banks by Professor Schuller and Smith. For instance, we can use FRAC-C to compute h i uh, by default, it computes 412 equally spaced frequency points, and then we multiply this h of i with the weights w of i. And we choose as many frequency points as necessary to sufficiently cover our frequency response. Usually, it should be several times the length of our filter to avoid sampling the frequency response accidentally near its zeros. So the more important frequency points in terms of attenuation, they will get higher weights. The same can be also done for the synthesis, but remember that this is only necessary if we don't have the determinant equals to minus one, because when we have the determinant equals to minus one, we obtain identical prototype impulse responses for both the analysis and the synthesis so we only need to optimize the analysis. Well, we can see this, uh, we've seen this on lectures 13 and lectures 14. We also need to have a vector containing the weighted desired frequency response, which would be uh, one for the pass band multiplied by the corresponding weights and zeros in the stop band. And we'll call this D uh, for desired. So when we have all of these, our error function of our vector of unknown x will be, for example, this equation here. And we have a row times column vector. 
now we just need to minimize this function f of x with respect to our vector of unknowns x and this uh, leads us to uh, optimization problem in general the goal of uh, optimization is to find the vector x which minimizes the error function f of x we know that in a minimum the function's derivative is equal to zero so the derivative of this function with respect to x is when it's equal to zero we have a minimum so an approach to iteratively find the zero of a function is called the Newton's method. Take for example some function f of x, where x is not a vector but just a number, and then we can find its zero as described here in this picture. We start at some starting point, and then we calculate some tangent, then we get next point, and then we calculate tangent, and so on and so forth in this iteration so x k plus 1 is equal to x k minus f x k divided by the derivative of 4 k equal to 0 1 2 and so on observe that sometimes we need to compute the derivative numerically by evaluation the function a few times in the neighborhood so for example we will compute the delta f divided by delta x for a small delta x and there are more involved methods for it so now we want to find the zero not for f of x but for the derivative so hence we simply replace f of x by f prime x and we obtain this iteration here so now we have a xk plus 1 is equal to xk minus the first derivative divided by the second derivative so to obtain a minimum not a maximum we need the condition that the second derivative is greater than zero. So let's um, take a look into an example for finding a zero of a function using what we just seen. So in this example, we will compute the square root of two numerically by finding the zero of the function f of x is equal to x squared minus two. We know that the solution of this function is square a root of 2. So now we apply the Newton's method to find the solution numerically. So we com we take for the first derivative, that's going to be 2 times x, and then we calculate this Newton's iteration from this formula, and then we will get what we want. So in Python we will start with a value uh, of 1, for example, so x is equal to 1, this is our starting point, and then we will do this iteration. So this is what we have here, x, x minus x squared minus 2 divided by 2x. And we see that the true value for the square root of 2 is given here. And only three iterations we obtain this value uh, with six-digit accuracy. Another example is, for example, is to find the minimum of the cosine of x. We know uh, the minimum is, uh, of this cosine of x is at x is equal to pi. So this is also a way to numerically determine pi. Now we have that f of x is the cosine. So the first derivative is minus sine. And the second derivative is minus cosine. So now our Newton update. Yeah, so x new is equals to x old minus the first derivative divided by the second derivative. And then we'll have that the sine divided by the cosine. And we can also do this uh, in Python. Well, this time our starting point will be equals to 3. And then we will run this iteration where x new equals to x old minus the sine divided by the cosine. And we see that this iteration indeed converts to pi. Uh, and it computes pi is equal to uh, 3.14 with an accuracy of 10 digits after only two iterations. So we can see this if we start our starting point is equals to 3 and then we will do the Newton update and we have 3.14. So if we start uh, x uh, equals to 1, our starting point, it will converge to 0 which is a maximum of our function. So this is what we had before, 
So it converges to zero with some rounding errors, of course. So we have uh, here three uh, iterations. And we, we see that it converges to zero, which is a maximum of our function, and which also has the first derivative as zero. So this is a very important point because this shows that we still need to check the second derivative to see if it is a minimum or a maximum. If we start uh, with x um, is 100, and then we will get that it converts to 32 times pi, which is a minimum, but perhaps is not the expected minimum. So this shows that the starting point it's very important for the Newton's method. It's very important usually for optimization algorithms. For a multidimensional function, where the argument is x is a vector, not a number, the first derivative is a vector called gradient, and it has the symbol nabla. And now we need the derivative with respect to each element of the argument vector x. So this is our function. This is not a number now, this is a vector. So the gradient of this function is given by this vector here. And we have the derivative of the function with respect to x1, x2, and so on and so forth until we reach xn, where n is the number of unknowns in our vector x. For the second derivative, we need to take each element of the gradient vector and again take the derivative to each element uh, of the argument vector. Hence, we obtain a matrix, and this is called a Hesse matrix, and it's a matrix of second derivative given here. Observe that this Hesse matrix is symmetric for reasonable function uh, that we consider like continuous functions. And uh, using these definitions, we can generalize our Newton algorithm to the multi-case, multi-dimensional case. So the one-dimensional case was given by this iteration here, but now it will turn into the multi-dimensional iteration. So this is not a number now, we're dealing with vectors. So we see here, this is the inverse of the Hess matrix, and here is the gradient of the function, and these are our vectors. For a minimum, this Hess matrix must be positive, definite, so all eigenvalues are positive. The problem here is that for the Hesse matrix, we need to compute n squared second derivatives, which can be computational too complex, and then we need to invert this matrix. So what we can do is to, simpl to make a um, simplifying assumption that the Hesse matrix can be written as a diagonal matrix with constant values on the diagonal. Observe that this is mostly a very, very crude approximation but since we have an iteration with small, uh, with many small updates, it can still work. So now we will assume that this has a matrix is uh, one divided by alpha times the identity. And the best value of alpha depends on how good it approximates the has a matrix. Hence, now our iteration will go from this with this inverse of the S matrix and the gradient, and it will turn with this crude approximation to this one here. So we have x of uh, x new is equal to x old minus alpha times the gradient of the function. And you see now that those are vectors. And this is much simpler to compute than this one here. And this is also called the steepest um, descent because the gradient tells us the direction of the steepest descent, or is also called the gradient descent. This is a very important method used in many machine learning uh, applications and on deep learning and so on. We see that the update of x consists only of the gradient scaled by a factor alpha. So in each step, we reduce the value of f of x by moving x in the direction of the gradient. If we make alpha larger, we obtain larger update steps and hence quicker convergence to a minimum, but it may oscillate around the minimum. For smaller alpha, the steps become smaller, but will converge more precisely to the minimum. 
Because of the update direction along the gradient, this method is also called gradient descent. Let's take a look at an example to see in practice what we've just discussed. So in this example, we will find the two-dimensional minimum of this function, given here, which is a function of x1 and x2, and it's the cosine of x1 minus the sine of x2. So the gradient of this function is minus sine of x1 and minus cosine of x2. In Python, we will um, have the same approach, so we will have a starting point um, and then we also set an alpha and we have this iteration. So in this case, alpha is equal to 1 and the starting point will be 2 and 2. And what we have here after some three iterations is a value of pi and a value of pi divided by 2. So we see that the minimum is obtained for x1 as uh, 3.1459 and so on. So this is the exact value of pi, and this is what we got. And x2 is the exact value, is given here, and we obtain this. So we observe that uh, we needed three iterations to obtain nine-digit accuracy in this two-dimensional case. For the one-dimensional case with the Newton iteration, we needed only two iterations to get the same accuracy. So now we can move on to uh, an example for the optimization of an MDCT, a future bank, using every the uh, all the theory and some examples that we see during this tutorial. So we will define a function that we'll call optimum fun MDCT that will contain an optimiz optimization of the band baseband prototype with the determinant equals to minus one for a given number of subbands. So maybe, for example, we'll see for n equals to 4 and n equals to 16. So we start importing our libraries. We're going to use NumPy. We're going to use SciPy, optimize SciPy signal. And we are going to use a matplotlib pyplot to plot. We will use again this function that we um, used many times before. So this is a function that multiplies two polynomial matrices. We've seen this in previous tutorials. We have our delay matrix. We've also seen in previous tutorials. Then we have this um, function to produce the folding matrix F. And we also seen this before. And then we will have a function that is extracts the uh, analysis base band impulse response from this folding matrix of a cosine modulated future bank and we'll put all of this together. So let's we'll start with n equals to 4, so this is the number of subbands, and then we will have our starting point is a vector of random numbers. So we'll generate these uh, values for this vector randomly. So then we calculate our folding matrix FA using this vector with the initialized uh, values generated randomly. Then we also compute here our delay matrix. We will, go, we will get our FA of C by multiplying these two. Then we will have our impulse uh, response by reading out this um, extracting these coefficients from our FA folding matrix. So this is what we are doing here. So then we are plotting our initial impulse response from this vector that was randomly initialized. So this will be our starting point. And then we'll take the initial frequency response from this starting vector x. We'll plot it. Then we will plot our desired frequency response. In this case, our desired frequency response is calculated here. So we will have ones for the pass band and zeros uh, for the um, 
stop then and we will also have a transition then and then we will plot the desired frequency response we will also plot the weights as we've seen before we need to give weights to have our error function and later on we will define our error function so the our error function for example can be the difference between the desired frequency response and the uh, frequency response that we have and we'll multiply with the weights and then we'll sum these values but we will see this later so first here is the initial impulse response from this starting vector x0 so these are random numbers then we get the response so it looks like this this is the desired frequency response so what we will do is that we will change the values and do this optimization so that this tries to approximate this and here we have our weights so our weights we will give we give high values to the stop pen and zero to the pass pen and we have here a transition band so this is the the principle so now we are defining our optim, optimum funk mdct so this will compute the error function for the future band optimization for coefficients x a 1d array with n subbands so we are doing the same what we are doing here but in the end here we have our error it will be the sum of the absolute value of the frequency response minus the desired frequency response times the weights so this is our error so up until here we are doing the same that we done here and now we calculate the error and this function will return the error so now we will use this function so if we want to see for example n equals to 4 so we will initialize our starting vector and this will print the starting error so it will calculate this error for this initial value then we want to find the x minimum so we are calling here this optimize minimize and it will minimize this error so we are passing this function here with this starting optimization factor here and the argument is the number of subbands we are passing here and then we will print this uh, minimize optimize coefficients we can also save them and this will be the error after the optimization so after we find this minimum we calculate the error and this is uh, we will see now the from this vector which is the minimum with the minimum error this is the optimized coefficients we do again the same procedure so we calculate our folding matrix we multiply the folding matrix with the delay matrix then we get we read out the impulse response from the folding matrix and we will plot the um, resulting impulse response and the resulting frequency response so when we run the cell I also want to see how much time it will take so I'm including this Python uh, Jupyter notebook magic for this cell and we see we start this would be our random initialized vector or starting point and it has a starting error given here then this is some information given by our SciPy uh, sci signal optimize, uh, SciPy optimize minimize, and we have it here. So these are the optimized coefficients. So after we run here, it will be here, this x min. The error after optimization is this one. So we can see there is a difference here. And then with these optimized coefficients, we will get our impulse response and now we will plot the impulse response so it went from something like this to this and something like a initial frequency response like this 
to this frequency response here. And it took 20 seconds to calculate this optimization. So it starts with random coefficients, it will print the resulting error value, then it optimizes the coefficients using the scipy optimize minimize. Then after it's finishing this optimization to print out the resulting error value, like we've seen before. And then we have here the resulting phase band prototype and its magnitude frequency response, which we see here. And we observe that this resulting baseband impulse response is very similar to the sine window, but not exactly the same because it is more optimal in our optimization function sense. So this was for n equals to 4. We can also see n equals to 8. So we can run uh, our, our cells. Let's do this. So it's calculating. This was the starting error. So we see it takes uh, more time than with four subbands. Now here is the result, and it took almost one minute, and it looks like this. And here is our uh, magnitude frequency response. And also for 16 subbands, it took one minute and almost two minutes, and we have our uh, optimized baseband impulse response for our optimized MDCT future bank. Here the impulse response, and here the magnitude of the frequency response in dB. So that's it uh, for today. This was our tutorial on the optimization for MDCT uh, Future Bank. And I see you on our next tutorial. Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humanal University of Technology. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this tutorial we will talk about neural networks. So the so-called convolutional neural networks, they are like cascaded future banks, but they have a nonlinear function at the output of each future and a constant offset. And you can read more about convolutional neural networks here in this tutorial from the internet. The coefficients of these uh, future banks, or when we're talking about neural networks and um, we're talking about weights, um, so the coefficients they are called weights. And this, um, the so-called neural networks, they simply use a weighted sum instead of convolution. So um, these are, for example, in a fully connected um, layers or dense layers. Instead of using convolution, they are the simple neural networks. So there are many different architectures and we um, are going to focus just on fully connected layer and convolutional layers. And you can read more about artificial neural networks here from Wikipedia and also on this book, um, An Introduction to Neural uh, Computing. Just an, an example of an application, you can take a look here on this um, work from Stanford. And it's uh, a nice application um, for image understanding. So all types of these types of um, uh, neural networks, they use several layers of cascading. When there are more than three layers, they are called deep neural networks, or they're called also the deep learning. So these are very current active uh, research areas, especially, for example, in speech recognition, um, image recognition. And a very popular example is the MNIST handwritten digit recognition described here on this tutorial from machine learning mastery and it's a handwritten digit recognition using convolutional neural networks in python with keras so we will talk more about convolutional neural networks we will talk more about keras and other alternatives to keras and other libraries 
So this example, uh, as most uh, neural network implementations, they use Python. And uh, here it's uh, using the library Keras, which is a library that is built on top of other libraries such as TensorFlow or Theano that used to be uh, used in the early days. And another is uh, very popular, it also is PyTorch. Each library has its own pros and cons. Um, Keras is a bit easier to use and you can achieve um, faster results uh, for simple, more simple models. But it also offers um, less uh, resources to the inner code. Um, TensorFlow and PyTorch, you can have access more easy to different parts of um, the mechanisms. But um, Keras is a great library for starting and to have um, fast prototyping of models and trying things out. Um, but uh, in this course, we are going to take a look at Keras using TensorFlow and in PyTorch. So, as we said before, there is a nonlinear function in the output of uh, the filters in a convolutional neural network, or there is um, a nonlinear function also in um, this neuron. And they are also called the activation functions. And one of them is the um, so-called sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function is a function that has this S shape and is given by this formula here. So it's defined by one divided by one plus e uh, to the power of minus x. And we see that we don't have any negative values. So we go from zero to one. And we can also um, plot this function in Python. And we have the sigmoid function here. So we see that it behaves like a soft limiter function. So the derivative of the sigmoid function is given here. And it's the e to the power of x divided by 1 plus x e to the power of x squared. And this is one activation function and the uh, other activation functions, for example, popular ones are the um, hyperbolic tangent, the 10h, or the ReLU, is the rectified linear uh, unit. And in this case, the ReLU will return x if x is greater than 0, and alpha times x if x is um, smaller than 0. And we also have different types of ReLU depending on the value of this alpha, so this alpha can be zero, this alpha can be a predetermined slope, uh, or it can be um, some value. So then we have leaky ReLU or parametric ReLU. So there are different, uh, and then we also have other activation functions. So you can see here in Keras, we have here uh, many different types of um, activation functions. So we have a ReLU, we have sigmoid, softmax, um, soft sign, hyperbolic tangent, the uh, scaled exponential, and the linear unit. So depending on the application, we can choose different activation functions. In the following diagram, we see a three-layer um, artificial neural network. And we have here, we have input layer, we have hidden layer, we have an output layer, and here we have our outputs. So here we have our weights, we have our nodes, or our neurons. In this example, we are using the sigmoid functions. So the values with index um, 0 are often assumed to be the biases. So they're fixed values. In general, we have several outputs in our neural network. So output k uh, is the nonlinear function of a sum given by q here. So the sum is the weighted sum from the hidden layer outputs h of j. So if we choose x0 equals to h0 equals to 1, such that we obtain a constant offset as part of the sum. We get 
is here. Then the output of the hidden layer, hj, is again a nonlinear function f of a sum of hn, hj. So we see here that we have our inputs and then there is this weights and then we have our hidden layer and then we have weights again and we can have many hidden layers here then we have our output layer and then we have our output and we see that the output is given by this sum and also the output of each hidden layer is also given by this sum from the inputs and we have these weights so the output of our neural network depends on the weights w and the inputs x so here we are assuming a fixed sigmoid function so if we assemble the inputs into a vector x which contains all the inputs and a vector of w which contains all the weights from the hidden and the output layer then we can uh, express the de dependency and then we can rewrite the output k so output 1, output 2, output 3 and so on output k as o k x and w so this is the output k so now we would like to train the network meaning that we would like to determine the weights such that if we present the neural network with a training pattern x the output produces a desired value. So for instance, if we present an image with an object in it, and the output indicates that the object was there um, with a desired output value. Hence, we have training inputs and we have desired outputs. So we will express B of K, and these desired outputs are also called the targets. Then we now use some optimization algorithm to update the weights W to obtain the outputs O of K as close as possible to the desired outputs D of K with a given input X. So what we do is we will have our desired output. We will we'll feed the network with some input. Then we have the multiplications and, and summations with weights and then a number of hidden layers and then we will get these um, outputs we want that this output is as close as possible as a desired output and then through some optimization we will adjust the weights and we'll keep doing this until we have that the, this side, the, the outputs of our model is as close as possible to our desired output For, in this, um, for this op optimization, we can use, for example, gradient descent. It's a very common optimization algorithm and all its variants in optimization, but also there are other optimization algorithms. So for the gradient descent, we start with an error function, delta. Even here. So this is the output k minus the desired k. And for example, one always positive error function is uh, its square. So this is also called the loss function. And in this particular choice, this is the mean squared error. So to this error function, we can now apply the gradient descent. But it's also called a stochastic gradient descent in our case of neural network training. So we have this that the x nu is equal to x old minus alpha times the gradient of x old. And in our case, now it will become it will become at the w nil, so the weights will be the w old minus alpha times the gradient of the error k depending on x and w old. So for the gradient nabla, we need to compute the derivative to each weight w of y of the weight vector w. So in our case, we can apply the chain rule so that the outer derivative times the inner derivative, and after this manipulation here, we get these equations 
the, the delta and the derivative with respect to the weight. So we have this delta k. And here we have the derivative with the respect to the weight. And here is the output. And we can compute this inner derivative first for the output weights. And again, we will use the chain rule. And finally, we will get this equation 4 here. So we have this equation 2, 3, and 4. So if we now plug this result 4 into equation 3 and equation 2, we obtain the update rule for the gradient descent for the output weights. So what we're doing is we're applying the chain rule, calculate derivatives, and then we will have this update rule that is uh, the weight OJ mu is equal to the weight OJ old minus alpha times delta k the vectors and w and the derivative of this s of OK times h of j. So this um, update rule is telling us that the update is equal alpha times output delta times output derivative times its input hj from the hidden nodes. We observe that they only have local processing for the update, which makes it suitable for massively parallel processing, for example, using a GPU or a graphics processing unit. For the hidden weights, the inner derivative of equation 3 becomes a bit more complicated. So we have here uh, the derivative with respect of the weights, output k. And then we have all these manipulations here. And we apply the chain rule. And we will finally get this equation here. And again, now we plug this result for the hidden weights, 5 into equations 3 and 2, and we obtain the update rule for the gradient descent for the hidden weights. And we have this equation 6, which tells us that the update is equal alpha times the backpropagated delta times derivative of hidden function times its input xy. So we've seen that we have all these uh, quite complicated ways to calculate them to get the update rules for our output weights and also for our the weights for the hidden units but once we pass this we can apply and uh, the libraries they have an automated way of calculating gradient and calculating the what is called the backpropagation. So that this algorithm is also called the backpropagation. And we need to do this update for each output node k. This is in principle the same rule as for the output nodes, just with its corresponding input and output. So this means that the backpropagation is just a consequence of applying the gradient descent algorithm to neural networks. And a, pro, a popular alternative to um, the gradient descent, or let's say a refinement of gradient descent in neural networks, it is the algorithm that's called Adam. And once again, we can look at the Keras documentation and we'll see that we have uh, this available algorithm for the stochastic gradient descent, RMS prop, Adam, Adagrad, and uh, those are very popular algorithms um, optimizers. So hence, for all nodes, we retain a local processing. So we just look at one node, call its input x of y, its output o, its weights w of y, and its desired output p. Then we obtain its output with this sum here, the sum of the weights times the inputs, and then the output is a function applied to this sum. So 
if it is an output node, the difference delta to the desired output D is given by O minus D. If it is a hidden node, we use the backpropagated delta from an output difference um, delta O weight to the output node W and sum for the output node S O. And like this. Then we get the local weight update given by this formula here. And this we can see in this diagram. So we have this is uh, inputs, we have weights, we have the sum, and this sum we apply a function into the sum. In this case, for example, the sigmoid. So the sigmoid is applied to the sum, and then we have the output. So the weight update to retrain uh, with the output difference delta. Here we will have a Python example for the MNIST digital recognition. We are not going to go through this code uh, completely in detail now. This is just an introduction to uh, neural networks and this is just to have um, an intuition about what's going on. So we will import our libraries, we are importing Keras dataset and this we are importing um, from Keras models we are using a sequential way of building our model. We are input um, we are having dense layers, we are having a layer that's called dropout. We are not going to detail about this now. So here we are loading our data set. So we will divide our data set in X train and Y train, X test and Y test. So we have our inputs and our targets. And here, for example, are just um, examples of images that are part of the data set and we have images with 28 pixels by 28 pixels and they are handwritten digits and our goal is that we can classify if this is a 0, this is a 1, this is a 5, this is a 4 for example. So it's very common in a machine learning um, experiments that we set um, a seed for a random value so we can uh, make the, this experiment reproducible. Otherwise, um, the results of our experiment is uh, highly influenced by the initial uh, values that we, how we start our model. So this way we will um, generate the same random numbers um, every time. Then we also will do some uh, reshaping so these um, libraries, they expect a certain shape. And also, we are flattening our image. So here we have uh, 28 by 28, and we will have uh, one flat um, flattened vector. We are also converting, we are normalizing our inputs. So they go from the value from 0 to 255, and we are just normalizing it so it goes from 0 to 1. We are encoding our outputs as what's called a one-hot encode. This is a, a way that we can encode our outputs. Here we are defining our model, so this is a sequential, so the layers are given in sequence, and we are using dense layers or they are fully uh, connected layers. So it's uh, the same as we've seen before. So we are not using convolution um, layers, we are using fully connected layers and we are using um, the activation we are using to be the value and for the last layer here we are using a softmax. A softmax is usually used when we have this classification with them. Um, so we want to classi classify nine different digits so uh, we have nine different a possibility and we will use this softmax activation and our loss is the categorical uh, cross entropy also used in this kind of problems now after we define our model we will compile and then we'll have our model and then we will fit the model so it's called we are training 
you will give the input which is the target of the training this is for the validation so after the model is trained it will also validate and will evaluate how the model performs and we define some hyperparameters so there's things called epochs batch size we are not going in detail now but uh, we will explain this later and then we evaluate our model and we will have our accuracy we will have our validation accuracy we will have our losses and with that we will see if the model is performing well if we need to adjust some hyperparameters and here is just um, an example so we'll, our model is trained and then we will try it out so we will have uh, for example a um, we take one sample from our data set it's a, this image here and then we predict so the prediction we call model predict classes and then the prediction is true so it was a good prediction because it does look like a true so our model predicted correctly so we are having here our sample and then we pass to the model to predict classes and then we have the sample and then we have the prediction so this is just one kind of classification uh, problem and we use keras so these are all the procedures that we need to take for this model to, to train and then to evaluate. We will go on detail uh, later on about uh, different parts here, but this was just to show you a general overview of um, an application example. We will now take a look at the convolutional neural network. It has a different architecture and different uh, idea behind it. So in convolutional neural networks, each layer basically consists of future banks where fixed bias terms are added to each output and the result is passed through a non-linearity. The filters are called the receptive fields in analogy to the processing, for example, in the retina of the eye. The filter coefficients and bias terms are then optimized according to a target function and a loss function, which computes the distance to the target function. Let's take a look at um, a Python Keras convolutional net uh, neural network example. So most of neural network development is done in Python. It has a very powerful libraries for it. For example, Keras and Theano that use it to be uh, very popular, but nowadays um, it's not so popular anymore. I'm not sure if they are still uh, development it or if it's already um, deprecated but we also have um, tensorflow and pytorch so here you can read more about keras in our example we want to detect a signal in a sequence in this case we want to detect a ramp that is uh, produced by this python function here and we want to use a convolutional neural network to de to detect um, this um, ramp. So in a Keras example, uh, first we will define our input data and our desired output. It's called the target. For the input, we will prepend and append a few zeros to the ramp function, such that the um, goal is that the neural network has to find the position of the ramp. So here we have our ramp. We have nine zeros before, nine zeros after and our RAM has um, five numbers, so we have a total of 23 um, numbers. So Keras expects a certain shape, so, and we need to expand some dimensions so to prepare that our input uh, has this uh, expected dimension. And the dimensions of the Keras um, that Keras expects is um, an input with the shape that is given by the batch, the length, and the number of channels. So batch here is the number of training examples. In our case, we have just one, so our batch is equal to one. 
the length is the length of our signal so here we have our signal has 23 numbers and channels are the channels of our data for example um, it can be um, stereo so we would have two channels we could be RGB because we would have three channels but here we only have one channel so the target signal will have the same size in this case because we use a causal network that returns the same number of samples at the output as the input and we will set up our target containing all zeros except for a one at the time of the detecting the pattern so we will um, detect the signal at its end so we will detect the ramp at its end so we have here zero and then we are having one at this position and this, so we will input this so we have zeros then we have a ramp and then we have zeros and the target is just a one when the signal ends we also need to change the dimensions and then we will start setting up our network model so we will use sequential then we will add a convolutional layer and this is how we do it so we define a model in sequential and we add this convolution 1d so it will have one filter the size of this filter is equal to 8 stride is equal to 1 we will use causal like we said before we will choose linear activation and we will not use a bias we will initialize our weights using the um, Glorot uniform initializer and we need to pass the input shape so the input shape is a vector 23 and 1 so a filter here is used to detect a pattern it will be similar to a matched filter that we've seen uh, in our lecture advanced digital signal processing in lecture 13 that you can find in our website so the kernel size here is the size of our filters impulse response so here it can detect patterns of length of eight samples strides here means that there is no down sampling of the signal a padding causal means that there is zero padding of kernel size minus one zeros before the beginning of our signal so the activation is linear means that there is no non-linearity after the sum so we are not using a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent we are not using uh, a non-linearity bias equals to false means that the bias is zero and for the random initialization of our weights we are using this glorot uniform and the input stage is the size of the signal at the layer's input so then we need to compile the model and specify the user error function and the optimizer so we will so we defined our model here and then we need to compile and we need to specify the error function so it's called the loss function and here we are going to use the mean absolute error and we will use the optimizer called Adam so loss here is the error function in our case the mean absolute um, error between the network output and the target the optimizer is the optimization function to use to obtain the best weights and here we are going to use Ada so after we compile the model and we specify the loss function and we specify the optimizer then we can train the model using fit and then we give the input the target and then we give the number of epochs and the batch size so epochs is the number of iterations the optimizer will use and batch size is the number of um, examples that we will have in uh, our case here is just one but the batch size determines how uh, the update of the weight will take place and the epochs is uh, the number that it goes to so if we have for example um, we could have two two batches uh, 
So we have two examples in our data set and then we could set for example the batch size equals to 1 or the batch size equal to 2 and the epoch is how many times we will go through all the data set so if we set the epoch equals to 1 we will just have one iteration so if we set it to 2 then it will go to the first inf uh, input the second input and then it will do it again so it's the number of iterations that goes through all the data inside the data set so after the optimization finished we can use our model for prediction and here we want to detect the signal so usually a separate test signal is used that is different from the training signal but we are just giving here a very simple example not going into the, the, the detail so uh, there are much more than what is written here about batch size about the uh, epoch so um, we will just uh, use the same um, input for testing so we here we are giving, uh, making a prediction we can also read the resulting weights using this so the first index of um, refers to uh, the layer but here we only have one layer so we have the index uh, zero then the next index refers to the input dimension the next to the output dimension so here we have only one output uh, neuron so the index is zero and finally the channel index also is zero so we have our filter weights we, have, we get the weights here and we get here w of zero and then we have this way we get our filter weights and we can also save these weights for future use so there are many ways on how to save um, the, we can save the full model we can save uh, that includes all the definitions we can save just the weights so depending on your application you can save different weights here we'll just save the weights uh, using pico now we can uh, plot the um, output of the neural network the weights and the input using this part here so when we put everything together you can see uh, the professor sugar example code it carries simple uh, conv net it's a simple problem that uses a convolution neural network to obtain a matched filter so, and we will detect um, the signal so we start by importing all the um, libraries so we are going to use keras and import the sequential model we will import layers like um, the dense layer we have activation we have a convolution layer so in this case we are not going to use um, all of them they're just important for future use then we have this function that will generate some artificial data in a numpy array so this is where we have our ramp we will use um, we will make it a unit uh, l2 norm so we will normalize it here this command then we will uh, reshape so it's in the in the shape that keras expect so from here we have our input signal x which is a ramp function already shaped for how keras expect here we will have our target function which is a one detecting the signal at its end and then we also reshape for keras and then it will return next we have a function to generate the model so we discussed this before so we have here our convolutional layer with all this uh, with all these uh, parameters we define our loss function the optimizer we're going to use we compile and we get the compiled model 
So for example, here, just so we can see, we have generate data. So we have our input and our target. So the final shape is 1.31 for the uh, input and 1.31 for the target. So we have the same shape. Then we have our model using this generate model. Then we train using 5,000 epochs. We evaluate and then we will make predictions and we get our weights. So here the model is training and it's computing the loss and we see that the loss is going down and down down until it can to go through its, um, all these epochs we define and we see that the loss is much smaller than when it started. So here we have our predictions. We can save our weights and here we have a plot. So after the 5000 iterations of the optimization, we have here, this was our input signal. This is the weights and this is the neural network output. So remember we had a 1 at the uh, position 16, so at the end of our input ramp. And we have here our network output. So you can also compare these weights and the plot to the match filter which we will be saw uh, to detect, which use it to detect a signal with a maximum possible signal to noise ratio in uh, lecture 13 on advanced signal processing. And we see that in the matched filter case, the weight should be the signal to detect, but time reversed. So here is a reverse ramp function. So this should be. Uh, we can see uh, this is our, our weights for the match filter. And we had the input signal here was the the ramp that is depicting the one that we used here. And the thing is, is because we specify the target function, which has only a very narrow peak, and this is what we observe at the output of the convolution neural network. So this may not have a maximum signal noise duration, but a more narrow peak at detection, which enables a more precise location of our pattern. It's interesting to see that um, even though it's called a convolutional um, neural network, a lot of libraries, they don't calculate the convolution, they calculate the correlation, the, the cross correlation, which can be seen as a convolution, but without the reversed uh, impulse response, or so without the reversed reversed um, weights. So, in this uh, in future examples, when we are seeing convolution neural networks as filter banks, we need to take into consideration uh, what's the impulse response, how to read out the impulse response from the weights. But this is another topic. Before we use Keras on top of TensorFlow, and now we are going to use PyTorch with the same example. So, with PyTorch, we have um, more control of the neural network structure, and <coughs> here is how we do it. So, now we import the PyTorch libraries here to generate dummy data is the same as before. We just need to change here the dimensions of the inputs and outputs according to what PyTorch expects, not with what um, Keras expects. Here we need to convert the inputs and outputs from NumPy to Torch, which is uh, this data structure used by PyTorch. This is what we are doing here. Then we will generate our model. We are using 
this way here, sequential, sequential, and we're defining our convolution layer with one channel as input, one channel as output, kernel size, stripe, stripe, stripe padding, which here is kernel size minus one. And we are not using bias, we are not adding an activation function. We are using this time the mean squared error loss before we used for keras the mean absolute error. This time we are using the mean squared error. We are using the Adam optimizer. And here, so just we have a model of our optimizer. This is how we train our model. So we have the predictions model of x loss. We calculate the loss function between the predicted and the um, desired. And then here we're just printing the loss. It's computed here. And we need this thing here to the zero grad. This is a, a way in PyTorch to um, adjust the gradient. Now we are not going into detail here what this is doing. Uh, this is the backward. Um, it is also necessary uh, in PyTorch and then optimizer step. So we will see this um, in many PyTorch models and you can read on the PyTorch documentation what exactly these things are doing. And then we will have our predictions, we have our weights, we can also save our weights. And here we are plotting the output of the neural network, the weights. And we observe that uh, we have very similar results um, with the carrot. So basically, we just try to reproduce the same example, but using PyTorch instead of Keras. As I mentioned before, instead of a convolution, many libraries they use the cross correlation. So we can see here in PyTorch documentation, we have the the convolution 1D, and here we have this cross correlation operator, and it's not a proper convolution. It's just some details that we need to have in mind depending on our application. In audio processing, the Conv1D layer is used when the entire audio signal is in memory. Then the convolution can be seen as, a sh as shifting the time reverse impulse response, the wave, along the audio signal to produce the output of the convolution. But when we would like to do real-time audio processing, the audio signal arrives block by block from the sound card, and we should process them as they arrive. This can be seen as shifting the audio signal along the time reversed impulse response, the wave. We can um, implement this using a dense neural uh, network layer, a fully connected layer, using a Keras dense layer. This layer has different definitions for the waves and the input, hence we need to translate them for this layer. The dense layer basically implements a matrix multiplication where the input signal is a row vector from the left and the matrix from the right contains the weights. In our case, this matrix is a column vector. So first let's look at the weights. So the weights, they don't have the channel dimension, hence um, we need to remove it. Then we need to apply the time reversal from the convolution and we can do this using this split. So here it's very important to understand if the library is giving back the uh, convolution uh, as a time or a, a, a cross correlation 
and then we need to see if we must um, time reverse or not and then we can set up a dense uh, neural network model and we can use instead of the convolution the a dense and then we have uh, linear activation bs equals to false and it has the input shape and we have here just one unit and then finally we need to transpose the input to be a row vector then we can loop over the signal so here it still comes from the signaling memory but we could it could also uh, come from uh, the sound card so we're just simulating that the signal is coming from the sound card and we will loop over the signal and this is what we're going to do in this example so it's a simple problem to implement a convolutional neural network using a dense network for real-time audio application so here we are again importing our library we will open the weights uh, we'll open the file containing the weights that we knew uh, before so we, we see that the, the weights have this shape here now we need to convert the weights from uh, the convolutional layer to a dense layer so we are removing the channel dynamics of all these waves and this is what we are doing here so in this case we don't need to do the flipping the input response dimension from the convolution layer because the convolution layer is already given us the flipped um, weights so now we uh, build our model using this equation and we are using a dense layer fully connected layer here is the same old generate dummy data so we are uh, generating our inputs and our outputs here we are transposing the signal for the dense layer to obtain um, row vector to be multiplied from the left to the weight vector in the dense here we will loop over the entire signal in several steps until the end and in each step we try to decode and this is what we are doing and we see again that the um, output of our neural network is very similar to the previous that we had here using the convolution and now we are using this dense fully connected layer so we are implementing a convolutional neural network using a dense network this is our last example and we are going to look at real-time online implementation of convolution neural network so for a keras convolution network it is assumed that the entire data is already in memory but in real time for online processing for instance for real-time audio or for wireless uh, processing it needs to be processed as the data arrives um, each sample or blockwise when we have uh, blocks of samples available to us instead of the convnet sliding the filter along the samples here we slide the samples along the filter implemented using a dense net for that we need to convert the weights data format for our conv1d layer the weights they have a certain format it's an array of an array it's zero is the filter weights one uh, is bias for the first layer and then we have filter length channels of sub dense in previous layer and neurons or filters in this layer so the weight format for our desired dense layer is weights and bias but then we have the total weight which is the filter weight times the channel so then for neurons in previous layer time reverse and then the neurons in this layer so we also need to observe that the convolution is a correlation with flipped coefficients 
so we can see what um, our libraries are doing if they're performing a real convolution, if they're performing correlation, and then we can decide if we need to um, reverse the weights, or in, in case um, we can also flip them into TV instead. So here, the weight conversion from convolution 1D to, to tense is mainly a dim dimensionality reduction. So the signal uh, is um, input into a shifting buffer so that uh, it appears to be flipped in time, meaning that the latest sample appears at index 0, and this is what we are doing here, so it's a wide buffer contents of one sample up. So this is the signal box. This is um, one, this is zero, and this one. So this is we're doing, we're putting our signal input uh, into a shifting buffer. And then we flip the signal, and since the mean wolf values appear at the lowest index E, we have Here, our signal block. So let's take a look in our example. It reads in the weights from a previous uh, trained network, and this program will implement a convolution in neural network or an analysis with a bank using a set of bands uh, net for real time order or wireless processing. So, as we said before. For a careless convolution network, if we assume that the entire data is already in memory, but in real time processing, it needs to be processed as it arrives or as sample base or block base. And then instead of the convolution uh, network sliding the filter along the sample, here we slide the sample along the filter implemented using this. One more time, we import our library. We define the filter length to 8. Here we generate our model. We are having a dense layer of 54. Here we are generating our data. So we have x is the ramp. And then we are taking it unit L to normalize this. Here we are loading the previous um, save weights, then we need to convert to the dense layer, the shape that is expected. Here we are flipping the weight, and then we generate our model, we set the weights to the model, then we acquire the input signal with the ramp function. And then here we are initialize this sliding block buffer for the signal as the input for the dense net. And this is what we will do. And then we have this prediction buffer. And here we are simulating the samples coming sample wise from a sound card. So we have this for loop here. This slide buffer contents uh, one sample up. We assign current value to bottom and then we will flip the signal since the newest values appears at the lowest index and then we calculate the predictions and we see when we plot that we have the same network output but here we see that the weights are reversed and here we have our input signal. And we see that we get the identical output as from our net, but now we get one output sample for each new input sample. That's it for this tutorial. It was a gentle introduction into neural networks and fully connected layers and convolutional neural networks and the relationship between uh, convolutional neural networks and filter banks and a series of examples on how to use and implement convolutional neural networks using dense layers 
and so on. And this is also the end of our lecture on multi-rate signal processing. We also have available um, tutorials on advanced digital signal processing. And more uh, subjects are coming. We have uh, audio coding. And we also have more on deep learning and machine learning for audio applications coming soon. Thank you very much and I see you next time.